Well, good morning and welcome to this meeting of the City Planning Commission. This is our first public hearing in which the commission is meeting in person, but this will be a hybrid public meeting in which first I welcome the people who came here in person. And I also want to thank you all for looking out for yourselves and for others by following the mask protocol. Very much appreciated by the members of the commission. Um, we will also have remote public testimony. And I just um, ask um, the commission and the members of the public to please bear with us. We think that this will go smoothly, but as it is the first time, there may be some pauses. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ryan Singer, who is our Senior Director of Land Use and Commission Operations. Good morning. Uh, verbal testimony may be provided in person, online, or by calling in on your telephone. If you wish to speak in person at 120 Broadway, you may register either through the NYC Engage portal or at the front door. Uh, please indicate that you are going to be speaking in person. Masks are required and seating and room capacity is limited by social distancing guidelines. If you wish to access the hearing online, please register through the upcoming meetings page of the NYC Engage portal. A link to join the hearing is on the landing page after you register. Please do not close the landing page uh, without first clicking on the link. If you are accessing the hearing via phone and wish to speak, you must first register with the dial-in participant hotline. If one of the numbers is busy, please try num another. I'll read out one of the numbers, 1-877-853-5247. That's U.S. toll-free. The meeting ID is 618-237-7396. Press pound to skip the participation ID, and the password is the numeral one. The phone number is also posted on the upcoming meetings page of the NYC Engage portal. Please note that no matter how you're accessing the meeting, you must register if you want to speak. Those accessing the meeting online will have the option to turn on their camera while giving testimony. When it is your turn to speak, you'll be notified and promoted to a panelist. This will allow you to unmute your microphone and grant you the ability to turn on your camera. Please listen closely for your name to be called. There will be a short meeting when it will appear that you are no longer in the meeting. Uh, do not be alarmed. You should rejoin shortly the meeting as a panelist. If you're accessing the hearing via phone, your name will be called from the list of registered speakers. Once your name has been called, you'll be given the temporary ability to unmute yourself. You do this by pressing star six to unmute your phone. For those listening to the hearing uh, through the online live stream uh, who have not yet registered to speak but decide they wish to do so during the hearing, you must first register to speak through the upcoming meetings page of the NYC Engage portal. It is not possible to testify through the upcoming uh, through the online live stream without first having registered. For those accessing the hearing via phone who have not yet registered to speak but wish to do so, you must also first register to speak through the dial and participant hotline that I described a moment ago. It's not possible to testify via telephone without having first registered. Speakers are limited to three minutes of testimony. There's a few exceptions to this time limit. Elected officials are accorded the courtesy of jumping to the front of the queue and are not limited to three minutes. And if an applicant team with three or more speakers wishes to make a team presentation, the team will generally be allowed a total of 10 minutes. The chair will announce when the time limit is reached. Please be mindful of potential background noise during your testimony. Please make sure that if you're watching the proceedings via live stream, that the live stream is muted when you begin your testimony. Otherwise, you will hear an echo. We're also going to ask that you not live stream in the hearing room. That causes a, quite a cacophony. Um, if you wish, uh, oh, if, and also if you change the mode by which you are going to testify, either by leaving the hearing room and then testifying online or via the dial-in, or coming into the hearing room in person, uh, you need to re-register and indicate the new method by which you would be testifying. If you wish to submit written testimony, it should be submitted to the Department of City Planning. The mailing and email address can be found on our website, planning.nyc.gov, 
Lastly, please note that this remote and in-person public hearing and all testimony provided is being recorded. With that, good morning and welcome to our public meeting. And um, Mr. Secretary, please begin the meeting. Thank you, Chair Lago. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning, all. This is the City Planning Commission public meeting held in person and remotely through the NYC Engage portal. Today is Wednesday, July 14th, 2021. I will now call the roll. Chair Lago. Here. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Here. Commissioner Bernie is absent. Commissioner Capelli is absent. Commissioner Cerullo. Here. Back. Here. Commissioner Eady. Here. Commissioner Knight. Here. Commissioner Levin is absent. Commissioner Marin is absent. Commissioner Ortiz. Here. Commissioner Rampasad. Here. The quorum is present. The first item is the approval of the minutes of the public meeting of Wednesday, June 23rd, 2021. On the minutes, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The minutes are approved. Next item is scheduling. Calendar numbers 1 through 16, we have resolutions for adoption. Scheduling Wednesday, July 28, 2021, and calendar numbers 17 to 23, we have resolutions for adoption scheduling Thursday, July 29th, 2021, for a remote and in-person public hearing to be held through the NYC Engage portal and in the City Planning Commission hearing room at 120 Broadway. These resolutions, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The resolutions are adopted. The next part of the calendar is the report section on page 136. Reports, Borough of Queens, calendar numbers 24 and 25. CD 14, calendar number 24. C 200230 ZMQ, calendar number 25. N 200231 ZRQ. In a matter of applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning Beach 67th Street rezoning. For favorable reports on calendar numbers 24 and 25. Chair Lago. Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Knight. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Commissioner Rampashad. Yes. Fable reports have been adopted on calendar numbers 24 and 25. Borough of Manhattan, calendar number 26, CD 12, N210467 HIM. In the matter of a communication concerning the landmark designation of the Holy Rood. Episcopal Church on the adoption of calendar number 26 for referral to the City Council. Chair Lago. Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Knight. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Commissioner Rampashad. Yes. Calendar number 26 has been adopted. Borough of Manhattan, calendar number 27, CD2. N210468 HIM. In a matter of a communication concerning the landmark designation of the educational building, 75th Avenue, on the adoption of calendar number 27 for a referral to the City Council. Chair Lago. Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Knight. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Commissioner Rampashad. Yes. Calendar number 27 has been adopted. Borough of the Bronx, calendar number 28, CD8, N210327, ZAX. In a matter of an application for the grant of an authorization concerning nine Palmins Bush residents. For adoption on calendar number 28, Chair Lago. Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Knight. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Commissioner Rapashad. Yes. Calendar number 28 has been adopted. Calendar number 29, Borough of the Bronx, CD8, N210471, ZAX. In the matter of an application for the grant of an authorization concerning 5040 Orlington Avenue. For adoption on calendar number 29, Chair Lago. Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Knight. 
Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Commissioner Rapashad. Yes. Calendar number 29 has been adopted. Borough of Staten Island, calendar numbers 30, 31, and 32. CD2, calendar number 30, N200032, ZAR. Calendar number 31, N200200, ZAR. Calendar number 32, N200201, ZAR. In the matter of applications for the grant of authorizations concerning 51 Sloan Avenue. For adoption on calendar numbers 30, 31, and 32. Chair Lago. Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Knight. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Commissioner Rampashad. Yes. Calendar numbers 30, 31, and 32 have been adopted. Thank you, Commissioners. The next part of the calendar is the public hearing section on page 143, Borough of the Bronx, calendar number 33, CD 10, N210435, PXX, a public hearing in a matter of a notice of intent to acquire office space concerning 2100 Bartow Avenue. We will have a 10-minute team presentation by a team comprised of Lisa Bowling, Stephanie Gandell, Monica Rich, and Nicole Rodriguez. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioner. My name is Stephanie Gandell, and I'm the Deputy Commissioner for External Affairs at the Administration for Children's Services, or ACS. With me today is Lisa Bowling, the Assistant Commissioner for Bronx North in the Division of Child Protection, Nicole Rodriguez, the Assistant Commissioner in the Division of Child Protection, and Monica Rich, the Executive Director of the Office of Real Estate Design and Construction Management. Next slide, please. We are here today to testify in support of our application to acquire space at 2100 Bartow Avenue in the Bronx for our Division of Child Protection. As part of our presentation today, we will be answering questions that have arisen, including those about the location of the office space in the Bronx. Please note that we also have Scott Heffler from DCAS here today with us, who will be available for questions about the proposed business transaction. Next slide, please. I just want to briefly share some information about ACS and our work. We promote the safety and well-being of New York City's children and families by providing child welfare, juvenile justice, and some of the city's early care and education services. As you may know, the contracted child care system is now part of the Department of Education, and ACS continues to administer the voucher system. ACS is charged with protecting and promoting the safety of New York City children through the child welfare system. Our Division of Child Protection responds to allegations of abuse and neglect and refers families to services and supports that keep children safe. We contract with nonprofit providers to offer prevention and foster care services. Next slide, please. Whenever a person suspects a child has been abused or neglected, they call the New York State Central Register, often referred to as SER. If the report is accepted and is a New York City child, we are required to respond and assess the safety of the child. In a typical year, our 3,500 child protective staff respond to approximately 55,000 reports of suspected abuse or neglect. As part of this work, child protective staff assess safety and make referrals to services. On any given day, over 20,000 children in New York City receive prevention services. In some instances, due to the level of risk, we must get court intervention to either get court-ordered supervision or seek authority to place the child in foster care. There are currently fewer than 7,700 children in foster care and all time low. To help make these decisions and create ACS to create safety plans for children, our child protective staff often convene the families and hold what we call child safety conferences. These conferences include a facilitator, parents, family members, parent advocates, and anyone who can help support the family in developing a plan to keep the child safe. I'm now going to turn it over to Lisa Bowling, the Assistant Commissioner for Child Protection in Bronx North, to share information about our child protective work in the Bronx. Thank you, Stephanie, and good morning. Uh, with, regards, uh, with regards to the borough of the Bronx, in a typical year, we respond to over 16,000 reports, assessing child safety and connecting families in need to services and supports. 
This can include providing families with concrete goods, such as cribs and food, referring families to substance abuse treatment or other preventive services. And in those instances, when children are an imminent risk of harm, child protective staff remove children and place them in foster care. We've divided the borough of the Bronx into Bronx North and Bronx South. Today, we are focusing on Bronx North, which currently serves about 6,600 families annually, or about half of the families uh, with reports in the Bronx. Next slide, please. Um, DC, the DCP Bronx South Borough Office team is seated in two separate ACS offices, 2501 Grand Concourse and a small annex office space at 1775 Grand Concourse. These spaces are created specifically for DCP and the families we serve and are not the subject of today's presentation. The DCP Bronx North Borough Office team is currently in two separate ACS offices, located at 1200 Waters Place and 974 Morris Park. With the exception of 974 Morris Park, the office space spaces for DCP in the Bronx can be categorized as modern with design and furnishings suited to ACS DCP's current practice and business operations. Over 15 years ago, in 2005, 974 Morris Park was acquired to be a temporary swing space for staff. Due to this, the building was never designed nor configured to meet the needs of DCP staff or the families we serve. The space at 24, 2100 Bartow is being planned to replace 974 Morris Park. 2100 Bartow Avenue is suitable for an office build-out that will support the newest initiatives of DCP. When built out with up-to-date configuration and furnishings, 2100 Bartow Avenue will provide DCP clients and staff with a safe, functional, efficient, supportive, and specialized office space specifically tailored for our, our practice and business operations. Bronx North will serve community districts 3, 6, 9, 10, and 12. Currently, both Bronx North offices are located in CD11. The new space at 21 Bartow Avenue will be located in CD10 and will serve families from CD9 and 10. Next slide, please. Approximately 120 staff, including child protective staff, investigative consultants, conference facilitators, preventive service referral liaisons, clinical staff, medical consultants, IT staff, and clerical staff will move from 974 Morris Park to 2100 Bartow Avenue. This site will be more convenient for both families and staff. Like 974 Morris Park, 2100 Bartow Avenue is accessible by bus. There, may, there are many buses, bus lines that pass directly in front of 2100 Bartow Avenue, including the BX-12, BX-5, BXM-7, and the Q-50. This site also provides excellent vehicular access with several major highways nearby. In addition, there will be a shuttle, bu a shuttle service from the subway to the office at Bartow Avenue. Notably, much of the work that DCP does is in the family's home and not in the office. So families will not need to come to our office that often. In addition, when families are referred for services, the services are provided by community-based providers in the family's community. 2100 Bartow Avenue is a modern, modern four-story multi-use building in Co-op City in Bay Trusted section of the Bronx. The building is known as the Bay Plaza Professional Building, and it includes a mix of medical and service-oriented uses, included, including Montefiore Medical Group, which offers clinical services at the location. There are also several restaurants. 2100 Bartow Avenue will be intentionally constructed to better meet the needs of families and staff. For example, the site will provide conference space for family team conferences, as well as developmentally appropriate areas for families to visit and modern and more appropriate spaces for our staff to work. I'm going to turn the presentation over to Monica Rich, who will talk more about the space and how we selected it. And just as a caution, the yep. team has a minute and a half to complete their presentation. <laughs> All right, next slide. We'll do it quickly. All right. So the new space at 2100 Bartow will be about 37,500 square feet, and the space is vacant and in great condition, 
As you can see in the photo, there's a dedicated ADA-compliant entrance, and uh, there are separate entrances for families and staff also, which is going to provide enhanced security. Uh, we'll be able to be, you know, build the space out better for families, as we've mentioned, and um, there will be welcoming areas for the children and families. Also, prior to selecting this site, we explored and visited other sites, 4723rd Avenue and 5517 Broadway among them. And we selected Bartow uh, Avenue because it was an existing building, making more readily available. I'm going to turn this over to Nicole Rodriguez. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, commissioners. Um, so this move will help uh, the ACS team in Bronx North to better serve the children and families of the Bronx. If the site is conveniently located to many bus lines, as we mentioned, Bay Plaza is an area of the Bronx that is familiar to many Bronx residents. Uh, much of our work with families actually takes place in the community, um, but families who do come to our offices typically use public transportation, and so this area of the Bronx is convenient to access. We provide families who are visiting us with Metro cars. I'm afraid we'll have to wrap it up, Ms. Rodriguez. We have an extremely intense meeting schedule and so hold people to their time. If I could ask just one um, procedural question. Mm -hmm. Mr. Heffler from DCAS did not sign up as a member of the applicant team. Does he want to be available as part of the team for joint questioning or does he prefer to testify separately? I'm going to say he would like to be a part of the, yeah, the applicant. Oh, okay. I will, we will then change it and note that you're part of the applicant team. Great. So feel free to uh, send up in case there are questions for DCAS. And with that, I'll turn it over to the commissioners for questioning. Vice Chair Knuckles. Well, thank you. And this is just an observation. Um, I don't know if you were present on Monday, but a, a number of us, including me, uh, raised uh, a concern about the proximity of, of Barto. 21 Bartow to uh, the subway stops. Uh, and by the way, this is clearly a superior spatial solution to Morris Park. So uh, that, that is clear. So I'm glad that you are, uh, you intend to provide shuttle services. Um, and in that regard, how, how many people approximately uh, do you anticipate seeing on a daily basis there? Thank you for your question and for acknowledging um, that we were paying attention on Monday and we will have a shuttle. Um, I want to make a point that's important, I think, and then I'll turn it over to Lisa to give an ex uh, approximate number. But most of the time, our staff are going to families' homes, um, and most of the services we provide are in their homes. It's not as often that they would come to the office, except for maybe for a conference um, or to sometimes meet with their workers, but usually our staff go out to see them. I see. And hi, um, we anticipate that we probably would have anywhere between 25 to 50 uh, people. That That's including children, and that's by day. I see. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Commissioner Rompershot. You mentioned you have 120 staff that's going to be uh, at this facility. Is there room for to add more later on? Um, that's a very good question. I'm going to turn it over to Monica for that. It is, it is a large building, and um, also the DCAS, uh, Scott, can tell us that, you know, that, that is one of the good things about this building is that, you know, we, we could certainly ask if, if we needed more room because the building is so large, whereas 974 Morris Park is a standalone building, and that's part, been part of the issues is there's no place to go. That's it. So, okay. yes. And There's some flexibility there, exactly. Okay, great. And I just have one further question. With regards to the shuttle bus, what uh, the anticipated number of times you're going to have it available? Is it any kind I of... I think we're working on that at the moment. Okay. Um, so, uh, hello. Thank you for the question. Um, we're still in the process of negotiation, so it is um, not hammered out yet, but um, we would want it to be according to the need of um, the folks coming to this space. And we find it's not even throughout the day, for example, so we would probably do a trip analysis in order to figure out the need. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Vice Chair Nichols? No, you know, I was, I was just wondering uh, uh, generally, and uh, there's no 
underlying issue behind this question. But there is a is there a hotline for for uh, DCS if, if a citizen just has some concerns about the welfare of a child? Yes. Anybody who suspects a child's been abused or neglected, they can call what's called the SCR, the Statewide Central Register. It's a state hotline, and then the state screens it out to what county it would go to, assuming that they believe that there's some you know, reason to suspect a child is being abused or neglected and it needs to be investigated. And, and, and where does one ascertain that hotline? How do you? Um, we have it on our website. You can also call 311 and get directed. Um, they'll connect you right to the SCR. I see. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you for being our first in-person presenter <laughs> since we were Zoom. And it is also the first time that I have come across in city government um, the acronym DCP, which we tend to think of as the <laughs> Department of City yeah. Planning. Um, it did give me pause for a second. It's the um, Division of Child Protection. Yes, a little bit different, <laughs> but equally important. And um, with that, the public hearing is closed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, Borough of Queens, calendar number 34, CD4, C210337, PCQ a public hearing in the matter of an application for the site selection and acquisition of property concerning Lefrac City Senior Center. And our first speaker will be Ark Eber, who will be testifying via video. And thank you for your patience. You'll remember this from the remote hearings that it, it takes a minute or so to allow the speaker into the room. Uh, good morning. It's Lisa Lau from ACARF. Um, I will be presenting this slideshow. Are you speaking um, separate? Is Mr. Eber not speaking? Um, is part of the applicant team and available to answer questions. Okay, well then, this is not a team presentation. If Mr. Eber would like to testify and take questions, we are glad to do that. If not, we will turn it over to you, Ms. Lau, but Mr. Eber would not be available then to answer questions. Yes, it's all right. If you could. Thank you. Okay, so we will note that Mr. Eber did not testify and we will then restart the clock for Ms. Lau for three minutes. Thank you. Um, shall I begin? Please. Um, so I'm Lisa Lau, we're the, uh, from ACARF, the environmental consultants who prepared the land use ap application and seeker environmental assessment for the applicants, who are the Department for the Aging, DIFTA, and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. Next slide, please. The proposed actions are for the acquisition and site selection to facilitate a new senior center at 96-05 Horace Harding Expressway in Corona, Queens. The operator of the new senior center would be Elmcore Youth and Adult Activities, Inc. through a lease with DIFTA. Next slide, please. The proposed project would be located on the ground floor of the existing six-story office building on the site. Portions of the existing building are currently leased for city government offices. The proposed project would serve Lefrak City and the surrounding neighborhood and would be supportive of the Queens Community District 4 needs and budget requests in which the need for a new senior center to serve the growing senior population of the South Elmhurst Corona area of Queens was identified. In addition, the proposed project was identified in the previous two years of the citywide statement of needs for city facilities. Next slide, please. The site is zoned C44 in which use group four community, oh, next slide, please. Uh, the site is zoned C44 in which use group four community facility uses such as senior centers are permitted. The proposed senior center area is shown in the red dashed outline. The space was formerly occupied by DEP office use, which has already been relocated elsewhere in the building. Next slide, please. The, next, the yellow outline on photo two show, shows the location of the proposed ADA accessible entrance to the senior center. Existing no standing signage is visible at the curb. The applicants are currently working with DOT to install new signage for one or more spaces to allow van accessible pickups and drop-offs. Next slide, please. 
The proposed senior center would serve approximately 105 seniors per day, Monday to Friday, between 8 and 5 p.m. It's expected to have approximately 10 employees. This slide also shows the new ADA accessible entrance. Next slide, please. Um, the slide shows the proposed floor plan for the center. Um, and an environmental assessment was prepared for the project in accordance with Seeker and concluded that no significant adverse impacts would result with proposed actions. This concludes our presentation. Um, and uh, I hope that members of the team uh, are available to answer questions. Uh, from DCAS, Nina Cotter, Elmcor, Lorinda Hooks. Ms. And Ms. Lau, Ms. Yes. Ms. Lau um, as you did not register for a team presentation, each of the folks will be available to testify and take questions, but only after they've testified. At this point, I would ask the commission if they have questions for Ms. Lau. Okay, not seeing any. Thank you for the testimony. And our next speaker is Lorinda Hooks, who will be testifying via video. I'm, I'm not, uh, this is Lorinda Hooks. I am just here for questions, to answer questions. I wasn't prepared for uh, testimony, testifying. Okay, so we'll note that Ms. Hooks did not testify. Our next speaker who registered is Cynthia Poulton, also via video. I'm, I'm here from DCAS, uh, and I'm only here for questions as well. Yes, Vice Chair Knuckles. Thank you. Uh, what is the proposed duration of this lease for the your senior center? That would be a question for our leasing team. Uh, that would be for Nina Cotter. Okay, she is our next speaker. She is our next speaker, but first, any other questions for Ms. Putan? Yes, Commissioner Rompershot. Um, I know you, you guys said you're reaching out to DLT with regards to, I guess, uh, one of the, the stipulations that the community board had mentioned, which, which is in regards to the loading. Uh, can you just expand on that a little further? Is that something that you're going to be doing on Horace, Harding Expressway? Like allocating a drop off point? I would defer to DIFTA on that and AKRF. Again, yeah, hi, hi. This I would uh, no. I, I am afraid. I am afraid that you have mismanaged your presentation by not signing up as an applicant team. When that is not done, each speaker testifies individually and answers questions. If I could ask that you follow up in writing to Commissioner Rompershad's question. Any other questions for Ms. Polkman? Okay, our next speaker is Nina Cotter, who will be participating by phone. And on behalf of Vice Chair Knuckles, I would ask that Ms. Cotter answer his question with respect to the term of the lease. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, my name is Nina Cotter. I'm an executive director for leasing and acquisitions at DCAS, and I'm happy to answer any questions related to leasing. So the first question that I heard was regarding the term of the lease. I need to clarify that the space is currently leased by the City of New York for the needs of uh, Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, once this ULERP application is fully approved, uh, the intent is to uh, have a modification of that lease where uh, the space uh, for the senior center will be designated for department for the aging. That lease currently runs uh, until June 30th of 2023. However, DCAS is currently in negotiation of uh, extending this lease for another 10 years that would take us to uh, June 30th of 2033 and adding another 10 year renewal option that will take us to June 30th of 2033. So we're potentially looking here at a 22 year uh, horizon from today. Thank you. Other questions from Ms. Cotter? Okay, then I do not, Ryan, have any other folks signed up to speak during the pendency of the hearing? Okay, then this public hearing is closed. Next calendar item, number 35, Borough of Queens, CD14C1. 
180395ZMQ, a public hearing in the matter of an application for a zoning map amendment concerning 106-02 Rockaway Beach Boulevard rezoning. There will be a 10-minute team presentation by a team comprised of Richard Lobel, Dino Tomasetti, and Victor Folletti, all of whom will be testifying uh, via video. Good morning, Chair. Commissioners, are you able to hear me? Yes, we are. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. We are here for the 10602 Rockaway Beach Boulevard rezoning. I will be presenting the land use background and rationale for the rezoning. Mr. Tomasetti will present with regards to the program at the site, and Mr. Folletti will run through the project architectural aspects. Um, next slide. The application is for a zoning map amendment to rezone 10602 and 10610 Rockaway Beach Boulevard from an existing R5D C23 zoning district to an M13 zoning district. The district uh, currently uh, on the site was mapped in 2008 in the Rockaway neighborhoods rezoning but has largely not resulted in uh, anticipated development. The proposal here would allow for a new mixed to six story plus cellar uh, self storage facility and public parking garage uh, at 10602 Rockaway Beach Boulevard with approximately 135,000 square feet. Uh, the self storage facility would be on floors one through six with um, seven accessory parking spaces on the ground floor and three loading docks. There would also be pursuant to much community conversation, a public parking garage for 83 public parking spaces in the cellar. Next slide. So the, um, there were extensive community meetings prior to this application. This application has been in process and has been discussed with CB14 and community groups for over three years. Um, the community expressed support for the proposal, but initially little to no parking was offered. Uh, and they asked us to go back to the drawing board. We did so and we're, are now able to provide 83 spaces in the cellar, which for the community allows for them to alleviate some of the parking pressures, which take place during the summer months. Um, there was a land use committee meeting of community board 14, where they expressed their support for the project and discussed the dire need for self storage in this area. Uh, and they were appreciative of the provision of the spots. The owner here also discussed with the community board providing local hiring, uh, and long term employment, as well as discounts for certain community organizations. Next slide. With regards to the rezoning itself, you can see the zoning change map. Uh, currently, you have an R5D C23. Uh, the, uh, as I said, the, the Rockaway neighborhoods rezoning occurred roughly 10 years ago and has still resulted in vacancy at the site. The site itself has remained vacant since 1981. You will notice uh, the M13, the proposed district, which offers an, a transition between the, um, the uh, water treatment plant, the sewage treatment plant to the north of the site and the large residential towers to the south. Next slide. And this is merely the tax map, which denotes in red the project area. The site also, uh, the development site is, is lot 65, while lot one to the west of the site is a one-story drugstore, which again was not redeveloped since the time of the Rockwood neighborhoods rezoning. Next slide. So with that, I would just point out on the land use map, which comes next, the residential towers to the south, which are at 13 stories, the proposed facility at six stories, and then the uh, wastewater treatment facility, which again has rather large structures, including a water storage uh, treatment plant, uh, which, which is uh, similar in height to the proposed development. Uh, I would ask that you page through the next few slides, which are photographs of the surrounding area and include the water treatment facility as well as the residential towers you can see. And uh, with that, if you would page through to the third Rendering, you can see a, a proposed illustrative rendering. Uh, I would uh, hand this over to Dino Tomasetti, the, uh, op, the owner and operator who can talk a little bit about the program. Dino. Thanks, Rich. And uh, ladies and gentlemen of the CPC, thank you for your time. Good morning. My name is Dino Tomasetti, and I'm the developer of this project. I have a 20 year background in construction real estate development and approximately 12 years in the self storage business. I'm also a longtime resident of the Rockaways. Uh, in our investigation of the site, we determined that there is a clear and definite need for self-storage. Uh, Rockaway community contains 114,000 people, 56,000 of which live within three miles of our location. Using the industry standard uh, five square feet per person, uh, there's a demand of 280,000 square feet for self-storage in the area. As far as the existing supply is concerned, it is very minimal. There's only one other storage facility on the entire peninsula, and that facility is rather small 
at around 40,000 square feet uh, is not climate controlled and is susceptible to flooding. Nevertheless, that facility has remained at or close to near uh, full occupancy for many years, uh, evidencing the need for storage in the area. Based on the math, there's an unmet demand of around 240,000 square feet for self, uh, self storage. Our proposed facility would meet 100,000 square feet of that. Uh, the next closest storage facilities are either in Brooklyn or the five towns area. Uh, I've spoken to members of the community that have expressed frustration with having to travel long distances to get to a storage facility and they've agreed that there is a real need here. Uh, in addition, uh, during Superstorm Sandy in 2012, countless homes were damaged and flooded as a result. Uh, and many Rockaway residents lost their personal belongings. Uh, after Sandy, many residents lifted their homes, losing their basements in the process and therefore losing essential space to store their personal items. A flood protected storage facility would be a major benefit in the wake of Sandy and in the event of future flooding. Uh, as a member of the community, I have had many conversations with residents who have expressed a need for self-storage, which has only increased since the storm and as the area continues to grow. The building we've proposed will also allow for 83 parking spaces, uh, which will address a direct request of the community to alleviate parking concerns uh, and meet the need for transient summertime beachgoers. In addition, we have agreed to a suggestion by the community board to tint the windows of the building in order to address potential light pollution concerns. And I have met with a local tenants association to discuss the project in greater detail. As a direct result of that meeting, we also agreed to incorporate local artistry into the exterior design of the building so that it will more readily harmonize with the surrounding area. We've been very responsive to the community's concerns and suggestions throughout this process. And I look forward to being able to move uh, this project forward. I'll now turn it over to our project architect, Victor Folletti, who will briefly uh, show the commission the plans and run through those. Thank you. Good morning, commission. If we could uh, back up one slide, please. And one more, please. Okay, so we have here a rendering of the uh, proposed self-storage building. Um, designed with livery uh, based on the proposed intended use and uh, occupant and management company of the building. Next slide. Uh, this is a side view from the uh, entrance to the uh, parking garage as discussed. Uh, also with the windows showing into the facility, which as uh, testified, they will be tinted uh, to protect from any uh, light pollution coming from inside the building. Next slide. Uh, this is a uh, rendered overview showing uh, the massing of our building in relationship to uh, the surrounding areas and uh, some of the facilities that were mentioned uh, behind our building and the uh, multiple uh, dwelling uh, across the street. Next slide. This is a uh, site plan of our property uh, showing it as a corner lot, Rockway Beach Boulevard and Beach 106th Street. Um, showing the two curb cut entrances, uh, one for the parking on Rockway Beach Boulevard and uh, the loading uh, dock access on Beach 106th Street. Next slide. This is the seller plan showing uh, the area being proposed as attended parking area for uh, 83 parking spaces. We have our ramp coming down, uh, uh, proposed structural columns throughout the space, uh, our attended booth uh, for the uh, attended parking uh, management, and uh, again, the space allocated for the parking um, with elevator access and two means of egress. Next slide. This is the first floor plan and also the entrance uh, level of the facility. Uh, we have uh, several access points parking access, which accesses the lower level uh, attended parking garage in the cellar, as well as the upper accessory parking and loading area for customers of the self-storage facility. Uh, they can park and they can come directly into the self-storage facility uh, without having to go act outside of the building. Uh, on the corner is our um, office area and retail area for access from the customers. And adjacent to that is the loading dock entrance for people delivering uh, their storage materials. Next Thanks. slide, please. No, Mr. Folletti, I'm afraid that your time is up. At this oh, point, I, we'll turn uh, it over to no questions problem. from the 
questions from the commission? If um, I might um, pose a question, uh, perhaps to uh, Mr. Tomasetti. I know that at the time of certification, Commissioner Levin had raised a question about the appropriateness of the self-storage use at a location that is so close to both the subway and the ferry, and wondered, uh, Mr. Tomasetti, if you had considered other uses for the site. Um, initially, when we first looked at the site, going back now probably about five years, we had looked at a multifamily use, but uh, we quickly determined that that wouldn't make sense uh, due to the proximity to the waste treatment plant uh, right next door. Uh, at the present time, the only uh, plan that we are looking at is self-storage. Thank you. Seeing no other questions, I'll thank the applicant team and check with Ryan to see if other speakers have signed up. There being none, this, media, this public hearing is closed. Thank you. Borough of Brooklyn, Borough of Brooklyn calendar number 36, CD1. C210329 PCK, public hearing in a matter of an application for site selection and acquisition of property concerning 101 Varick Avenue. And to avoid the confusion that we had with respect to the Lefrak Senior Center, I want to confirm with Mr. Bernstein, who is the first person to have signed up from DCAS, I have four different government entity representatives signed up to speak, but not as a team presentation. Do you prefer to, oh, I'm sorry. First is Doric Blakesley, I apologize. Um, do you wish to do a 10 minute team presentation or do you prefer to testify individually in three minute increments and then taking questions only on your particular testimony? Um, no, we're just, we're doing a three minute, I'm going to do a three minute presentation. And um, we had been informed that other people from our uh, agency and from DCAS could sign up to answer questions in addition to me. But if that's because we didn't sign up as a team presentation, they can't, then we'll, I guess I will be we, the only No, we will gladly change it to a okay. team presentation so that they will be available to answer questions. And so we have Dorit Blakesley, who will be joined by Scott Bernstein of DCAS, Caitlin Churchill of City DOT, Keith Stahl from City DOT, and Jessica Werwong from City DOT. So Ms. Blakesley, please go ahead. Thank you. So hello, my name is Dorit Blakesley and I work for DOT Facilities Management. I will be presenting about 101 Varick Avenue. Next slide. Here's a picture of the project site, 101 Varick, outlined in red. DOT, in collaboration with DCAS, is seeking to site select and acquire this privately owned site. The site lot is approximately 141,000 square feet. The site is located in M31 zoning district in the North Brooklyn Industrial Business Zone. And the DOT units that are proposed to be located here include part of the sidewalk inspection and management, abbreviated as SIM, citywide concrete unit, and the traffic operations streetlight storage warehouse, as well as office space. Currently, the Streetlight Warehouse is operating out of 11 Varick under a license agreement. Next slide. UT needs the new space at 11 Varick due to two city priorities. SIM is expanding due to a court mandate that requires 162,000 curb ramps to be installed or updated throughout the city. 25 new SIM employees will be assigned to 11 Varick. And the Traffic Operations Streetlight Warehouse needed to move from 37th Avenue to provide access for DEP to finish constructing water tunnel number three. So this operation is supported by six DOT traffic operations staff. Next slide. 11 Varick has been identified by DOT as a very good location for many different reasons. The site is well served by public transit. There's access to Metropolitan and Flushing Avenues as well as the BQE. The existing building and site is adequately sized for DOT and would require minimal changes. The site is located in an M31 zoning district and the occupancy of this building with new employment would foster economic activity in the area. Next slide. This slide shows the proposed site plan for 101 Varick. As, stated, as already stated, SIM and Streetlight Warehouse will be located here. And please note that SIM will not be storing concrete materials or be preparing concrete on site. 
and no new construction on the site is proposed. Next slide. As for resiliency, critical infrastructure will be protected from any potential flooding events. And sustainability is also very important for DOT and is a priority for the city. So DOT in partnership with DCAS DEM will be exploring the opportunity to install rooftop agriculture, solar panels, or a green roof. And we have started discussing these options with the building ownership. Next slide. A fair share analysis was performed for the site and it was determined that there is not a disproportionate concentration of similar city facilities in the study area. Next slide. And this project underwent a city environmental quality review and it was determined that the project would not create any significant adverse impacts related to hazardous materials or contamination, vehicle trips or parking. And a negative declaration was issued <laughs> on April 1st, 2021. Ms. Yep. Ms. Blakesley, I'm afraid that your time is up. Great. And at this point, I would turn it over to the commissioners for questioning for any member, any members of the applicant team. Uh, yes, Commissioner Dweck. Uh, thank you. There was some comments uh, from the Brooklyn Borough President regarding, can you speak to uh, the uh, solar uh, roof and the uh, roof, uh, rooftop gardening uh, aspects of it or any proposed? Yes, um, we have started talking about these possibilities with the building ownership. Um, this uh, DOT and uh, DCAS, DEM will work together to try and see what's uh, feasible as far as the structure of the building and um, what um, what is, we would have to request funding from OMB to actually put uh, the any type of installation on the roof. But this is something we definitely wanna pursue and we're just working to see what's possible. And we can keep uh, the commission updated uh, once we get some more concrete answers. Thank you. I know it's been a priority for uh, Borough President Adams. And uh, if you, like you said, if you can get back to us with any further information, it'd be appreciated. Thank you. Yes, yes, we will definitely do that. Thank you. Any other questions? Vice Chair Knuckles. What is the uh, proposed, proposed lease term for uh, Issues. Uh, Scott Bernstein uh, from DCAS is also in the uh, team, so he uh, can help answer that question. Yes. Hello. I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. we can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the proposed lease term will be uh, 20 years. Thank you. Not seeing other questions, we will thank the applicant team thank and you. our next. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Cynthia Norris, testifying remotely. We'll give Ooh. Ms. Norris Ooh. a moment to unmute herself. What um, we will do, Brian, is there anyone other than Ms. Norris? What I suggest that we do is just to suspend this hearing and move on to the next one. And if folks behind the scenes could work to see if Ms. Norris is still available. Okay, so Mr. Secretary, on to the next one. Chicago. Burr of Brooklyn, calendar numbers 37 and 38. CD 15, calendar number 37. C 200203 ZMK, calendar number 38. N 200204 ZRK. A public hearing in the matter of applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning 2840 Knapp Street rezoning. Our first speaker for a three minute presentation is Eric Plotnick. Hello, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the commission. I hope you can all hear me okay. Yes, we can. Great, thank you for holding this hearing in person. I would have liked to have been there today, but there are many other applications I have and all those teammates will not be there. I do apologize. I mean no disrespect, and I'm very proud and, and happy to see you back at your helm. I'm here today to represent the Sheepshead Bay Nursing Home, which was a, a, a survivor through the pandemic and helped many people. And they're seeking now a rezoning to rezone the site you see in front of an R5 to an R6 zoning district. If approved, it will facilitate the interior conversion only of the ground or back left side of the image you see to include 20-bed diaphragm center for use as well as 20 parking spaces. The building will not be enlarged. We received the support of the community board and I believe we, we did receive the support of the borough president. Next slide please. 
And actually, if you just skip right to slide four, please. As you might have noticed in the overhead aerial that was on the screen a few moments ago, there is an existing seven story residential building on the southern portion of the block and the remainder of the block is occupied by this building. So the proposed rezoning will fit within the character of the neighborhood. Uh, what else can I tell you about? I'd like to take you now if I can. You see the slide right here that I was trying to take you to. Thank you. I'll take you now if I can move ahead. Next slide, please. Here you can see on slide one in the top left corner, the area that we're speaking about. It's that ground floor area behind the truck that we are going to be converting to a dialysis center and off street parking. Next slide, please. A series of photos depict the same condition around the property. You can click, keep clicking. Next slide. And you can go right ahead. Next slide. You can see the imagery right here of everything. Next slide. And I'll take you to some plans. This is the side streets and the belt on, sits on the service road of the belt parkway. Next slide, please. Here you can see the proposed zoning district clearly depicted. Next slide. Again, here showing you the zoning district. Next slide. The plans depict what we're proposing. This is the portion that's at issue. By approving this, we will be converting the ground floor to countable floor area. The portion that's in yellow on the top of the and the portion on the left uh, side. That Mr. Plenick, will let, Mr. Plenick, we'll add an additional 30 seconds since we had technical difficulties here in advancing your slides. I appreciate that, but there's not much more for me to say other than thank you again for standing up for the city and for leading its economic recovery. Eric, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Great. Questions from the commission? Not seeing any. Thank you, Mr. Polotnik. And um, I would ask if any other speakers have signed up on this matter. Okay. There being none, then we will close this public hearing. Ms. Norris is back in the Zoom. Oh, okay. We will now resume our uh, public hearing on 101 Barrack Avenue because Ms. Norris has rejoined. And welcome, Ms. Norris. You're free to testify. Can you hear me? Good morning. We hear you, Ms. Norris. Good morning. How you doing? I was I meant to sign up for the citywide public hearing. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. We will then add you um, to that when it comes up later on. Sorry for the confusion. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we will close the public hearing on 101 Barrack Avenue. And Mr. Secretary, on to the next one. Yes, Chair Lago. Borough Brooklyn, calendar numbers 39 and 40, CD1, calendar number 39. C two zero zero three zero six ZMK calendar number forty N two zero zero three zero seven ZRK a public hearing in the matter of applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning three hundred seven Kent Avenue rezoning. Please note that a public hearing is being held by the City Planning Commission in conjunction with the above ULRP hearings to receive comments related to a draft environmental impact statement. This hearing is being held pursuant to the State Environmental Quality Review Act and the City Environmental Quality Review. We will have a 10-minute team presentation by a team comprised of Judith Gallant, James Seto, Owen DeMarzo, Lily Blank, and Louis Silverman. Lily Blank will begin our presentation. Hi, good morning, uh, Chair Lago and Commissioners. My name is Lily Blank, and I'm one of the owners of 307 Kent Avenue. I am also a psychologist in community and private practice. My father ran a wholesale distributing business out of 307 Kent from the mid 60s to the late 80s. And I worked there after school and over summers for many years. I'm sorry, I keep turning off my video on my video and it keeps going off, I don't know why. Uh, I remember when both Domino Sugar and the Schaefer Brewery were fully functioning factories. Kent Avenue smelled like beer in those days, and I joked that I knew what beer smelled like long before I ever tasted it. My father eventually purchased the building with my partner, Louis Silverman's father, who owned and operated a trucking company up the street where my father leased his trucks. After my father closed his business, we rented 307 Kent to City Meals on Wheels for many years. They were wonderful tenants, and we had a great relationship with them. 
But several years ago, they told us that they would not be renewing their lease, explaining that the type of business they operated, which was reliant on large trucks running up and down Kent Avenue, as my father's business had been, was no longer viable in the neighborhood as it was evolving from a manufacturing area to a residential area. It was at this point that Lewis and I began to consider a rezoning. We wanted to build something that would support the community and provide opportunities for work. And we reached out to many community leaders and members for guidance. Pre-COVID, we decided to pursue rezoning to redevelop the site with a building that would cater to those who wanted to work close to home, to bike and walk to work. If my clinical practice is any indication, post-COVID, people will likely adopt a hybrid work model where having an office close to home is an even more appealing option. Our land use lawyer, Judy Gallant, will now describe our rezoning application. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Lago and Commissioners. I'm Judy Gallant from Brian Cave, uh, land use attorney for the applicant. Next slide, please. This is an application to rezone 307 Kent Avenue from an M31 to an M15 district to facilitate the construction of a nine story <laughs> building that would accommodate office, retail, light manufacturing, and community facility uses. The application also requests the mapping of an M14 R6A mixed use district and the establishment of an MIH area over property adjacent to the development site. Next slide, please. The rezoning area is located on the western portion of the block bounded by Kent Avenue on the west, Wyeth on the east, South 2nd Street on the north, and South 3rd Street on the south. Here you can see the development site, which is located at the corner of South 3rd and Kent and its surrounding context. Domino buildings and Domino Park to the west, northwest, and southwest, the Williamsburg Bridge to the south, and Grand Ferry Park to the north. Next slide, please. The site is a 14,425 square foot lot currently developed with a single story building occupied by a production and event space. The application proposes to rezone the site from M31 to M15 because the neighborhood around it, as Lily said, has changed from a manufacturing area to an increasingly mixed use residential area, as you'll see from the following slides. Next slide. West of the site across Kent Avenue is the Domino Refinery Building, part of the five block Domino campus that was rezoned in 2010 from M31. The refinery is being enlarged and converted to office use. To the south across South Third Street from the development site is the Domino Upland Building at 325 Kent, which is a 15 story residential building with ground floor retail shown on the right. Next slide. On the left is another view of 325 Kent, south of the site. Um, uh, zoomed out across Kent Avenue, 280 Kent will contain 680 dwelling units, a new elementary school and parking. Further north on the right is another domino building, 260 Kent, two towers containing residential uh, and commercial and retail uses. In total, domino will contain approximately 2,300 dwelling units and 480,000 square feet of commercial space, transforming the area from its heavy manufacturing path to a true mixed use community. Next slide. In addition to the Domino residential buildings, there's also residential use adjacent to 307 Kent, as well as on the balance of the project block, much of which is already mapped in an MX district in which residential use is as of right. Shown here are two residential condo buildings fronting on South 2nd and South 3rd Streets adjacent to the site that were developed pursuant to a variance in 2003. Next slide. The land use map illustrates the mixed use nature of the neighborhood today, which continues to move away from its industrial path. The prevalent red, yellow, and peach are commercial, residential, and mixed use buildings. And the less prevalent purple is industrial use. The large purple area on the left is Domino, which is no longer in manufacturing use. Next slide. The existing M3 district shown in Peach is currently limited to portions of three blocks extending from South Third Street on the south to Grand Street on the north. The size of the M3 district has been reduced over time pursuant to various uh, rezoning so that today the entirety of the district is surrounded uh, by districts that permit residential use as of right. M3, as you know, is intended for heavy industrial uses that generate noise, traffic, and pollutants, and are intended to be and typically are located far from residential uh, uses. Next slide. The rezoning would map an M15 district over the western portion of the block extending 120 feet from Kent Avenue covering the development site and two lots to the north and small portions of uh, 7501 and 7502. Um, it would also include a 95 westward extension of the special mixed use district that's already found on the eastern portion of the block to meet the M15 district. And it would establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area over the portion of the block that would be added to the MX district. Next slide. 
The proposed M15 district is a light manufacturing district that permits industrial uses that meet strict performance standards, as well as office, retail, and community facility uses, limited community facility uses. The maximum FAR for commercial and manufacturing uses is five, and the maximum FAR for community facility uses is 6.5. The maximum street wall height is 85 feet, after which a building must set back 20 feet on narrow streets such as Kent and South Third, and then rise under a sky exposure plane of 2.7 to one. Next slide. M15's bulk would mediate between the domino high-rise buildings to the west and south of the site and the lower buildings that adjoin the rezoning area to the east and north. This figure shows existing buildings in white and those approved and or under construction in pink. Uh, the proposed building at 307 Kent is shown in the sort of aqua blue. The height of the proposed building at 151 feet would be lower than several nearby buildings, including 325 Kent, which you saw earlier to the south, which is 170 feet tall, 321 wise to the east, which is 210 feet tall, and all of the domino buildings on the waterfront, which will range in height from 200 feet to 535 feet. The proposed building would also be similar in height to the Esquire Shoe Polish Factory, converted to condominium use at 330 wise, which is 147 feet tall. Next slide. This is an illustrative rendering of <clears throat> the nine story building that could be constructed on the development site. It would contain up to 93,000 square feet of floor area consisting of office, light industrial, community facility, and ground floor retail. The base would set back five feet from the property line on Kent Avenue to provide an enhanced pedestrian circulation area. It would then rise five feet, uh, five stories and 85 feet above the street line, set back in another 25 feet on Kent Avenue and 25 feet on South Third with a total height of 151 feet. Uh, Louis Silverman, another owner of the site and a member of the development team, will continue the presentation. Good morning, Chair Lago and Commissioners. My name is Louis Silverman. I'm a partner in 307 Kent Associates. I have a long history with the site and neighborhood as my family and I operated a business down the block starting in the 60s and purchased 307 in 1986. Since then, we've maintained our involvement and investment in the neighborhood by operating real estate and several, several small businesses in the area. As Judy has demonstrated, and Lily has also explained, this area of Williamsburg has changed significantly over the years. Heavy industrial businesses have left and residents have moved in. Against this backdrop, we are pursuing a rezoning that would allow 307 Kent to be developed for uses that are more appropriate for the surrounding area. Rather than adding more apartments to the area, we feel the neighborhood would benefit from an office building that would serve the existing residents of the area. We choose this particular zoning district in in part because it allows for office, light industrial, medical office, and ground floor retail uses. We feel our building will help build Williamsburg into a true live, work, play community. We of course recognize that COVID has changed the world. We do not think COVID eliminated the need for office space. Rather, it has and will continue to change how businesses and people interact with, with their offices. We believe businesses and medical providers will seek new and or additional locations with smaller footprints that are located closer to where their employees and patients are. Our proposed rezoning is, to, is intended to accommodate all of these users. Throughout this process, we've gathered lots of feed, feedback, support, questions, and comments from key stakeholders and community members. To give you a bit more specifics, we are partnering with St. Nick's Alliance to support its construction training programs and have pledged to make construction jobs available to local residents. We've also had ongoing dialogue with, with Evergreen Exchange on how light industrial users fit into the neighborhood and how best to accommodate that. We have received several letters of support from neighbors on the block, small business owners in the neighborhood and community residents. We greatly appreciate everyone's time today and would be happy to answer any questions that the commission may have. Thank you. Questions from the commission? Well, then we'll give our thanks to the applicant team. And our next speaker will be Corey Allen, who is here in person. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the commission. My name is Corey Allen, and as an owner in the property standing to be most impacted by the requested zoning change, I would like to offer an alternate perspective and implore you to consider rejecting this request. Not only do I believe that the proposed changes to be out of touch with the character and history of this low rise neighborhood, but it is unwarranted given the slew of vacant commercial spaces that litter 
all of the newly constructed buildings in a two or three block radius. I was happy to see the presented photographs from the, uh, the previous speakers because I could see my apartment clearly uh, in the rendering and see how clearly I will not be able to see it if this development goes forward. I'm an artist and an educator who moved to South Williamsburg to be a part of the neighborhood's vibrant culture and community, community that is seemingly continuously under attack by developers. When I moved into that neighborhood, uh, there was a bike track and a community garden across the street, which has been replaced by a 17 floor building. I could see the sky out of four of my windows when I bought my house. At the end of Two Trees creation of the 17 floor building, I could see the sky out of two. If this goes forward, I will not be able to see the sky out of any of the windows in my apartment. I'm one person, so it's not a real big, it doesn't matter to anyone that my, my view my view and my windows obstructed, but I do think it is representative of what is happening in this neighborhood. There are a lot of buildings, three, four stories tall. Families have been there for a long period of time whose whole lives are being disrupted by the noise, the chaos, the pollution, the increased uh, traffic on this limited infrastructure, and it is a human problem. It's a human problem. Pandemic has sent many of us into our homes to work. We're pile driving and construction noise and dust and all of these things impact our ability to work and our children's abilities to learn online. Uh, it's a counter view. I just wanted to make sure that it is on the record before any decision is made. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Allen, for taking the time to come and per in person and to tell us we welcome all testimony, including yours questions. Again, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Elizabeth Hansel by telephone. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chairman. Thank you for uh, allowing me to testify here today uh, remotely. I'm also a resident in the community um, and, and live um, in, the, in the building adjacent to the proposed development. I I have supported a lot of development around the community since I moved to this uh, building about 12 years ago. And I think a lot of the development is really positive. The domino um, development, while it's a bit painful for the residents to be here while it's going on, I think it's added a lot of value for the community. And the building at 325 Kent, which is the only, the only building on this side, the, the west side, of um, Kent Avenue that is a towering um, above the rest of the buildings was an exception that was granted to Domino at the time. The, the zoning in the neighborhood was meant to keep the, this side of Kent Avenue a low profile. And I, I'm not against the <coughs> development at 307 Kent, but I don't think it should be able to go up nine stories and match the building next door. We're gonna create just a wall along Kent Avenue that blocks the views and the air for the community. And I think echoing Corey's uh, remarks, there's already so much vacant commercial space in the neighborhood. It just doesn't seem to me that it's necessary to grant a variance to build so large. There's already a lot of space that that 307 Kent could use. Um, and when you factor in the vacant space and the space that Domino still needs to uh, fill, it, it just doesn't seem to make sense to the neighborhood. Um, you know, when our when the sponsor of the building where we live built this building, they were only allowed to build four stories or five stories high. And now it seems like every developer can get an exception. Um, and it, it just it doesn't make sense to me um, for the neighborhood. So I, I guess I'm with Corey and trying to raise the concern of not only, I mean, I don't have great views from my apartment anyway, so that doesn't matter, but I just think the having another hulking huge building on this side of Kent 
it is not good for the neighborhood. Um, one last point, Kent Avenue at the intersections of South Third and South Second seem very dangerous to me. We, we actually cross in the middle of the street with my daughter because the intersections at South Third are so bad already. Um, Thank you, Ms. Hansel. Another point. Thanks, you got it in just under the wire. <laughs> Thank you. Questions for Ms. Hansel. Okay, thank you for your testimony. And our next speaker testifying remotely will be Larry Rothschild. Mr. Rothschild appears not to be in the Zoom, and so we will turn to Bert Noonan. Uh, yes, good morning. My name is Bert, and um, excuse me, I am a uh, longtime. Um, neighbor in in the community and a neighbor of the applicant uh, application for 307 Kent. Uh, I used to be about two blocks away for um, 25 years ago for 10 years and have been uh, up the street on the block at 41R South uh, 3rd Street for uh, 20, block, 20 years. And I um, respectfully disagree with the first two commenters. Uh, I don't think it is uh, an inappropriate. I actually think it's a, a, a an appropriate transition and an appropriate use. I think having a one-story um, heavy manufacturing building in that location is outdated. Um, I recognize that there are questions about the height, but the height is not just consistent with the new buildings um, that have gone up at Domino's, but are, is also consistent with other buildings, neighboring buildings on the neighboring blocks. Uh, some of which have been there for 30 to 100 years, whether it's 330 Kent or three, sorry, 330 Weiss, the Esquire building, or 390 Weiss, um, the old Machete uh, Matchet uh, Candy Company, uh, both of which are, uh, are 120 and 140 odd feet tall, uh, as is the new building um, 321 Weiss, which is 11 floors, and that's between South Second and South Third, um, or 19 floors, excuse me. So there are other buildings that are around that are of a, an equal height um, or even a taller height, and this seems to be a reasonable transition between the lower four to six stories and the larger buildings of Domino's. It also would seem to be a better use, to have an, a, a possibility of a mixture of light manufacturing and office use uh, rather than a one-story industrial, heavy industrial warehouse, which um, has not even been used as a, as a heavy industrial one-story warehouse, but has rather been an event space uh, for some time. Good neighbors as an event space, but that was because the heavy usage of the uh, the uh, demand for the industrial uh, heavy usage uh, has disappeared. So I um, respectfully disagree. I actually think this is a good application, and it is an appropriate height, and it is a good use of the space. Uh, in terms of a transition from the larger buildings of Domino's to the smaller, uh, generally lower buildings upland. Um, and again, the use, I think, is to, uh, an appropriate to have a mixture of light office, excuse me, light manufacturing and office use. Um, I, I think it makes a good fit for the neighborhood. Thank you, Mr. Noonan. Questions? Thank you for testifying. It appears that Mr. Rothschild has re-entered the room, and so we would welcome his testimony. Good morning. Good morning. Please go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the time. Uh, so I, I'm the Director of Workforce Development for St. Nick's Alliance. Um, I just wanted to quickly speak on that we're in favor of this project. Um, there is a commitment to uh, local hiring for the project. Um, and uh, we run a construction skills training program, a seven week training program, and we match uh, and we'll be matching uh, talent. There's a commitment to hire at least uh, two individuals uh, and pay for the training. Um, and so we feel that this supports the community um, in terms of employment opportunities and uh, employing local individuals. Um, and our, our construction training program uh, has great success. We have a 90% placement rate. And, and we've seen 21% uh, wage growth um, from with our participants. Um, and so we, we look forward to the opportunity to place more people on, on local projects um, through our seven week skill build construction training program. 
Thank you, Mr. Rothschild. Questions? Thank you for testifying. Right. Our next speaker will be Zachary Weiner. How are you? Welcome. Thank you. Um, I wanted to speak more about the uh, character of the developer and the project itself. Um, my name is Zach Weiner. Uh, my family has had businesses in the North and South Williamsburg area since 1980. And as the owner of Colonial Glass, uh, that was on North 12th Street, I did business with uh, G4 Truck Rental, which uh, one of the developers uh, was the owner of for 15 years. Uh, I'm currently partners with uh, Louis Silverman on Spirit Animal, which is a wine store in South Williamsburg, and Murano, which is a restaurant on Broadway. And Louis has been a valuable and responsible member of the neighborhood for 30 plus years, which is why I support 307 Kent uh, rezoning proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Apologies for mispronouncing your name. Uh, Questions okay. for Mr. Uh, Weiner? Uh, uh, yeah, thanks. Okay, seeing no questions, thank you. And Brian, those are the only speakers that I see having signed up. Okay, um, I want to note that the record on this matter is going to remain open through Monday, the 26th of July of this year to receive written comments on the draft environmental impact statement. And with that, this public hearing is closed. Okay, next item, Borough of Manhattan, calendar number 41, CD 12, C180024 MMM. Public hearing in the matter of an application for a city map amendment concerning restoring the George City Map Amendment. We will have a team a 10 minute team presentation by an applicant team comprised of Tim Nordweir, Rocco Satera, and Christopher Lee. Thank you for going to leave. This is Chris Lee. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. All right, good morning, members of the commission. My name is Christopher Lee, Senior External Relations Manager for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. With me is Rocco Cetera, Assistant Director for Capital Programs of the Port Authority's Tunnels, Bridges, and Terminals Department, and Tim Nordeweer from the Sam Schwartz Engineering. We'll be testifying as a team, and we'll review our request to reconcile the city map and the history that brought us to this point. The Port Authority is currently investing $1.9 billion in 11 state of good repair projects to upgrade the George Washington Bridge connecting Northern Manhattan to Fort Lee, New Jersey. This project is referred to as the Restore the George project. As part of this, we are building ADA pedestrian and bicycle approach ramps connecting the main span sidewalks. These new access ramps traverse roadway ramps and paper streets that this new LERP application requests discontinuance and closing. Today, we seek your support to update the city map and reflect the current land use and street network. Next slide. Thanks, Chris. So the plan on the right is known as GWB 4-57, approved by the city in 1957. It includes the ramps to and from the George Washington Bridge in the area that is now the subject of the mapping action. This ULERP will update the city map to reflect the current land uses and the existing street network of city and Port Authority roadways. So in 1957, the Port Authority presented the city with a plan to expand the GWB approaches. The city reviewed and approved the plan as evidenced by the Board of Estimate Resolution. Just wanna point out that at the time, BOE stood for Board of Estimate, and uh, I believe it is now the Board of Education, not to be confused. The resolution provided for the transfer of air rights over the expressway between Wadsworth Avenue and Audubon Avenue, and such other rights required to affect the plan, with no additional consideration contemplated between the parties. In 1957, the Port Authority constructed the ramps. Even though neither the city nor the Port Authority have located records of any formal property transfer, both the city and the Port Authority have operated since 1962 as if the Port Authority owns all of the land on which the ramps are built. The Port Authority has made the subject er maintained the subject area since 1957. At present, this ULERP is a procedural formality to update the city map 
which will allow for subsequent transfer of the unbuilt city street property from the city to the Port Authority and to complete the process that was left unfinished from the 1950s and 60s. Also, at the request of New York City DOT, a piece of land, the Haven Avenue turnaround, will be ceded from the Port Authority to the city for no fee. Next slide, please. This slide shows the location of the subject area. On the left is a superimposition of the paper streets onto the existing ramp complex. Next slide, please. This slide shows the subject area overlaid onto the city's tax map. Next slide, please. So the city map change will accomplish the following. Number one, it will clean up and update the city map and formalize the street network that has been in place since the 1950s GWB ramp construction. Second, it will discontinue and close the mapped, but unbuilt paper streets and align the city map with the existing use of space. At the request of the city DOT, it will formally establish a turnaround on Haven Avenue, as seen in the image on the right by the half moon shaded area just north of 180th Street. This area will be ceded from the Port Authority to the city for no fee. Finally, being that the map was prepared in close collaboration with the Manhattan Borough President's Office topographical engineer, the city map change will update the city map to reflect miscellaneous existing topographic features and existing legal grades as directed by the, borough, the borough's topographical engineer. Next slide, please. Good, good morning, commissioners. In the left-hand image on this slide, we have superimposed the paper streets shown in gray on the existing roadway network and street network. We've also added in bold the plans for the ADA bicycle pedestrian approach ramps, plazas and viewing platforms uh, being constructed as part of our 178th, 179th Street rehabilitation project that's being performed under the program known as Restoring the George. As you can see, the new ramps will start on Cabrini Boulevard and traverse the paper streets to connect to the George Washington Bridge. Images labeled one and two provide a sense of the existing grade separation between the lower level roadways to the George Washington Bridge and the New York City Street Network. The first image on the top shows the north condition near Cabrini and 179th Street, and the second showing uh, Cabrini and 178th Street. Next slide, please. This is an aerial image of the area in question taken on March 12, 2021. Here again, as in the plans from the previous slide, are shown the roadways and approach ramps to and from the upper and lower level of the George Washington Bridge to the New York City Street Network. You can see Cabrini. You can see 179th Street and 178th Street labeled. You can also see the new partially completed ADA ramps, especially on the north side, um, the ADA ramps, plazas, and viewing platforms. This image also makes clear the great separation that this uh, showed in the prior, prior slide. The next slide, please. So a, a brief recap of where we are with the Euler process. We filed our application in July of 2017 uh, the, Depart the Department of City Planning pre-certified in October of 2017 and no agencies expressed any opposition. Adjacent property owners were sent notices in October of 2017. And uh, in March 2020, the borough president, topographical engineer, and the and borough president both signed off on the application. In March 15th, uh, the commission, City Planning Commission, certified the application and letters from approval were received in June of 2021 from both the Community Board 12 and the Manhattan Borough President. Next slide, please. And this concludes our presentation. On behalf of the Port Authority, I'd like to thank the commissioners for your time and consideration. We're available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, those were some powerful aerial slides and I'll bring back not so fond memories of bicycling and trying to get up onto the GW Bridge. Questions for the applicant team. Okay, seeing none, well, thank you for your testimony. And Ryan, has anyone else signed up? Okay, then this public hearing is closed. Thank you so much. Borough of Manhattan, calendar number 42, CD4, C210202 ZSM, a public hearing in a matter of an application for the grant of a special permit concerning the Windermere. I note that Borough President Gail Brewer has signed up and I would accord her the courtesy 
of testifying before the applicant team or waiting until afterwards? Afterwards. afterwards. Okay. Then we will have a team presentation of 10 minutes by a team comprised of James Power, Mark Tress, Nicholas Chelko, Connor Lacefield, and Mark Tress a second time. Hi, guys. Oh, uh, hi. Uh, good morning. I'm Jim Power from Frame 11. I'm joined by our client, Mark Tress from Cedar Holdings, Nick Chelko from MA Architects, and Connor Lacefield from AKRF. Mark would first like to say a few words about the project. Mark? Would you one second, please? Can we do a one minute myself? I'm just getting my, um, my place and my, my computer acclimate. Give me 30 seconds if you don't mind, okay? Thank you. If you want to continue, Mr. Power, since there's yeah, so I'll just go paper. ahead. So next slide, please. This application concerns the Windermere, a landmark building at the southwest corner of 57th Street and 9th Avenue. It is located in the Clinton District and the Special Clinton District and in the preservation area, partially in the preservation area. Next slide, please. The application seeks a special permit pursuant to Section 74711 to modify a series of regulations and allow the conversion and enlargement of the building for commercial use. Going back through some of the history of the building, our client acquired the property in 2009. It was in disrepair and there was an extensive restoration program done pursuant to a series of approvals by, approvals by the Landmarks Commission. There had also been an unfortunate history of harassment by the prior owner of the building, which led to a cure agreement with HPD. Under that agreement, 20 affordable apartments will be provided in the converted building with a separate entrance on 57th Street. In response to Commissioner Marin's question from Monday, there would be 10 studios, six one bedrooms and four two bedrooms, all in compliance with HPD's minimum size requirements. The units would be affordable at rents not to exceed 80% of AMI. They would be administered by the Met Council on Jewish Poverty. Uh, getting back to this application through the special permit, the building would be converted for either transient hotel or office use. The application proposes two alternate schemes, both with ground floor retail and with restaurant use on the top floor. With that, uh, maybe we'll go to back to Mark and then hi. we'll review the use and bulk waivers and the restoration program, Mark. Okay, hi, Just let me, I'm, it's Mark Tress and thank you so much all for your time. Um, and good morning to all. As, as it has become known at this point, I am the developer of this Windermere project. This is a project that I've been working on extensively for many years now, too many years. And I'm excited to have reached this milestone and this stage in our approval proce process. There's been a lot of work and extensive work done to the restoration of the building, the landmark just, uh, facade uh, to restore the building to its presence at this extremely prominent location in New York City. Furthermore, I'm looking forward to including the 20 unit affordable housing component in the building in conjunction with the Met Council on Jewish poverty. I would be happy to answer any questions that anybody may have to the best of my ability and thank you for your time this morning. Nick, do you wanna go ahead with the restoration and the waivers? Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Jim. Um, Nick Chalka from Morris Hatchmany Architects. It's good to be with you all. Next slide, please. Just to review the project and the building itself, it's an individual landmark built 1880. So oldest known large apartment complex in Council District 3. It's, it's presumed it's the second oldest in New York City. Uh, as Jim described, it's 80,000 square feet of adaptive reuse from mixed use residential um, to uh, some residential uh, apartments and to commercial hotel or office uh, as we'll show. Uh, there's 20 affordable apartments per the CURE agreement as Jim mentioned. Um, which, which leaves about 62,000 square feet of office or hotel use, uh, active ground floor retail, new barrier free access on 50, West 57th Street, and a vertical addition for roof, uh, on the rooftop for outdoor access. Next slide, please. So just to show the historic condition, we're keying in on these porticos. Um, these are photographs that we used um, for the, for the uh, design drawings for our LPC application, um, and we'll show you how they informed the proposal in the next few slides. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, this was the, the building as um, at the start of the project. Uh, next slide, please. And so you can see restoration is a big aspect of what we're doing here. Uh, proposed restoration items include replacing the existing combustible wood floor and st uh, wood structure uh, with steel and concrete. So really to stabilize the structure. Um, and, and much of, of what you're seeing here um, as, as a 74-7 application is to make the current bulk um, of the building compliant with new zone uh, with the zoning regulations uh, because the building predated zoning, uh, of course. And um, when we're placing the floor, um, it requires us to uh, consider this essentially as a new building. So much of the bulk waivers are again, um, just the existing building and it's really the use waivers um, that would be uh, considered really new. Um, so clean and repair brick stone masonry, replace windows, uh, new wood storefront, new double portico. We saw the historic uh, photos and repair existing porticos to remain uh, written. Uh, so there are some porticos there that we'll replace. And then of course, uh, replacing the corners and the iron work around the areaway and at the sidewalk to match historic conditions. Next slide, please. Uh, maybe it's best seen in these next two slides. It's, uh, it's the elevations. The one on the left is really the building uh, as it is today. Um, much of the storefront has been removed. Some of the double, the double porticos have been removed and much of the details of the existing porticos have been removed. So the image on the right shows both the, the, the rooftop addition, which is uh, set back 25 feet from the, from the street wall. We'll show you that. Uh, but really on the ground floor is what we, we want to focus on with this slide. Uh, you see the new double portico um, is, is really um, is to match the historic photo that we saw, as well as the wood storefronts on the corner and, and everything um, uh, that you see in this image is, is really to be restored um, to match historic. Next image, next slide. This shows the Ninth Avenue. Again, same level of restoration all the way around and, and then the, the new storefronts to fit within the existing infill and to match the historic uh, materials and, and profiles. Next slide. Uh, the overview here shows the, 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 that the, uh, the eighth floor of the building was partially filled in. Um, and, and we're proposing to fill in the rest of that. So, so the green existed and it's behind uh, the existing parapet and gable. Then the yellow is, is the additional infill. And then the ninth floor uh, rooftop addition is what's set back uh, from both primary, primary and secondary facades uh, of the landmark structure. And then we also wanna highlight the, the pink area, which is the residential portion. Next slide. Um, this shows those, those bulkheads as minimally visible over the primary facade. Next slide. And over the secondary facade, working with LPC to really get those set back and reduce their visibilities. Next slide. And uh, this slide shows in section the, the two uh, schemes with hotel on the left and office on the right. Those uh, constitute use waivers and the restaurant on the rooftop. Next slide. We're highlighting here the bulk waivers um, and the really uh, best scene um, on, on the next slide. So we talked about the use waivers um, to go down the list here. Uh, item D you can see highlighted, that's the seventh and eighth floor. The light gray indicates that those are existing, that's existing bulk, but the hatched area shows where new zoning wouldn't, wouldn't uh, allow that bulk. Um, it exists today, so we need a waiver to, to make, make that right. Um, next slide. Okay, so um, the, the, there's windows facing the existing courts, uh, so we need to make those windows compliant uh, and the open space is, is not compliant with uh, existing open space regulations uh, based upon the, the footprint of the landmark structure. So the current status, we've stabilized it, uh, we've restored the facade, all, all facades all the way around the building, um, and yep. we're ready to do this, the, the ground floor work. So I'll turn it over to Jim to talk about the CV4 approved conditions. Uh, yes, just very quickly, since I see we're running out of time, in response to issues raised by Community Board 4, we are continuing discussions with Met Council about the age limits on the affordable units. We will comply with the HPD's policies on community preferences. We're looking at the ADA accessibility. And regarding the I'm rooftop that, restaurant- I'm afraid, I'm, I'm afraid that your time is up on this. I'll turn it yeah. over to the commission for questions. Commissioner Rompershot. 
uh, I know you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, and I know Commissioner Marin had brought it up. Uh, can you just uh, repeat the unit breakdown again? Yes, 20 total units. Ten of them are studios, six are one bedrooms, and four are two bedrooms. Okay, thank you. Uh, Other questions? Uh, no, I, yeah, I, I was just going to ask, since we the, the last speaker was just describing uh, Community Board 4, I, I just thought if he wanted the opportunity to finish, I'd be interested in hearing what he was going to provide. Well, thank you very much, um, Commissioner uh, Cirillo. Uh, we are exploring options for increased ADA accessibility for the residential units. Uh, we will provide the requested roof barrier, triple glazed windows, and address the building's history. Um, regarding the outdoor uh, component of the rooftop restaurant, we understand that the commission is not considering that as part of this application, but we would hope to possibly revisit that in the future, uh, provided it is, it is consistent with Community Board 4's policies. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Just to clarify that the request for outdoor rooftop dining was not included as part of the application and would not be within scope. Other questions? Thank you. Uh, I, I'm just wondering whether or not you have um, determined with finality which of the schemes uh, you are going to uh, pursue. Uh, Scheme A or Scheme B. Mark, could you comment on that, please? I'm sorry, what is, what is your question? I, my apologies. Uh, the of question the was whether uh, Scheme A or Scheme B, yeah, yeah. Scheme A or Scheme B, the office or the hotel, uh, do you think, uh, which uh, you think uh, you'll pursue? Uh, hotel, probability. The hotel, okay. Um, Secondly, and I, I understand that this is a voluntary agreement with regard to the 20 affordable units. Um, and coincidentally, the 80% AMI coincides with, with, with option two under, under MIH. I'm just wondering, uh, was there, was there con has consideration been given to a, a lower MAI possibly uh, sixty percent AMI, which would be uh, uh, consistent with option one of the MIH. And as I say, I uh, I understand this is a voluntary agreement with uh, with HPD, so it's just a question. Yeah, we haven't traveled that that road thus far. It would something that I would be discussing if need be with the non for profit and HPD. I also um, will note that at the review, at the, I'm sorry, at the time of certification, questions were raised about there being a poor door for the affordable units. And I wondered if you would be able to address that. Um, I would, again, uh, yeah, this is not a, a poor door situation because this is the only residential units in the building are the affordable units. So, and I don't think anyone would want uh, uh, to have a entrance shared between those residential units and say the hotel uh, component of the building. Okay, so then that suggests that the approval that you're seeking is solely for the hotel and the affordable units option, not the other alternative, which we had understood was another alternative. Again, the decision hasn't been made um, thus far. I could tell you probability is what I'm responding to. Okay, so while there remains a probability of this not containing a hotel, but rather being a fully residential building, um, that would leave open the option of the poor door that had raised concerns for some commissioners. That is correct. Um, no, I'm, I'm sorry for the confusion. Um, uh, the uh, there are two alter alternatives. One is a primarily hotel. The other is primarily office. Both of those okay. alternatives would include the affordable housing, neither of which includes a market rate residential. Got it. Okay. Then that fully addresses the concern. Thank you. Thanks for the clarification. Thank you. 
Not seeing any other uh, no. questions, I will thank the applicant team and also note that having walked by this building for most of my adult life and seen it as in its deplorable condition, it is very nice to see it getting some tender loving care. Thank you very much. It's very kind, kind of you to say that. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Borough President Gail Brewer. And I will note that uh, there is no time limit for our elected officials. I am supportive. I am Gail Brewer. I am the Manhattan Borough President. I am supportive of this application. I know that the community board and I would like to see a range of uh, types of individuals in the affordable housing. So it would be families and senior citizens. And we would like to see that the lottery have a preference for local members of the community. Um, I wanna say that this is a very special building. I wanna thank Mark Tress. I've known him for a long time um, for uh, working on the landmark portion. And we're really excited that Met Council is the uh, nonprofit that will be running the units that are affordable. And I hope that it would be hotel. That would be my preference. Uh, ironically, I know this building since 1980 when uh, there was a lockout by the then owner who ended up on the uh, Village Voice's worst landlords list in the whole city. The tenants were um, aided uh, particularly by the MFY Legal Services, Deborah Rand, and also by housing conservation coordinators. I will be sending you the history that I know, some of you may have seen it in the papers, but it's, it's a hist historic in the sense that it was a building for women, uh, even though somehow Steve McQueen lived there for a while, but it is since 1980, even a more uh, challenging history. The individuals who were locked out at that point, and then there was another lockout in 1983, uh, were assisted by these wonderful lawyers, and they did end up in some cases uh, being housed in the Clinton Special District, but not all of them. And then um, after I was working for Ruth Messenger, but then when I was a council member in 2007, um, the city came along that night and said the seven tenants that were there had to leave. We tried to keep them. Um, they had no running water for years. They had survived in this building, some of them in the large apartments, some of them in the SROs. I had toured that building in its decrepit uh, condition for many, many years. Um, at the end, we also, uh, working with Landmarks Preservation Commission, um, we worked uh, to make sure that the landmarks were preserved. But in, in the interim, uh, uh, sometime, some 20 years, as you heard, Toa Construction uh, Corp, which is in Japan, was the owner. Um, they too had not really a knowledge of how it was to be uh, running a building in the city of New York. The head of Toa heard uh, about the building because he was going by in a tourist bus and he saw it and he bought it as a result of looking at it. Many individuals went to Japan trying to buy it. I was pushing them to make an affordable housing. Uh, Roseanne Haggerty, who was then head of Breaking Ground, uh, went to Japan, was not able to convince Mr. the Toa Construction Company that they could uh, sell it to her, and they didn't. Um, so, you know, it was an ongoing uh, situation with uh, Debbie Rand then became head of uh, litigation at, at uh, HPD. Um, and Housing Conservation Coordinate continued their effort, even on behalf of the seven tenants who were who finally there. Without getting into all the situations, it's quite a story. I want to give Mark Tress credit. It took him about nine months to work with the Toa construction. Um, he too, uh, I believe, went to Japan, certainly had many, many long discussions about the civic affairs and the world in general. And he, to his credit, was able to purchase it. And as the chair said, uh, converted into what is, I think, a wonderful landmarks uh, example of what landmarks can do. So because this building means so much to me, I just want to give you a little history um, and to let you know that it is hopefully going to be resided in. And uh, thanks to the Clinton Special District, there will be some affordable apartments. It's quite a history. Um, and I did try to uh, put it on writing for all of you. Community Board 4 has been very helpful. Um, certainly Joe Rusticia uh, in particular. Um, and certainly uh, Kathy, uh, who was one of the tenants there and uh, everybody from Housing Conservation Coordinators. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I appreciate this and I'm certainly supportive. Thank you. 
thank you, Madam Borough President, for both reminding us of the history and also the putting human faces on um, on this. It's not just about a building. It's about the people principally. Yes, question from Commissioner Dweck. Thank you. Um, Madam Borough President, thank, thank you. Just uh, if you could shed some light on your uh, reasoning for the hotel um, in light of the future hearings that we have going on today, just to get some what you what your insight is on on that you know i'm no expert on whether to be commercial because of course we're all concerned about the vacancy in the commercial and then we have the concern about we have so many hotels are we going to have enough tourists um it, i am the reason just this is just personal this is an amazing building and when you have hotels you know you can go in and out of it it feels more open it's something as the commissioner said, uh, the chair said, she goes by it all the time. I know a daily news reporter is also interested in it because she goes by it all the time. And if it was a hotel, I would feel that people would still be able to enter it um, as a landmark. To me, that's important. This, um, the issue of a hotel uh, that has, this is Gail Brewer talking now, brick. I'm not a big, you know, I don't love the glass and the shiny. I love the brick. And I do think that people come into New York City to as tourists. I know there are other hotels. I think I know every inch of Manhattan. There are other hotels in the area, but this would be a very special one that I think would do well. So it's it's the access to a landmark building that would be more accessible as a hotel than as a commercial. And then the second is that I think that um, that it would be a, an attractive hotel for tourists, even though there are so many other hotels in our city right now. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, thank you again for taking the time, Madam Borough President. Very thank much you. appreciated. Thank you very much. And Ryan, have any other speakers signed up? Okay, so this public hearing is closed. Next item, the Borough of Manhattan, calendar numbers 43 and 44. CD9, calendar number 43. C, 210261 ZMM. Calendar number 44, N, 210262, ZRM. A public hearing in the matter of applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning 629 to 639, 142nd Street rezoning. There will be a 10-minute team presentation by an applicant team comprised of Ariel Ausgang, Christopher Walker, Nancy Dune, and Eric Polotnick. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. This is Eric Palatnik, and we're proud to be here today to present to you a proposed rezoning at 633 to 641 West 142nd Street, R6A to an R9A district that, if approved, would allow for the building you see on the left side of your screen here, a beautiful, stately designed building that really captures the grandeur of Riverside Drive. It will be 17 stories. If approved, it would have 81 dwelling units, 20 of which would be affordable. Next slide, please. This shows you the affected properties. There are five properties in the proposed rezoning area. Uh, they are all controlled by the applicant. Uh, 633 West 142nd on the right side of your screen in gray will remain as a row house. The block that you're looking at has some row houses, which you can see on the right side of the screen where it says no proposed rezoning. The remainder of the block is, is developed upon with multiple dwellings, both the south side and the north side. Next slide, please. This shows you the boundaries of the proposed rezoning district. It's important to note that the R9A that we are proposing is rather contiguous with the larger building that is on the southerly side of Riverside Drive and West 142nd. We'll call that out in a second. Next slide, please. The site is depicted on the left side in its current condition. It's a vacant lot with the four remaining row houses. The row houses are not all in excellent condition. Uh, some are in rather disrepair structurally, and we'll go through that in a second. The right side shows you what's proposed. Next slide, please. The proposal is consistent with the needs of the community board, although we did meet with the community board multiple times throughout the application process pre-ULERP, tried to meet with their needs. 
at the last meeting we had with them, it was determined unanimously they didn't like the proposal. So we're not tone deaf to that, nor are we tone deaf to the, the ideas that your, your own commission had. So we do have an alternative proposal to show you at the end, if you have any questions, to show you an R8A proposal. However, the R9A that we're showing you right now, we believe does blend within both Riverside Drive and the needs stated in the community district board's needs. Next slide, please. <laughs> Interesting to note that this community board and, and is, is the rents are increasing nearly 5% or 4% faster than they are in Manhattan. Next slide, please. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners, officially afternoon. Uh, I am Nancy Dune, a planner with VHB who prepared the EAS. So the image at the top of this slide shows how the building would be consistent with the primarily large scale apartment buildings along Riverside. Uh, directly south of the site is a 140 foot tall building and then south along Riverside, the buildings range between 128 and 216 feet. Uh, the diagrams on the lower right shows that there's a significant grade change along the block. It's a change of 49 feet between Broadway and Riverside. And as a result, as you can see on the top image, although the building would be 170 feet in total height, it appears to be only 39 feet taller than the building of Broadway. And the image on the lower left looks down 142nd Street from Broadway. So directly across the street from the site, you see that um, 140 foot tall building along Riverside. And as you look down 142nd Street, you really can't see that building. Uh, and that would be similar for the proposed building. Next slide. This proposed view from Broadway looking west illustrates just how typically New York our concept of capping off this row house block with a mid-rise apartment house is, and how overwhelmingly the majority of the row houses will be retained. Next slide, please. So the map on the left on this slide shows how the FAR is consistent with the buildings along Riverside, uh, which you can see um, highlighted is 100, within 100 feet of Riverside, the proposed building would really mirror the total density directly to the south and even to the north. And on the other blocks, this density is actually carried deeper east into the side streets. Uh, the map on the right shows how the project is consistent and compatible with the building heights within 100 feet, 100 feet of Riverside. Next slide. We've designed what we, what we believe to be uh, a building that reflects many of the iconic building characteristics of this neighborhood. Our building is brick and stone. And as you can see here, I don't have to run through all of the different characteristics, but we're proposing a metal canopy, uh, a modern contemporary interpretation of bay windows and a stone base. Next slide, please. We're going to design this building to a lead equivalent efficiency. And we're gonna be focusing on zero on-site carbon emissions with solar panels to supplement electric usage. Next slide, please. This slide is very compelling from an inclusionary housing perspective. The left side of the slide, up, oh, go back one side there, thank you. I'm a jinx on the slides. The left side of the slide shows you the number of developments in the community, 18 projects since the adoption of MIA. On the right side, it shows you how many units have been created, none, zero. The property we're talking about has remained historically vacant for decades. If given the opportunity, we're hoping to fill the void and create more affordable. Next slide, please. This slide gives you an idea of the number of affordable units that we're proposing to create. The current zoning is shown on the left side, number 32. That depicts the existing R6A zoning. Nothing, nobody or nothing has been built under the R6A on this site. The proposal would allow for the proposed R9A and it would create 20 affordable units for a total of 61. It would all be at MIH option level one. Next slide, please. This gives you a breakdown of the studios and the number of uh, dwelling units and the breakdown of distribution. We'd be happy to come back to that later if anybody has any question. Next slide. So the rezoning area is located in a National Register eligible uh, West Harlem Historic District. It is not a New York City landmark designated or eligible district. Uh, so when we assess the conditions of the existing buildings, we found that they really lack historic integrity uh, for several reasons that are noted on this slide. Uh, 633 and 635 have been resurfaced with a synthetic 
Stone Revere, which is out of character for the time period and also the other remaining 12 row houses on the block. Uh, the curvature of Riverside Drive resulted in a non-occupied unusable parcel at the end of the block. Two of the buildings, 633 and 635, have a they have a non-raised first floor entry because their entrance, entrance stoops were removed. And as, as a result, it really visually breaks the rhythm of the uh, 12 other row houses. Uh, not surprising, various hazardous materials were used in the construction of these buildings. Uh, due to the late development of Riverside Drive and that curvature, the westernmost or end row house has an undesigned blank western exterior wall. And then lastly, the easternmost row house will be preserved and remain intact. Next slide. This slide has been created to give everybody some confidence that nobody has been displaced from any of the row houses that you see in front of you. What all of these numbers and dates are showing you is the relocation process for many of the tenancies within each of the row houses. The end result was that everybody either left voluntarily or is relocated into a brand new or brand new rehabilitated unit at 633 West 142nd. Next slide. We believe our proposal is well within the context of existing bulk on Riverside Drive. Additionally, we're proposing many amenities such as a double height 1800 square foot lobby and grand entrance with the doorman available for everybody. Amenity rooms and outdoor recreation spaces also available for all the residents. Active design features and rooftop dormers stepping down from the corner to the mid block. We hope you agree that for all the reasons we've outlined, this building is, in, is intended to be one that enhances, respects, and is compatible with this wonderful neighborhood. This concludes our presentation and we do have plans available if needed for during questions. Before turning this over to the commission, I do want to reiterate the point that I had made at the time of certification that while the department supports the development of housing and MIH housing, from the outset, we express concerns to the applicant that the proposed R9A zoning district was too aggressive for the location and for the context. The applicant refused to discuss at that time other alternatives. And so I certainly have concerns that now after the community board's period of time for consideration, after the borough president's period of time for consideration, this is the time that the applicant says, oh, we'll now discuss alternatives that we had discussed with them prior to certification. And with that, I'll turn it over to other commissioners. Commissioner Dweck. You had mentioned earlier uh, you had some scheme schematics on the R8A. If you can uh, show, show them that. Yes, we'd be happy. The uh, whoever's and and I'd be happy to present those, and I'd be happy to explain some to the commission uh, why we came with the R9A. We spent uh, approximately two years meeting with the community board. Unfortunately, it was about five months ago, the manager passed away suddenly. Uh, we had been presenting to them the R9A to try to find a common ground to see if we could find a commonality. There was not a unanimous opposition to the discussion through that entire time period. It wasn't into the conclusion meetings that the storm shop. So, Madam Chair, we do expect uh, we, we were more correct at the beginning. And we were told that it might not fly, uh, but we also did express to, to everybody involved that we would try to work with the community. And when we did learn, uh, at the end, everything got a little mixed up with the community because there was a sudden death of the district manager. And I, I believe if we had more time, we could have revised our plans and worked a little bit more succinctly, but due to Corona and a sudden death, uh, I think it threw us all off a little bit. We would very much like the very opportunity much. to show you the R8A. Uh, it don't be up on the screen now. It's in the appendix at slide 28. If somebody could pull it up, please. I will note that there was no confusion in the discussions with the department prior to certification. Um, so your reference to confusion, were there any, is solely with respect to the community board. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're working to get the presentation up again. Um, and While we're doing that, perhaps we'll take other questions sure. and then come back to this, Commissioner Dweck. Commissioner Rompershot. Will you be sharing this RA Day uh, presentation to the community board? Yes, we would like to go back to the community board. Uh, and we were told clearly by the department that they did not support the R9A. That was, there was no confusion there. And as I said, we, we did try to present it with the community board. 
we would like to bring it back to the community board. We've studied the R8A and we appreciate prepared full plan. We heard the comments at the review session. And if you go to the next slide, we'd like to show you the R8A. Here you can see clearly that the R8A allow for a 30 foot drop in height. It would bring the building down to a consistent height with what's going on around it immediately, although not on Riverside Drive up and down it, but immediately. It would be a modest reduction in the number of units. Next slide. It would be a modest reduction in the number of units from an R9A to an R8A. As you can see here, the right side, the third bullet, the left side is the R9A, 20 affordable. The R8A would provide 17. The total number of units would drop by about 15. This, we feel, would meet the requirements or the concerns that were expressed throughout our hearing process. Next slide, please. The remainder of it is similar to the presentation we gave you a few minutes ago. And if you, next slide. Next slide. This slide shows you the revised plan that we've created for the RA day. This slide reduces the height of the building to 140 feet. It still creates a, a, a very substantial number of affordable dwelling units, and it brings the building in line almost to the exact height of the building southwest corner of 142nd and Riverside Drive. Uh, we, we have Ari here to talk about it more, and uh, we can give you, uh, if you go two more slides forward, please, it'll give you one more perspective. I think that the commission might find help. One more slide, there you go. And that, that's the building at the lower height, reduced from 17 stories the 14 stories. I'd be happy to answer any questions about this. This make that the commission and uh, address their concerns. And then we'd like to go back to the community. I will note that the community, as the applicant team is well aware, the community board is on its summer hiatus and that the way to discuss other alternatives is not upon being presented to the commission at the first time at its public hearing. Um, Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, hello. Um, I have a question about the unit mix. If, oh, you just pulled the presentation down, but um, uh, there, you know, there's a, a large number of studio apartments, um, 42 of the 82 total units. Um, could you speak to who those units are for and what your uh, assumptions are behind, you know, occupancy? When we had started the conversations with the board uh, years, a lot of discussion was made uh, to try to give people an opportunity for entry level housing into the community, as well as to maintain people in the community. So we tried to focus on the studios and two bedrooms. Uh, we created uh, 42 studios at 52% of the total units. Uh, and 19 two bedrooms with the remainder being one bedroom. very small amount of three bedrooms uh, that was something we were working on when we were meeting with everybody but Ari Ang is on the phone he's the project architect uh, I'm sure we could adjust the unit mix if the commission deemed it suitable um you know just digging into the question on affordability the the balance of affordable units in the studio apartments you know, I wondered if you had received any feedback from the community board on that, if there was concern. Didn't get that deep when we got there on the final round because everybody was vehemently opposed to the size of the building. Uh, so <laughs> the, the conversation really focused on the building and its density and its height. And uh, that's where most of the conversation was focused on. Uh, the earlier work we've done with the community is what's reflected here, but I think that's all out the window at this point. So we'd be happy to uh, amend the distribution uh, if if it should be so needed, uh, we are in discussions and can continue to be in discussions with the borough president. Expressed her concern, and we are of course communicating with the councilman's office. So I know, Madam Chair, that it is summertime, uh, but we do have people that we can speak with to try to uh, uh, alleviate your concerns and achieve your goals. And who at the community board? Well, the community board, uh, there's there's new management in the community board, so we'd have to we'd have to develop our relationships there. But we'll go back to the community board. Uh, we were meeting with the, the interim district manager and the board, uh, so we'll find our way back. Uh, we'll speak with the, with the councilman and the borough president to find out uh, how to find a way in. 
again, I'll note that the community board is on its summer recess. And I, I would just to follow up, I would ask that you raise this question specifically and get feedback on the distribution of affordability through unit size. We'd be happy. Thank you. Commissioner Knight. Yes, so I want to confirm that buildings on lots 15, 16, and 115 are currently vacant. Yes, all three are vacant. Other questions? Oh, yes, Commissioner, Commissioner Dwight. Well, what, what's the Euler clock on this? Would there be time for, for, for us to get some input from the community board? Uh, I think realistically, no, because, again, they are on their summer break, and we are on a time clock. Yeah. Uh, I'll just comment, if, if I may, that I think it's important for us, you know, the community board is an integral part of this process, and them not having the opportunity to comment on an R8A uh, is somewhat problematic. So, I, I, w I mean, the borough president's office, I'm sure, is working, and uh, so our other city council, like you mentioned. But if there could be some way to get us some input from the uh, community board, recess or not, it would be very much appreciated and go a long way. And considering an R8, I don't think anybody, uh, well, certainly I'm not considering an R9A, but I don't know what my fellow commissioners are considering. So. Thank you for that comment, Commissioner Dweck. There are many instances where we know we do make changes um, as we get different input. But this is an instance where the inappropriateness of the R9A was flagged from the beginning and the applicant chose an approach of showing no flexibility. Um, in toll, we're now presented with seeing plans for the first time at the commission hearing. Um, so we will thank the applicant team and we'll now turn to other speakers, beginning with Elizabeth, uh, with Elizabeth Waitkus, who will be testifying remotely. Hello, um, thank you for allowing uh, time for me to provide testimony. My name is Liz Waitkus. I lived at 639 West 102nd Street for five years and in CB9 for the past 18 years. I loved my home on 142nd Street in the community and diversity on the block. While I was forced to move from our apartment in 2017 by the developer, I continued to maintain the feral cat colony on this site that is registered to me with the ASPCA. Before I speak about my concerns with the development, let me be clear that the developer and the super continue to allow me to take care of the cats and have agreed to work with me to humanely relocate the colony if and when the time comes. The developer should be commended for this important community related consideration. Our building was renovated in 2013 by a private owner and, it, and was in good repair while we lived there. The building, our backyard, the side lot were all well maintained and there was a real sense of community within our building and our block. Almost immediately upon moving to the block, we learned there were two developers fighting over ownership of the row houses in order to tear them down. In 2017, after the developer had successfully acquired our building and the adjacent lot, our lease, the lease on our apartment was not renewed and we were forced in an inhumane way to leave. And I'm happy to expand upon that. As you should be aware, the city rezoned the row houses on this block in 2012 from R8 to R6A. Our neighborhood was rezoned to avoid overdevelopment and to tell developers to build here and not here. I participated in those discussions at that time, which were lengthy and well considered. The buildings included in this project now proposed for demolition are some of the oldest buildings in our neighborhood. And I am a historic preservation professional and they retain a high degree of historic integrity. The row is eligible for the National Register of Historic Places and the application to the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission to designate the neighborhood as a historic district was already submitted and is pending review. The block of 142nd Street between Riverside and Broadway has a much different sense of community than many of our adjacent blocks. Because of the mix of lower row houses and apartment buildings, and the fact that 142nd Street runs directly into Riverside Park, where both the 142nd Street dog run and the playground are located. The blocks immediately south of 142nd Street do not run directly into Riverside Drive, due to the topography and the flow of the drive. I will also note the building immediately adjacent to the project on Riverside Drive is a six story building and not another tower as being suggested. As someone who is an ambassador to the block 
and interacts with residents on a daily basis, I am strongly opposed to the development on this block. I am, however, not opposed to all development, as I have suggested. Thank you, Ms. Whitekas. Thank you for taking the time to testify, and I'll now check to see if there are any questions from the commission. Thank you again, and thank you for your work on behalf of the CATS as well. Our next speaker will be Barry Weinberg. Thank you. Uh, I am Barry Weinberg. I am currently chair of Manhattan Community Board 9, and I have served on the Housing, Zoning, and Land Use Committee of the board for uh, nine years now. Um, we, uh, to set the record straight, our district manager did not pass away. Our district manager, Youth of Prince, is very much alive and well, uh, although it is true that our co-chair of the Housing, Zoning, and Land Use Committee did pass suddenly this February. However, much of the opposition and feedback, opposition to this project and feedback on suggestions to improve it had been made already in December. While it is true we first met with the developers two years ago, uh, there was a long stretch of period in time in between late 2020 and, and the initial meeting where we did not receive any meetings or uh, communication that we had requested to continue our discussion of the site. As Liz Waitakis mentioned, this block was deliberately downzoned by DCP as part of their 2012 West Harlem rezoning, which was itself agreed to by the community to accompany the Manhattanville rezoning that allowed Columbia's expansion. This was done to preserve the strong community fabric and historic character of the neighborhood while allowing for sensible development. One of the issues that has not been discussed is that the row houses slated to be demolished from 635 to 639 contain 14 units, eight of which are registered, are, are registered as rent stabilized according to property tax filings with Department of Finance. So the net production of affordable housing units uh, from the new building proposed under R9A is in reality more like eight when the 14 are subtracted from the 22. Additionally, the eight remaining rent stabilized units at 633, which is not slated for demolition, would have to live with construction above them for a substantial period of time. Um, I want to note that community opposition to this project has been nearly unanimous. In addition to the unanimous opposition from the committee, we received 46 submissions from the public, 40 of which were against, and six of those um, were, four of those were in favor, and two of those were um, suggesting a six story building with the current restrictions instead of a 17 story building. Um, the Office of Parks and Recreation, the Historic Preservation Historical Society of, of New York at the Denny Farrell Riverbank State Park expressed grave concern about the effect of the shadows that would be cast on their park, particularly their educational and horticultural center, which is directly across the street. Um, additionally, the rezoning undertaken in 2012 was to undertake in an effort to advance the goals set out in Manhattan Community Board 9's 197A plan, which was I believe one of the first to be adopted in the city. Uh, this rezoning is less than a decade old and was, and this block, if you look at the map, while it is surrounded largely by, by R8, was specifically Mr. Mr. Weinberg, I'm a, Mr. Weinberg, I'm afraid that your time is up. Oh, okay, um, thank you. But I, I, I will turn it over um, to the commission, Commissioner Eady. Hi, good afternoon and thank you for your testimony. Um, just want to ask, in regards to the conversations the community board has had with the developer, what types of suggestions or recommendations um, had the community board made to the developer um, up until now? Uh, we had wow. suggested both deeper affordability uh, on the site by oh, using thank you. programs, as well as, um, Bye. Uh, sorry, as, that's not me as well as lowering the height of the proposed development. Um, and we actually had a meeting of our Housing, Zoning, and Land Use Committee yesterday. So while the community boards are on summer hiatus, typically our Housing, Zoning, and Land Use Committee continues to meet at a minimum informally throughout the summer to monitor and respond to any proposed developments. And if I may, um, what height had the community board recommended in those um, discussions? 
I believe we had requested that they examine and return to us with a proposal considering R8A, which we knew had a height cap of 140, um, but we have not seen the R8 option that was presented here today before. Thank you. Other questions from Mr. Weinberg? Well, thank you both for your testimony and for your service on the community board. Thank you, Chair Largo. Is Anna Maria Ramirez? Hi. Um, I actually am a long term resident. I unfortunately did not participate in the community board, but um, many of my neighbors have recommended that I join this meeting and just voice my opinion. I am a public health nurse that I've dedicated several years to the community. I've been living on 142nd Street for quite some time. And I just don't think that, you know, it's really worth, first of all, it's a very massive building compared to the other buildings on our block and in the area. And if you think about it, most of the affordable units will be uh, studio apartments. And how is that gonna help the families within that area? You know, I have, I'm a mother of two children. So, you know, how is, and one on the way. <laughs> so how is, you know, these sizes gonna be um, beneficial to us? And it's just going to further exacerbate the gentrification and the cost of living in the area. And I just wanted to voice my opposition to the project and the rezoning. Thank you for taking the time, Ms. Ramirez. Thank you. Question. Yes, Commissioner, I, mean, please. I, I should add that that sort of speaks to the issue we raised before in terms of affordability and the unit mix. Yes, thank you. So thank you, Ms. Ramirez. And Ryan, th those are the only folks that I see who have signed up. And so with that, the public hearing is closed. Okay. Island, calendars numbers 45 and 46, CD1, Calendar number 45, C210361, ZMR. Calendar number 46, N210362, ZRR. A public hearing in the matter of applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning 252 Victory Boulevard. Our first speaker will be Eric Polotnik. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Eric Polotnik. And unlike the previous application, I'm proud to be here with an application with unanimous support from the community board. It's an application to rezone a parcel of land which is currently located within an R32 district and to an R6B slash C13 on Staten Island on Victory Boulevard, just up the block from the ferry terminal. Next slide, please. If the application were to be approved, it would allow for, as you can see on the right lower hand side, a 55 foot tall five story building that would include a total of 63,000 square feet of floor area that would include a much needed daycare center on the ground floor, as well as some commercial space. Next slide. This slide gives you a good imagery of the, of the site. What you're not seeing is its hillside nature. It is built into the hillside and two of the are hillside access to allow for the uh, amendment of some lot coverage as well as for a group parking facility. The perspective you're seeing here is from on top of the hillside on Bayview Place. Uh, diagonally across the street from us, you can see the Department of Education Garage, otherwise known as the Jersey Street Garage, which is up for RFP right now for rezoning. Next slide, please. See the location of the property here within the proximity to downtown, or I should say the St. George area of Staten Island. Next slide, please. This is the site. It is not the building marked collision in view two, but rather the hillside to the right. The next few slides is going to give you some imagery of the site. As you can see from view one, Vic, or even from view four here, the site, you can go forward. That's okay. Next slide. The site is a hillside, and view six shows you busy Victory Boulevard. Next slide, please. Again, slide eight shows you the perspective from the top of the hillside be that's behind us. It will not be interfering or rising above the hillside, but actually will rest below it. So those homes you see on the right and on the left in view nine will not be impacted by it. View seven shows the site on the left. 
Next slide, please. Here you get some more imagery so you can understand the nature of the area. Next slide. And next slide. This is the proposed rezoning boundaries. You can see on the left side, the site is located within an R32 district. The right side shows the proposal in an R6B with a C13 overlay extending 75 feet off of Victory Boulevard to match the existing C13 overlay that exists on both sides of Victory Boulevard around the site. Next slide. This slide shows you in detail the lots that are effective. You can see our plot or the subject map. Mr. Plotnick, yeah. Mr. Plotnick, the time has expired. And so I will now turn and see if there are any questions from the commission. Commissioner Cerullo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Eric, uh, just a, a couple questions. First, I, I want to acknowledge the design of this and the attempt to minimize the impact on the hillsides. Um, I don't want that not to be said. I have a couple of questions though if um just about the project itself um one has to do with the daycare which obviously is a really important use and the fact that the the project is designed specifically f with the daycare use um as an intended uh operation is there already a provider that you've selected, the idea that you're designing it for daycare, do you have someone coming in there already or is there a relationship already between the developer and the project or or just whatever you can tell me about that? Eric, you're muted. Oh, well that time, oh, I'm not hey. muted here. No, I was, I was, I was muted. So- Oh, I'm sorry, okay, I thought you said Fred. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I was muted, uh, Commissioner. So to answer your question, we have been working closely with Councilwoman Debbie Rose for the past few years. Councilwoman Debbie Rose was the initiative and the, the brainstorm behind a, a daycare center there. So the idea came well supported within the community. Uh, she has been working with us to introduce us to various daycare providers, and we've been speaking with daycare providers as well. The idea would be to get a daycare in there to include universal pre-K. We have spoken to some operators. We could provide a letter of intent. It's become a chicken and an egg discussion because they're all asking for the approval before they commit to a lease. Uh, but we've spoken to three or four different providers, all of whom are extremely interested in the property. And uh, as I said before, the councilwoman is also extremely interested uh, and we've been working with her to try to find a tenant. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, obviously, th it's, this is easy if a provider is identified. What thought is there about potential use if a provider is not identified? Uh, well, is not that much space is, is being committed to the daycare. Uh, it's approximately uh, 7,500 square feet of community facility space that it could be utilized. Uh -huh. Utilized in any way, shape, or form, maybe some medical office or any allowable community facility use. But I, I should let you know that we built this project around the daycare. Uh, and we have every intention of committing to and maintaining uh, that commitment. Uh, we have found an intense amount of interest. Uh, we'd be happy to provide the commission with some letters of intent if, if that was necessary to show you what we're seeing. Uh, but we do feel we will provide a daycare provider. In space. Thank you, Eric. That would actually be helpful. I was gonna ask if you could please keep us uh, up to date on, on those discussions and efforts. So thank we you. Madam Chair, I have another question, if that's okay. Eric, I, I want to, um, I guess, two, what I hope are, are relatively quick questions. On the affordable housing units, um, how, how will the residents be selected? Is it by lottery? Um, and is there a goal attempt or even a possibility that there is a borough preference involved in in selecting people who might be in the community to be able to remain in the community I, I we would be uh, complying with the hpd requirements that's not up to the applicant to make the decision uh right. i don't believe there is a borough priority uh I, I will say this that we are providing 12 uh units of affordability and it will, all will be at option one 
uh, the deepest level of affordability. So, but I cannot do who will be uh, who will be given the preference. Okay, so then, it, okay, I'll uh, I think we'll get some more information from HPD on that. It would be helpful to know. We'll and, do that at the post hearing follow up. Great, terrific. Thank you, Madam Chair. And and the last item is it really about the garage and the operation of the garage? Yeah. And I know we discuss, uh, you know, uh, the commission discussed this uh, at the staff level when we have seen this uh, previously at certification. Um, it, I know that there, the building is designed to have two entrances to the garage, and I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that there are a little less than half of the unit, about 24 of the spaces will be used or, or designed with stackers to be used exclusively exclusively for the residents. Um, and then the remaining spaces to be used for residents or anyone who would access the building, I'm assuming that means guests or uh, particularly people who might be accessing the daycare center or any of the other potential community facility use or uses that come into the building. So I just want to understand if, particularly on the, the ones assigned to the residents, or is it a unit-based assignment? How, how do people get their assignment of their spot, if at all? I, I guess my concern also is that if people are pulling into the garage thinking there might be a space, but there is no space, how is how do they uh, manage through getting back out it, it's so, difficult yeah. to see on the on the planning documents of of how that occurs um and also is is there an operator of the garage when you have stackers i can't assume you're permitting the residents to access the stackers themselves so how, how is that how is that going to work i'd be happy to answer the question for you and if, uh, if the operator of the slides can go to page 21 that could show some of the spaces that we're speaking about and that you were just referencing i don't know if they could click to sheet 21 of the presentation uh while that's going on and they're going to sheet 21 there is a left and a right side the property is built into a hillside with an angle as you move from left to right on this plan sheet the property slopes down towards new york harbor yep. So yep. what you're experiencing in the parking entrance that's on the left is at a higher grade than the one that's on the right that you called out. So to alleviate the concerns that you mentioned, we've divided the, the parking spaces to assigned parking spaces for the residential that will be controlled by the operator. The operator will assign those. There'll be a management company that'll be controlling those, the movement of the cars in there. So there'll be no misunderstanding from a resident. Uh, visitors will be coming in. There'll be clear signs for the other one. Uh, but staying on this lot, on this screen, the dropping, the real reason we did this was to accommodate drop off for daycare. So we're assigning mm -hmm. upper level exclusively for daycare because we know that daycare has its own level of traffic. And even though there is no parking and drop off required for daycare, it would be impracticable to put one on Victory Boulevard and not have anywhere for people to pull in. So what we're doing is by mixing the assigned spaces for the residents who will have a habitual feeling for the property and know how to use it, as well as uh, with the daycare, we feel that that will give an opportunity for a very systematic in and out of the property. Uh, we are also over parking. We're not required anywhere near the number of these parking spaces. We're providing them because, of course, it's Staten Island and there's a strong demand for parking on the island, as well as there's a, a strong reliance on vehicles. So because of that, that's why we're providing so many spaces. Uh, the right side, which is the daycare side, the side that's showing us daycare here, which if we go back one slide, I think we'll have it. I won't show it there on that slide, but the right side, uh, that parking entrance is going to be assigned and utilized exclusively by guests and visitors to the property. So that's the idea behind it. Okay, and and so the, I know the uh, front of the building has two separate entrances, one to the residential portion of the building and one to the, we'll call it the daycare uh, entrance, but from inside in the garage where there's shared space potentially between residents and the users of the daycare, is there an internal garage entrance into the building? Is it shared or is it separate or do people have to come out of the garage and then go around the front 
I'm thinking of security reasons of people, the public, um, or people just being able to pull in without any uh, indication that they couldn't or without suspicion, but then accessing the residential portion of the building from an internal garage entrance. Of course. Alex Harrow, our project architect, is on the line, I see. Alex, would you like to go through that configuration so you could explain how you've designed it to be separate? Um, yeah, I'd be happy. That, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is not a team presentation. We would be glad to have you sign up to testify. And then you can take your order, and Commissioner Cerullo, you could make sure. your comments at that point. Any other questions for Mr. Polotnik? I signed up. We, Madam Chair, there oh. is some confusion. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I mean, I'm on screen here. I did sign up this morning. Oh. Oh, okay. I'm. I am sorry. I didn't catch the name. And what we will do at this point is thank Mr. Polotnik and move on to Alexander Harrow. Great. Can Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Please okay. go ahead. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, what I'd like to do is just pretty much take it from where Eric left off. So if we can go back to the um, back to the presentation, uh, I'll try and be brief. I want to hit a few key points. One is what he mentioned. If you can go to slide number 15, just go back a couple real quick. Um, number 15, it shows sort of an axonometric diagram of the building. Two, two more. There you go. You, you see the elevation at the bottom of the site, 134. 202 is the upper portion of the site, which is the corner of Rosewood and Bayview. Just uh, illustrating the point that our building will be below the window level of the, the houses up above. Um, yes. So just to move on to the, to the questions that I think you're really asking for parking, as you can see, the site is extremely steep, which is why we have the two parking entrances for two, two different levels, two different curb cuts. It's permitted to do this. So the upper level will be at the same level. You can go now to the, um, you can go to, to slide number two, uh, 17 up to, that'll show you a picture of the entrance. There we go. That shows you the parking entrance on the right-hand side, as well as right next to it. You see where it says residential, commercial, and then daycare to the left. So that's the entrance off the street. Um, but if you then go to the uh, next slide, um, two more. Slide number 19, it'll show you the daycare illustrated in blue. On the left-hand part, you'll see the parking in gray. That shows towards the back, you see some blue dots there, and one at the very bottom portion which will show a separate entry into the daycare from the parking area. That would be um, a secure entrance, probably with a buzzer and a camera that they could let people who have gone into the parking area to, um, to allow daycare into directly from there. But as well, what they can also do is then go back out to the front. We have a, a sidewalk within. Um, you can see the, the other blue dot that goes up and back towards the front, and then they can go in from the street side. Uh, in a covered area so they would be protected from the weather. Um, outside of that, we have the same same deal for uh, commercial. They enter also from the uh, covered front entryway. Um, we have, if you continue going on the slides uh, to number 24, we have a few illustrations of uh, typical apartments, one and two bedroom. Uh, the majority of the apartments in this building are gonna be one bedroom. We have a few twos as well. Um, that was slide 24. And then if you go to slide number 25, it shows uh, an aerial view, just a rendering showing the roof. There we go, great, thank you. Uh, that shows the roof where we intend on having a green roof as well as a solar, <coughs> a solar portion. The green roof, the intent is to have some larger, uh, larger plantings around the perimeter to help sort of blend the building as it steps back. You can see the building steps back and you can see the different levels in this illustration showing the green there and how it will help blend with the site. Thank you, Mr. Harrow. Thank you for walking us through these plans. And Commissioner Cirillo, you yeah, wanted to continue that, your question. Yeah, yeah, just as a follow-up and, and thank you for, the, uh, for walking us through those. It, some of the renderings that you have in your presentation are more detailed and, and somewhat different. Um, than the ones we had seen previously. So I appreciate those. Um, so let, let me just get some clarification, just this really for clarification now and, and not to belabor this point, but 
I know you referenced the day entrance to the daycare center from the garage. It, it is there also it is there one entrance and it's only to the daycare center? Yes. Or how do the residents that are using that same side, perhaps, of the parking garage get into the residential portion of that? So I'm just trying to okay. understand the access to the daycare, the commercial, you know, the commercial and the residential. If it's all through the front door, I get it. But if there's an internal garage entrance, I'm just trying to get an idea of what the concerns could be if you have the public accessing what could what should really be exclusively for the residents no, so never mind somebody getting into a daycare center no no a valid question these are, it's a good question um if i can just go back if you look at slide number 19 again you can see the blue dot and the small yeah. arrow at the, the, the lower portion that shows you where the entrance into the daycare would be um if yeah. you then go to slide number 20 uh, 21. There you go. You see the green dot in the lobby. I'm sorry, the green dot on the left hand side. So the green dot shows actually there would be there could be a door on the left hand side right there for residential, but we're not anticipating any residential entry from within the parking, they would have to take what we're showing with that green line. Um, that's the path that shows the entry in to the um, back to the covered walkway, and then you'd walk into the residential lobby from there. I understand, okay. So the All only right. entrance into the building from within the parking structure is for um, daycare. At for the time. daycare purposes. Correct. Okay, uh, th thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Other questions from Mr. Harrell? Vice Chair Knuckles. Uh, thank you. Um, I agree. I, uh, I think with uh, Commissioner Cerullo made this point earlier. I think this is a, um, an elegant uh, solution uh, in terms of a hillside, uh, hillside design and how it blends uh, with the incline of, of the street. I'm just wondering what materials uh, do you plan to use uh, on the facade of the building? Um. Yeah, great. If you if um, if you look at the renderings, um, slide number sixteen and seventeen actually show it fairly well. We're we're going to use. We don't want to we don't want to be too different from everything else in the area, uh, also Staten Island, and something for this kind of a lower building. So we're proposing primarily brick for the lower portions of the building. Um, maybe some different colors, just to break up the facade a little bit, so it appears a little less monolithic. I know it's a long property and it's a long building. Um, but we're, as you can see in this rendering that you have up there, we're looking at using primarily brick um, with the one color that you're seeing there. And then if you go back one slide to number 16, you'll see on the left hand side a different color uh, where the lower parking area is. That, that would be a different color of brick is what we're anticipating. And then the upper portions, um, we are thinking at the moment stucco probably for those. They would start, they, they start to fade backwards uh, as we progress up and back on the site. And so they would appear less monolithic. It's actually a strategy that we use often with uh, landmark projects as well. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes, just I'm glad we're looking at this, that largest site that just went away. But I, I, you, you're familiar with it, and I am too. I, I, I know I, I received some... Um, information about this, but I just want to confirm having, having you on this, uh, on the call, on the call, I'm calling it a call because we don't see you, but on, right. on, at the meeting right now, that the visual gives the perception that there's a, almost, a, a, I want to call it a neck down, but a, a carve in on victory that looks like you would be able, like almost a, a where a drop-off area might be created. I understand that that's just um, a perception based on the, the drawing and that the curb line is consistent and does not carve in as it seems. Can you confirm that or clarify what we're seeing there? There is no there, there. That's a straight line. It's just the. It's all we're looking at is the slope of the uh, street. So there is no. 
there is no inset or curve or drop off area on the street. That's something that oh. you have to be with DOT. So no, okay, we're, we're not proposing I, that. All we have is two curb cuts to end for driveways. With a with a with a consistent curb line. Correct. Straight correct. curb line. Okay. Yes, correct. Great, because the the rendering, if, if if you don't, if you look at the rendering, they're sort of in the middle where the entrance to the building <laughs> sections would be. Yeah, I see um, what you're, see the people. What yeah, you're it looking looks like at. It, yes. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I think what you're looking at there is it appears that it's at an angle there. Is that correct? That's correct. It yeah, almost you know, looks like what you would, yeah. It, it's just a, um, it's just a matter of the rendering. It's actually the hill, the way the hill goes up and then continues. It's a faceted uh, vertical line. That's all it is. Understood. And I appreciate the, uh, the clarification. Yeah, good, good point. Thank you. Other questions? Um, then thank you, Mr. Harrow. And it does not appear that we have other speakers. I'll just check with Ryan. Okay, then this public hearing is closed. Okay, our next item, commissioners, Borough of Staten Island, calendar numbers 47, 48, and 49. CD1, calendar number 47. C210289 ZMR, calendar number 48. N two one zero two nine zero Z R R calendar number forty nine N two one zero two nine one Z S R a public hearing in a matter of applications for zoning map zoning text amendments and a special permit concerning the River North Liberty Towers project. An additional note: a public hearing is being held by the City Planning Commission in conjunction with the above Euler hearings to receive comments related to a draft environmental impact statement. This hearing is being held pursuant to the State Environmental Quality Review Act and a City Environmental Quality Review. Thank you. We will have a 10-minute team presentation by an applicant team comprised of Ben Abelman, Paul Selber, and Max Stember young uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm Dan Kaplan. I was told that I was also part of the applicant team and signed up from FX Collaborative Architects. Fine. Um, at the, we'll have you, at we'll the, have you entrance, sign in. Uh, and Ben, ben will join me. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, and good afternoon, uh, Chair and Commissioners. It's, it's very nice to see everybody in 3D. <laughs> I'm Dan Kaplan, Senior Partner at FX Collaborative Architects. With me, as we heard, is Ben Abelman and Paul Selver, Land Use Counsel at, at, at Kramer 11. We are very pleased to present our proposal for River North and St. George. Next slide, please. River North occupies a truly unique, one-of-a-kind site that demands an equally bespoke and appropriate response. Currently at the edge of the Hillsides District, which is indicated in green, um, it is surrounded by an illogical extension of the St. George District, which is shown in purple, with its walkable core and great access to transportation and services, the ferry, bus, and, and Staten Island Railroad. Also, the site is immediately adjacent to Castleton Park Apartments, the tallest buildings on Staten Island. While in the Hillside District, the site is compromised. Next slide, please. It is compromised and severed from the rest of Hillsides by Castleton's Park's large parking podium. It is isolated from the rest of Hillsides and has all of its street frontages facing St. George. In addition, the site has seen development over the years, is currently overrun with invasive species and certainly not pristine. Next slide, please. The proposed project will provide much needed housing, including up to 225 inclusionary units. It will enhance and expand public realm with an active ground floor, pedestrian connections, and open space, provide parking as well. And with this critical mass, it will spur economic development, expand services, and provide more amenities for the residents of St. George. Next slide, please. In crafting our site plan, which Ben will go through in a moment, we created a specific and appropriate plan. We drew from the best aspects of Hillsides and St. George and melded them together. From Hillsides, 50% of the space is left open with natural, what we call green fingers or swaths flowing down from the hillside. And from St. George, urban buildings with strong bases, tapering towers perpendicular to the water for upland views, a well-crafted public realm, which you'll hear about, 
with park-like open spaces and well-designed sidewalks. Next, Ben. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'll walk you through our design principles and provide some additional project details. Um, from day one, we have sought to preserve open space and maintain view corridors on the site. Rather than propose a continuous street wall occupying the street frontage, we are proposing three separate buildings strategically sited to preserve portions of the hillside and maintain the desired view corridor. Uh, the result, as Dan mentioned, is a, is a development where 50% of the site is left as open space, comprised of both public and private landscaped areas. Included is a 7,900 square feet public open space at the intersection of Stuyvesant Place and Hamilton Avenue, seen at the left of your screen, which I'll talk uh, more on this in a moment. The remainder of, this, uh, of the open space, which is just under an acre, will be used for residential amenities and passive open space, preserving the natural topography and habitat of the site while absorbing stormwater, reducing heat island effect, and in serving as a visual amenity for the community. These, in addition to the ecological services of these green figures, these also allow for the view corridors through the site. As you can see in the left of the image, Building 1 is set back from Hamilton Avenue, to preserve a view corridor from the uphill community. Between buildings one and two at the center of your screen allows view passage from Castleton Park Apartments towards the harbor. And most importantly, building three is the lowest of the proposed buildings at 11 stories, intended to ensure that the, uh, the majority of the Castleton Park Apartments have views towards Lower Manhattan in, in the harbor. Next, please. Circling back to the open space, seen here is a rendering of that space located on Hamilton Avenue in Stuyvesant Place. Um, the open space will be publicly accessible um, from dawn to 8 p.m. and is designed as a flexible urban plaza with seating, planting, and lighting. Next slide, please. The proposed massing complements the context, utilizing a low base with upper building portions stepping back and uh, set, set back and stepping down to meet the adjacent context. The low cornice line of the bases is consistent with the civic scale of architecture on Richmond Terrace, and that scale will, um, uh, that architectural materiality will act as a, a screening element, which will screen the above grade parking located in buildings one and three. Above the base, the massing sets back with the narrow portions of the tallest buildings um, closest to the edge, minimizing their presence on the street frontage. Next, please. Seen here is a next, please. Seen here is a, a conceptual rendering, a view looking towards Stuyvesant from Richmond Terrace. This shows um, the active uh, ground floors with the green fingers passing through. Most importantly, at the left of the image, you can see the architectural treatment concealing the parking. Next, please. On the ground floor, we are proposing active ground floor uses with minimal space used for parking access. The three neighborhood retail spaces range in size from just under 10,000 square feet down to 1,700 square feet and will really provide an active uh, corridor connecting uh, St. George to the North Shore and also extending Stuyvesant, uh, the vital retail uh, corridor of Stuyvesant Place down to Richmond Terrace. Uh, the three uh, parking entrances um, th there are three parking lots in the, in, on the site uh, with three entrances. The upper, um, in, in building one at the left of the screen, there are two parking lot entrances. The furthest on the left off of Hamilton enters onto the second story with the uh, second closer to the intersection of Stuyvesant and Hamilton um, entering uh, to the cellar parking. These parking lot, uh, entrances are separated by landscape and active ground floor uses from the public open space. Next, please. Finally, here is a, a, an illustrative rendering of the River North development as seen from the Staten Island Ferry departing the St. George Ferry Terminal, showing how the development uh, complements the St. George skyline. The proposed development provides a dynamic foreground to the Castleton Park apartments with step massing, preserved hillsides, um, and will mark the northern end of St. George, acting as a beacon to the vibrant mixed-use neighborhood. With that, I'll pass it on to Paul to speak about land use action. Uh, thank you, Ben, Madam Chair, members of the Commission, Paul Silver, Kramer Love, and Land Use Council to the applicant, and especially delighted to be here to talk to you in real life. Uh, next slide, please. And actually, next slide also. So the proposed River North project requires three zoning actions that are described in greater detail on the slide in front of you, a zoning map amendment, amendments to the text of the Special St. George District, 
and a special permit pursuant to the proposed text. Both the River North project and the zoning package proposed implemented are based on sound planning principles, and they will harness time-tested tools to achieve quality development for Staten Island's North Shore. They're also wholly appropriate because they will facilitate the transformation of a blighted and underutilized site for many years with a development that delivers needed benefits to Staten Islanders, benefits that would not be part of an as-of-right development program. The unique location and character of this site ensures that it cannot and will not be a precedent for the rezoning of any other site on Staten Island. The remapping of the site out of the Special Hill Sites District responds to an existing degraded condition of the site's natural topography and its isolation from the remainder of the Hill Sites District. Mapping the site into the Special St. George District reflects St. George's evolution into an urban center over the past two generations and the city's plans for the waterfront across Richmond Terrace. Mapping the site into an R73 zone provides the additional FAR that can be used to address area needs. In particular, the infusion of approximately 225 units of affordable housing will improve opportunities in a community that is significantly rent burdened. The additional public open space will expand the outdoor resources available to those who work and live in the neighborhood. And the additional density has important secondary impacts because it provides a critical mass of population to support a wider range of retail and cultural offering, and it advances the city's signature land use policies of promoting higher density in transit-rich areas and affordable housing, particularly in these areas. Finally, the proposal was consistent with the Special St. George District's goals and controls. It would be contribute to a walkable 24-7 community through enhanced pedestrian-oriented streetscape. Its building envelopes are consistent with special, the Special District's allowance for height, uh, and it provides all the parking required for an R73 development with easy access to unused spaces across the street if parking demand is higher than expected. The special permit waivers allow envelope controls to be tailored so as to provide a site plan and building forms most appropriate to this unique site. More specifically, the height and setback waivers allow public open space where it's most useful, facilitate preservation of open space and hillside areas as visual amenities through reduced lot coverage, minimize impacts on views from, uh, from the uh, castles and apartments, and we'll give the project a varied skyline and more textured and distinctive design. And we're ready to answer your questions. Perfect timing. Thank you. Questions from the commission? Commissioner Dweck. Thank you. Uh, just a question on, on the, to clarify the affordable. You, you noted that there were 225 units, and you uh, showed us 30%. Does that, that include 25% in the MIH and 5% and in the Affordable New York program? I think they're all MIH units. I believe they're all MIH, Commissioner. Because there's a, there, uh, there's a, there's a, it's, uh, there's a 30% option, I think, in, in, yes. the, in MIH. So that's the option that you're... Yes. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Cirillo. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. And I just want to uh, thank the team for their, their presentation. So, you know, this is really interesting um, because when you when you describe and, and, and look at the project, you know, it's, it's quite attractive. Um, I think the unfortunate issue in the sort of public review process has been, and the focus of the discussion, which I'd like to understand more from you about is, and, and I think to the credit of the community and the elected officials at this point who have weighed in on it, um, have, have not criticized at all the idea of bringing more residents into the community or bringing affordable housing into the community or that the public space is not nice enough or uh, isn't desirable um, or that there is too much or not enough retail or parking um, or how the project relates to the streetscape um, and the pedestrian experience, or in fact, even the location. It's all about its size and why this project needs to be so big and introducing this new R7 into the community, um, why that's necessary to accomplish 
all of the very excellent goals that this project attempts to accomplish for the North Shore of Staten Island. So I guess the the starting point of of the discussion, and, and I'm asking you to help me understand why this has to be the size you have presented it as versus basically the same project in in a, within a you know within the R6 or some more closer to an as of right opportunity um, to help invigorate because there'll be no question that this would help to reinvigorate the North Shore which we all want on Staten Island so I I, I leave you with that and would love to hear your take on that okay I think I, I'll take the liberty of starting off and uh, uh, my colleagues uh, uh, from uh, FXL uh, uh, FXL collaborative uh, uh, can speak uh, speak if they feel af afterwards. So the, 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 the premise, the, the premise here, and it's true, if this were R6, it wouldn't be the same project. And it wouldn't have the elements, many of the elements that make this project attractive from the public standpoint. The second thing, second premise of, I think your question is whether somehow the the second, the second point that I want to make is that there is no magic maximum density for anywhere in New York City. The question of whether uh, a density is appropriate on a given site depends upon what the benefits uh, that are conferred by that density are and what the impacts of that density are on the community uh, in which it's located. So here we have a, a development that Yes, it adds more people than would be added by an R6 development. But th those people are being added at a location where they are better served by, by mass transit than, than any other location on the island. They're a 10-minute walk from the ferry terminal, which is the heart of, of mass transit in Staten Island. And therefore, the, the, the area is better capable of supporting them and the activity that they create, and they are better capable of supporting the retail, uh, the, the retail uses both in St. George and, and in this project, and the cultural activities on Staten Island, uh, which are which is good for everyone on Staten Island. Secondly, uh, the R6 development would not have affordable housing. Uh, that comes from uh, the substantial increase in density, which is part of the MIH program. Third, it would not have the public open space. Public open space is, again, part of the additional density that comes with this program. And uh, the project itself um, would, you know, would be one that did not take full advantage of the site. And it, the site is, is unique in the sense that it's one of the largest uh, vacant sites in, in the sort of upland area of Staten Island that is in close proximity to St. George. Um, the development fits with its surrounding. Uh, it's consistent uh, with Castleton Park in terms of its overall height. Uh, it's consistent in terms of its use with the outlet and the wheel that, are, that have been proposed in the stadium that are across the street. Uh, it can be accepted uh, within within the uh, air, within the environment without uh, without any uh, ill effect. And uh, finally, uh, it is a response to this being a difficult site, uh, a site that, under the current zoning, hasn't been developed for as long as the current zoning has been there, actually, which which goes back many many years. So. Bringing this site to the point where uh, it's reasonable to for a developer to come and make the investment uh, that it needs to uh, put an, uh, a really first-class project here is something that is also a part of the additional density. Did that answer your question, or would you also want well, to hear it, from? It, I mean, it, it does. It answers my yes. It definitely answers my question. Uh, although I will say this. Paul and, and 
I mean, I have a, the utmost respect for you, and I um, enjoyed reading Ukraine's op-ed on the hotels, but we'll wait for another half you're, hour you're, you're to more deal with that, that issue. But, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I will say this, it, and I, there's no question that your response defined what the R6 would require versus what this project provides. I accept that. But there is always the opportunity to provide the things that you say would be left out. I'm saying not required. Does it mean a project couldn't be designed to incorporate things? We see those things on small scale here all the time, as you well know. This is you, you, the benefits you talk about to the community are real, but the community has rejected the project. And nearly every elected official, certainly everyone who has made a public, taken a public position on the project, has rejected the project. So the benefits to the community are obviously benefits that those who live in the community and who are representing the community don't believe outweigh what the project means to the community. So that's a issue. And my question, which is sort of was sort of big picture, and you you gave me the zoning answers to why the project is different, and I get that. But that whether or not there was any consideration to creating for all a project that would provide as much of the benefits you want to provide or your, your, your client wants to provide, but in a, in a size that makes sense for Staten Island. I mean, we hear that this is an issue in every community as we know. So that's really the issue. This is probably more of a debate than a, than a Q and a, um, and so, but but I think it's very important that the record in, at this part of the land use process, the public hearing, reflects a what the community feels about it. Again, not because they don't want a building or three buildings, not because they don't want retail or they want more public space or not enough. It, the community, there were no issues about what the project provides. It was the enormity of the project that has taken the debate and got us to today. So that, that can't be ignored. And um, I just, again, that's not so much a question than it is a statement. Uh, you're certainly, you know that already. <laughs> you're, you're following the, the news of the community that you're in. Um, but I just think that that's important to, to note. If, if, if I may, Madam Chair, I'd just like to speak that briefly. Uh, you know, one of the principal issues, and this is something that, that we hear a lot, the commission is going to hear a lot uh, in the next couple of weeks, it, when you have a project like this, which is uh, doing something that really is, it hasn't been done before uh, in terms of uh, density, um, is the issue of precedent. And I think one of the, one of the themes you know, has, has, has been, and, and probably the, the, the loudest from the one from the way we're hearing it is that this is going to result in the, the you know, overzoning of Staten Island. Um, and I think that that, it, 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 it's a mistake to think that way. It's a mistake to think that way because the, everybody in this room and at the agency that the chair heads knows that zoning decisions are made on a case-by-case -case basis. They're made on the facts of that case. And this site is so extraordinarily unique and is in such, an, such a special position that we believe that we believe it not just because we're representing the <clears throat> developer, but we believe it because we've considered the, the other options, the other, the other uh, possibilities that there will not be another site like this that will merit this kind of zoning. And even if there is someday down the road, this commission will have an opportunity to look at that 
and make the decision based on the merits of that particular site. So that's, that's one part of it. And I think the biggest part, frankly. Um, there's also an issue of, of building height. Well, uh, uh, the as of right development uh, would result in some buildings that are very, very close to the height of uh, uh, some of the buildings here. It would result in three buildings. Uh, and I think at least one of them comes within four feet in height of the building here. And, and so when you think about what the difference is between this and the, this and a, an R6 density development, it really is, is two things, excluding the, the president issue for a sec. One is, are the buildings going to be that much bigger? Yeah, they're going to be a little bigger than the R6, but they're going to be, the, the way they've been designed here is in a way to minim, really minimize their impact both on the neighborhood and on, uh, on the street. And number two is the density. Are these people going to create a problem for uh, the community in which they're moving? And uh, we believe that based on the review that's been conducted from both a planning and environmental perspective, that they will not, and on a, they, they, that any impact they have will be within the range of acceptable. So. Additional questions, Commissioner? Um, I, I can go around if anybody else has questions. I have, I won't take Thanks the time. I think the floor is yours. Okay. So um, let, me, let me ask a couple of sort of questions on, um, on, on the application specifically. Mm -hmm. um, discuss what your thoughts are on the retail space. I, obviously, I, I, I can say, um, was pleased to see that there wasn't a great deal of retail here, given the fact that it's across the, the project is <laughs> across the street from the Empire Outlets. Um, but given the size of the space, which you described earlier, uh, what 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 are you thinking? What what do you what do you see as the appropriate sort of retail for the development? I guess there, I guess there, there are two things. Um, first of all, neighborhood. But speak the, the outlets are the outlets. That's going to deal with the sort of the bigger, wider, uh, uh, wider range of uh, uh, of commercial draw. But these are these are these are places places that are going to be for the people who live here and work here. Mm -hmm. And you know they could be a supermarket. They could be twenty uh, four hour urgent care. They could be. Uh, uh, maybe a community facility uh, could take one of the spaces if there was a community facility that that uh, the neighborhood felt particularly strongly about that could be integrated into the project. It's it's a little early to t to say exactly what would go there, but that's the the range and the kind of thinking that's going on at this point. Okay, thank you. And and on the commercial the commercial space, which is I guess a, a little under nineteen thousand, if I have the number correctly. And it, but that includes the seller space. So what what is the thought process on commercial and and sort of the seller space, and how does that? Um, do you want to be happy to answer? Yeah. Um, any seller space would simply be used for um, storage or yeah. Back, okay. Yeah. Back of house of retail. But that inclu that's included in the eighteen uh, almost nineteen thousand square feet. Correct. Okay. Um, the parking operations is that. Um, will you have an operator operating the parking garages, or is it all self-service? How, how does it work? And it's, 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 um, it, it is attended parking. It's a very complicated site with the existing topography and our desire not to impact, um, to, to leave the site as, uh, as much open space as possible. So we are left with an um, attended parking lot uh, situation with stackers. And and the 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 percentage of is there exclusive, the exclusive residential, or is it just all public parking where residents could then get a monthly the, opportunity? The, the parking will be provided at the required quantity for the, for the, the residential, for the and then there will be um, the required amount of retail parking, and we are car have carved out some additional space um, for some potential additional capacity in those lots, which could serve the public. More transient park, park sure. opportunities. Okay. Um, we, we, let me let me yeah. just add one thing. Under the multiple dwelling law and the zoning resolution, 
where you have uh, where you have a garage, an accessory garage, which this is, while it is predominantly, for, you know, pr- pr- primarily for the benefit of the, of the resident, if a resident wants a space, this is what the multiple dwelling law and the zoning resolution say, they have to be given. It has to be given to them on 30 days' notice. So even if there were spaces that were used by the public here, if any resident wanted to park, it's theirs. Thank, thank you, thank you for that, Paul. Um, the the public open the open space. Uh, how is that envisioned to be sort of managed and operated? Would it be through the building? What what is the plan for that? So, so it's it's publicly accessible from eight to eight. <laughs> Eight to eight, so it and it's 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 uh, uh, you know privately owned public space, and it will be uh, maintained and and managed by by the building developer. By the developer, yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, and and I guess the last but not at all least question is, you know, in looking at the the EIS in, in terms of. Um, I mean, this is really important to discuss the on the transportation side, particularly, right? The uh, and the sort of significant adverse impacts that the project will have on on traffic and congestion, um, particularly along Richmond Terrace and uh, Victory and Bay, um, Jersey Street. I mean, significant corner corners of of the area. Um, what sort of, what, what are the plans or ideas or solutions to, to dealing with, with those? Um, and I, and I'll throw this out there so it's not another question, but it's all related. What kind of conversations have there been perhaps with the NYPD with respect and, and the local hospitals with respect to particularly the 120, which is right there, um, with respect to potential response time issues, given the impacts that there could be or are projected to be in the EIS on on traffic and congestion in this area, I'm going to ask Max Denver Young, who is uh, was really in tra- really uh, led the charge on the environmental side of this, uh, to speak to that issue. Sure. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, we've heard a lot about uh, the transportation concerns in this area of Staten Island. Um, the, what you're specifically asking about in terms of response times and, and enforcement of uh, parking along Richmond Terrace and other areas of the neighborhood, both those are beyond the scope of uh, the secret technical manual, so they're not actually studied in the environmental impact statement. Okay, so I'll say that legally I have to accept that, but it's that's a really unfortunate reality, and and it's so obvious, particularly since the precinct is next door, that even if it wasn't required, that it wasn't at least discussed. I mean, I would it, had had I had I known that, I would have wanted to have the PD present to testify on what their thoughts would be, since it wasn't part of the EIS, but. Um, so that's obviously a concern that would would remain. So, um, Commissioner Cerullo, we, we we note the concern, and we will uh, speak with our colleagues about it uh, after you. the meeting and uh, see how what we can do to address it. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. And then any future submissions we can discuss at post hearing. Yes, please. Session. Yep. We, I'll just note we are continuing to look at mitigations in coordination with the uh, Department of Transportation. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? Okay, seeing none, um, I will thank the applicant team and uh, will note that we are honored by the presence of our next speaker, Borough President James Otto, and in keeping with our practice, there is no time limit on his testimony. He will be appearing remotely. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank Thank you, you. Commissioner. Thank Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Welcome. <laughs> so, Madam Chair, if I might, I, I'd like to start by commending the endurance of you and the commissioners. I know you have a busy agenda and a lot of ground to have covered. Uh, 
I'm in awe of uh, how you endure, endure it all. I will try to not worsen that by uh, droning on and on. I also want to thank you for allowing me to testify remotely. I'm not sure if the commissioners and you, Madam Chair, can see this, but I think the folks at home can. Given my rocky relationship with some parts of city planning, I was prepared to don this heavy duty Rydell football helmet. But thankfully, because you're allowing me to sp uh, speak remotely, uh, I won't risk having my own uh, Mike Dukakis moment. Uh, I, I want to, at the outset also, before I get rolling and perhaps forget, I want to thank the land use chair and the land use committee and uh, the full board at Community Board One, because in their hearings, they use their, as St. George residents, as North Shore residents, as Staten Islanders, they use their lived experience to state their opposition to this project rationally, calmly, I think effectively, including refuting uh, one of the notions that we just heard that somehow St. George is a transit rich neighborhood. Uh, St. George residents and other Staten Islanders scoff at that notion and, and rightly so. If I can, I want to try to take today, at least initially, uh, if you will, a, a 20,000 foot perspective. So you take two steep slope sites in the special hillside preservation district. You add a portion of an adjoining zoning lot that already supports an existing public housing development. You remove the special district designation from those sites, add them to a different special district that the properties were specifically excluded from when mapped. Add the quality housing program to allow floor area exemptions. Then upzone the site to an unprecedented R7 that has never been supported by this commission in Staten Island. Add that zone to the new special district, which is currently not permitted. Then add unprecedented new requirements for the R7 zoning in the special district. Along with the 247% increase in floor area, change the commercial, overl commercial overlay designation for the sites, as well as the other adjoining sites, increase the depth of the commercial lot area and reduce the required parking for the commercial floor area. Finally, add an MIH designation to build affordable housing. Then request special permits to not comply with the new R7 zoning, the mandatory improvements in the new R7 zone or the permitted building heights in an MH, a MIH area. Finally, request street wall waivers and street setback encroachments and an okay to build into the required rear yard. Lastly, if anyone asks you to simply comply with the underlying zoning, reduce the density, the height, the floor area, building coverage, or explain why the proposal may not have enough on street parking, just say it will not work any other way. I want to drill down a bit on some numbers. I mentioned already the 247% increase in the floor area from a 2.43 FIR of R6 to a 6.0 uh, in an R7-3, but, but it doesn't end there. The maximum height increases from 70 feet in an R6 to 185 feet in an R73. That is a 246% increase in heights deemed appropriate by this commission and does not include the added special permit height, which is an additional 50.50% increase over the proposed R73 district to 26 and 25 stories. There's a reduction in the required residential parking from R6, which would have been 500 and 25 cars to R7, which is 296 cars. And it represents a 56.38 reduction in resident or visitor parking. The applicant will tell you they comply. They comply with the new zone, not the existing zoning or the expected neighborhood standard of care. Reduction in the re required retail parking of R from R6, one in 300 square feet to R7, one in 1000 square feet represents a 333% reduction in the required customer parking. 
That's how they comply with the R7. And of course, increase the depth of the existing commercial overlay from an R6, which is 100%, uh, 100 feet depth to an R7, which is 185, represents an 85% increase in commercially zoned lot areas on the site that will not be preserved under the hillside preservation district regulations. If I may refute or attempt to refute two comments I heard that I think need to be addressed. It stretches uh, suspending disbelief to make the argument that this is, isn't precedent set. Precedent set. This proposal is precedent set, not merely in terms of its height, but also in the manner in which it ignores almost every existing special district control and every underlying zoning rule that has been deemed appropriate by city planning over the past three decades. Lastly, on this point, I heard the term critical mass, that we have to have critical mass and bring more people to Staten Island because from that, all these benefits flow. Well, excuse me for stealing some political lingo that we're all familiar with these days, but critical mass is the big lie of Staten Island. It was uttered in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s as the glass filled and then eventually spilled over. And that if the people come, the tax base is good for everyone and infrastructure will be right behind. In the last decade alone, New York City has spent $500 million on sewers on streets, first time sewers on streets. That's a great thing. It's also four or five decades too late. So this, this big lie of we need critical mass, it is a novel we've read. It has a really awful ending. <laughs> Lastly, uh, your colleague, Fred Cerullo, my appointee, is much more than that to me. He is my friend and he is a mentor. And although we have very different personalities, I watched Fred and I learned from Fred. And when I got to the city council, um, as a member of a super minority, I held my own. And if I dare say, I did a little better than that because I worked to build relationships. I worked to find common ground and I cared about getting things done. That was the most important thing to me. And with less than 170 days left in my career as an elected official, that is more true than ever. I am not here for political expediency. I'm not here out of personal pique. I'm here because I am intimately familiar with the story of residential development on Staten Island. And it's a tragic one. It's one that has no planning. It's one that has no vision. And it's one that certainly did not have infrastructure. And uh, I don't know if it's 30% or 50% or 70% of the problems that have crossed my desk in the last 22 years as a member of the city council and borough president. I don't know what the percentage is, but a large amount of those problems emanate from decisions made decades ago or decisions not made de decades ago. And I will tell you, and those who know me, you know I'm being truthful. I have said in really creative technical language that my mother would not be proud of, how did those leaders then allow it to happen? I do not want history to ask that question of me. Of course I want growth. Of course I want affordable housing. But if I want planning, I want infrastructure. And this project has none of that. It repeats a mistake that we have seen on Staten Island for decades. And so I'm asking you, uh, like this commission has done before, kick it back. My friend Dan Gorodnik had a big project kicked back to him, and they worked on a better iteration of it. That's what I'm asking for. Let's get the growth we want. Let's get the affordable units we want. Let's do it smartly. You, you, you all just heard a presentation on Victory Boulevard. You don't see me opposing it. I think it's smart. Uh, I don't think this is the right thing for Staten Island. That's why I've been so vocal on social media and so passionate about it. I've gone on too long. 
Uh, I thank you, Madam Chair. I thank the commissioners for your endurance. And I hope you uh, do what uh, I heard Mayor de Blasio say in his daily presses uh, uh, a couple months ago. And, and that's believe that the voices of the community matter. Thank you. Thank you so much, Borough President. And I want to assure you that those of us who have the privilege of serving on the commission with Commissioner Cerullo also care about and learn from him. Any Amen. questions? Thank you for taking the time. Thank you. We will continue and our next speaker will be Michael Northmore. And thank you for your patience in sitting through these hours of testimony on other matters, Mr. Northmore. Well, luckily I've enjoyed it. <laughs> um, uh, I'm a resident of the North Shore of Staten Island and I oppose this rezoning and development. <laughs> Uh, we've had one hugely expensive and hugely damaging tobacco on the North Shore in this immediate area already, and I don't think we need another, which I suspect could happen here. But uh, thank you for listening to me, and I yield to the next speaker. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Northmore? Okay, you are off the hook, and our next speaker is Helen Northmore. Madam Chair, Vice Chair Knuckles, Commissioners. In 1987, in response to problems caused by construction that did not account for steep hills on the parts of Staten Island, the New York City Planning Commission, chaired by the recently deceased Sylvia Deutsch, created a special district to, quote, protect, maintain, and enhance the natural features such as the slope of hillsides. The Planning Commission wrote, the more steeply sloped hillsides, which characterize much of the remaining vacant acreage, have become prime development sites. To preserve neighborhood character, height limit controls have been developed. The current height limit of the River North site which is in a R6 of the Special Hillsides Preservation District, is 70 feet. The height of one of just one of River North's three proposed buildings is 290 feet. The North Shore of Staten Island is planning for a housing boom. There are three sites in the Special St. George District for which there are plans to construct high-rise apartment buildings with a total of 420 units. Across the street from the Special St. George District, the Bay Street Corridor promises 1,800 new mixed units. Because it has been designated an economic opportunity zone, St. George is threatened with becoming the next Klondike. These special zones were created by a 2017 law to allow investors to avoid paying income taxes on their profits specifically their capital gains, if they invest in an economic opportunity zone. And the River North project, with its zoning change request, may be the first of many attacks to come on the Special Hillsides Preservation District and the Special St. George District. Although it has no control over neighboring Project Site 2, River North has inexplicably included it in its own zoning request. An 18-story, also out of control, building is purportedly planned for Project Site 2. A limited liability company with the name Economic Development Opportunity Zone Fund 1 LLC is the owner of Project Site 2. The four-plus-year River North Crutch construction site will inflict many unmitigated adverse effects, effects on the approximately 1,800 men, women, and children who live in the five rent-stabilized or Section 8 buildings which immediately surround the project. So, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Northmore, if you have a letter and would want to submit it, the commissioners would welcome seeing that. 
I, I have already submitted oh, great. a 55-page uh, commentary on the draft environmental <laughs> impact statement and a 19-page comment on the three specific zoning proposals. And I have here with me today some additional information. Great. Thank you very much. If you would give it to the secretary, we will then get access to it. And do we have questions for Ms. Northmore? Thank you for taking the time to testify. Our next speaker will be Michael Schwartz. Uh, Chair Lago, I've been advised that Mr. Schwartz is not in the room. Okay. Um, then we will turn to Niles French. Good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you very much for hosting these hearings. Um, the SIEDC, the Staten Island Economic Development Corporation, is, supports the River North Project. As many are well aware, many attempts have been made to help uh, boost the local economy of St. George, whether it's the wheel, the ballpark, new retail or other efforts. Uh, it should be one clear that one of the missing components is lack of local residents living in the area. Every neighborhood in the city that has come back with the new, modern, vibrant local economy that start with new housing, Williamsburg, Greenpoint, Greater Jamaica, use a very similar for formula. New housing followed by public investment and in infrastructure, parks and new jobs. The SIDC fully supports the River North project. We see new private investments, more residents and expected public investment that will follow as the right formula to boost the North Shore economy. Our hope is that the new residents with professionals mixed in with the existing residents will take advantage of the close proximity to the ferry and the building as a benefit of living on Staten Island and, the, and commuting elsewhere. These residents will ultimately be spending dollars in their local stores, restaurants, theaters, and other establishments in the area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. French. Uh, questions? Can we, just, can, can we just clarify your affiliation? Was it e -E -E oh, SIEDC? Okay. Staten That's Island Economic Staten Development Island. Thank Corp. Thank you so much. Y yes, sir. So the SIEDC, despite its name, is a nonprofit and not a government. No, no. Thank you. I heard EDC and I was a little confused. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other questions for, for Mr. French? Thank you. Our next speaker is Nikki. Odilivac, Odilivac, I hope I have the last name correct. Odilivac. Odilivac. Please proceed, Ms. Odilivac. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to testify today. My name is Nikki Odilivac, and I'm president and CEO of Community Agency for Senior Citizens, better known as CASC. Also, I am a resident of St. George neighborhood on Staten Island for almost 40 years, and I've been working in the St. George neighborhood for over 20 years. CAS has been serving older adults, age 60 years and older, as well as their caregivers since the pilot project began in 1974, and in 1985, a fully independent nonprofit. We are a social service agency assisting seniors to remain as independent as possible and thrive in their Staten Island community by providing services, information, assistance, as well as referrals CAS may not provide directly. These include a continuum of services, including case management, entitlement benefits assistance, transportation, elder abuse counseling, vic crime victims assistance, and uh, senior center services. CAS programs assist over 8,000 people annually, and we expect the number to rise with the baby boomers aging in, the, in an unprecedented rate. Some advocates have called it a tsunami of aging older adults. One of the most frequent questions that CAS receives from senior callers and their families is, to, is for affordable housing. Unfortunately, there is not good news on this subject. CAS assists with housing applications for local affordable housing, but wait lists are long years and the available apartments at an affordable rate are few. <clears throat> I'm here to support the River North development. It's a long, it's long time overdue that our beautiful waterfront is developed into an exciting, thriving, welcoming North Shore. We need the housing. We need housing for seniors who can no longer live in private homes. We need housing for seniors who are being asked to leave apartments in two to four families because after 20 or 30 years of living there, the families are now selling these private dwellings or they just can't, or 
they're told they just can get more rent for new, from new tenants. We need more housing for young adults just starting their careers, but not but cannot afford to move out of their parents' home. And we need more housing for young families where it is safe and a place to live and flourish. I've heard and read the cons that some have pointed out. It's too dense, the infrastructure is not there, the support of this development, traffic, sewer schools. This may be true, but does that stop all development? Isn't it up to government to ensure infrastructure is there to support the needs of our community? This community needs an influx of housing. Small businesses will prosper and more will open. We have, far, we have waited far too long to ignore this best resource on Staten Island. Thank you, Ms. Odlovac. Thank you. Uh, questions, questions. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Demetrius Carolina. Dr. Demetrius Carolina. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can, please oh, proceed. Wonderful. Commissioners, good, uh, good afternoon at this juncture. Um, I'm the executive director of the Central Family Life Center full service community organization in Staten Island's North Shore. I'm also pastor of the First Central Baptist Church and also former commissioner of human rights for the city of New York. I am speaking in support of the River North uh, Project because it brings vital partnerships to many nonprofits in the area as well as uh, businesses in the area. We are working in tangent with this phenomenal development uh, organization for a career service program for uh, young people who don't fare well in regular training and learning environments through our Youth Build uh, Impact Program. We will provide them for meaningful employment, training, career development, and on it on infinitum for uh, future development and work. I'm really looking at this project and this proposed development from a social determinants of health and quality of life uh, aspect. Uh, Staten Island's North Shore in particular suffers from a lack of development and also for opportunities for our youth. Uh, under, in this very underdeveloped section of the North Shore, it's struggling to be revitalized. Uh, you've heard it over and over again. This is an opportunity to bring back a very vital community, a walkable community, uh, a community near public transportation, near the ferry, a community that desperately needs an influx of opportunities, investment, economic development, and alike. Um, this could bring affordable housing desperately needed in this particular area, as well as uh, space for much needed public, private, open spaces and retail. Again, I am in support of this from a holistic perspective and particularly in the North Shore of Staten Island. Thank you commissioners for your time and attention. Thank you. Uh, questions for Dr. Carolina? Our next speaker is Marissa Williams. Uh, Ms. Williams, Williams is not in the room, Mr. Vice Chairman. Oh, oh. oh, there she is. We were wrong. My apologies. Hmm. It's only the second time or so, Edwin. <laughs> <laughs> Um, good afternoon, members of the commission. My name is Marissa Williams, and I'm a representative of 32BJ SEIU. I am here today on behalf of my union to express our support for the proposed River North project. 32BJ is the largest property service uh, union, property service, services union in the country, representing 85,000 property service workers in New York City, including janitors, security guards, handy persons, and supers that work in buildings similar to the proposed River North project. 32BJ supports responsible developers who invest in the communities where they build. I am happy to report that the developers affiliated with River North Madison Realty Capital have made a credible commitment to creating prevailing wage building service jobs at this site. This commitment means that workers in Staten Island will have access to family sustaining wages, retirement, and quality health benefits in a time where New Yorkers need them most. 
We estimate that a mixed-use development like the one proposed by the developer will be permanently staffed by an estimated 20 building service workers and will also have approximately 20, 225 affordable housing units in accordance with the mandatory inclusion, inclusionary housing program, building new permanently affordable housing in a centrally located area with access to mass transit is important to our members and their families. For these reasons, we are in full support of this project. We have full confidence that Madison Realty Capital will be a responsible employer and, in, and presence in the community. We respectfully urge you to approve this rezoning. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Questions for Ms. Williams? No questions. Thank you. Elizabeth Morgan. Elizabeth Morgan. Given the large number of speakers on the next item, what I would suggest is that we keep this hearing open in the event that she is able to join and that when that happens that we could interrupt the flow for her testimony. Would that work, Brian? Ms. Morgan, if you can hear us, please, please speak into your microphone. Okay, what we will do is just suspend the public hearing on this matter for now. We'll move on to our next item and when we're able to get Ms. Morgan. Hey, can you hear then... me? Oh, oh you... fantastic. I've been Please here. go ahead. <laughs> I'm not sure what happened, uh, but I was in the call for so several minutes. I'm not sure why it wasn't allowing me to unmute. But anyway, thank you, um, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I apologize for the disruption. Uh, my name is Liz Morgan. I am speaking today in support of River North. In my role at the Central Family Life Center, I am the Director of Youthful Impact, which provides youth ages 17 to 24 with an opportunity to earn their high school equivalency diploma, construction skills, leadership, soft skills, and offers other social services. River North presents the North Shore with a unique opportunity for 225 units of newly constructed income-based affordable housing and approximately 7,800 square foot public plaza and significant visual and safety improvements to the streets, front and sidewalk along Richmond Terrace and Stuyvesant Place, all developed in an equitable manner. River North will achieve this equity in part through its partnership with Youthful Impact. Youthful Impact will work with River North project partner, Building Skills New York, to place Staten Islanders in construction jobs that this project will create. When River North is approved, I look forward to working with Building Skills New York to harness the economic and career opportunities that River North will create for our young people on the North Shore. Located near multiple means of public transportation, including the ferry terminal, River North will position to draw visitors to our community where they can support the numerous businesses, restaurants, and cultural institutions that the island has to offer. I am sincerely urging you to vote to support the River North project. Thank you for your time and consideration. And again, I apologize for the, um, the issue. No need for an apology. Thank you for sticking with us. Questions for Ms. Morgan. Again, thank you. And uh, Brian, that's the last of the speakers that show up. Have any of the folks who dropped out of the room returned? No, we have no, they have not returned. And no one else has signed up? Okay, so before closing this hearing, I will note that the record is going to remain open through Monday, the 26th of July, 2021 to receive written comments on the draft environmental impact statement. And with that, this public hearing is closed. Uh, citywide, uh, calendar number 50, uh, in the matter of a citywide text amendment, uh, N210406ZRY, a public hearing in the matter of a application for a zoning text amendment concerning the citywide hotel. Text. A public hearing is also being held by the City Planning Commission in conjunction with the above uh, non-Euler zoning text amendment hearing 
to receive comments related to the draft environmental impact statement. This hearing is being held pursuant to the State Environmental Quality Review Act and the City Environmental Quality Review. And I am afraid that my list of speakers is on the fritz, Ryan, so if I could ask you. Certainly. If we have any elected officials in the room, obviously we accord uh, them. My understanding is that we do. Let me. As we had a presentation on this on Monday, that's why there won't be a presentation. We will go directly to the speakers. I see that um, Council Member Justin Brannon is in the room. Great. Welcome, Council Member. And as is our practice, there is no time limit for your testimony. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Hi, welcome. Me? Yes, welcome. Thank you so much. This is Councilman Justin Brannon. Uh, I represent uh, parts of Southwest Brooklyn in the City Council District 43. Uh, I wanted to testify today in support uh, of the special permits for hotels in New York City. Uh, I believe that special permits for hotels is smart policy. It gives New Yorkers a say where they currently don't have any at all. At a time when we can't currently house every New Yorker, the fact that hotels can be built as of right in some and not be built as of right in certain areas, I just find completely insane. My district needs many things, but I've never had someone suggest that what we really need are more hotels. Yet, in my district, 99% of the time, a hotel can be built as of right, even though 99% of the people will agree it's a bad location for a hotel. I believe more community input is always a good thing. We want New Yorkers to have more of a say over what happens in their communities and not less. Um, it's also a myth that special permits would drive more people to Airbnbs or illegal hotels. Uh, hotel oversupply in New York City is a real thing. As tourism uh, in the city recovers, the city will need new hotels. But what we can't afford to have is the indiscriminate and unprecedented development of hotels that we've seen over the past 15 years, uh, where we saw the market almost double in size from around 75,000 rooms in 2007 to almost 140,000 rooms last year, 2020. Going forward, uh, I believe if we are gonna build more hotels, then we must give the community a real voice over the appropriateness of their development. A key consideration must be the impact that nuisance hotels have on our communities. A special permit requirement will give local residents and their duly elected officials a stronger voice in not having to fight to ensure that housing development is an option. So it's for all these reasons that I lend my full support for special permits for hotels in New York City. I think it's long past time that New Yorkers were given a say, a real say, in the type of development that so profoundly affects their daily lives. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you for taking the time to testify. Questions from the Commission? Okay, you're off the hook, Council Member. Thank you. And I do not have access at this point to the speakers. Ryan, would you be able to call the next speaker? Certainly. Um, it appears that we have Council Member James Gennaro in the Zoom room as well. Thank you, Council Member Gennaro. The floor is yours. Yes, hello. I want to make sure that I can be heard. I just went through some technical uh, hoop there. Am I am I being heard? Loud and clear. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the City Planning Commission for taking my testimony remotely. Uh, my name is Jim Gennaro, council member for the 24th uh, District in Central East and Queens. Uh, before I proceed, uh, I wish to be associated with remarks my good colleague, uh, uh, Council Member Brannon. Uh, in May, the New York City Planning Commission held a public review session on the Citywide Hotel Special Permit Text Amendment, the so-called um, Hotel Special Permit, referring the application to all community boards, borough boards, and borough presidents. The Citywide Hotel Special Permit aims to create a very consistent approach to hotel development, across the five boroughs. While I can understand some of the concerns raised by this text amendment, I believe the hotel special permit is on balance in the best interests of New York City residents. 
This ULERP text amendment would provide the community with several opportunities to offer real and meaningful input and to propose uh, projects for uh, new hotels. The city's elected and appointed officials are also empowered, if this were to pass, uh, to approve or deny these projects and help shape them for the benefit of residents and other stakeholders. For example, if a community board was concerned about noise from a uh, proposed hotel's um, outdoor restaurant, Euler provides a direct pathway to work with the developer on sound mitigation and hours of operation. In um, another such example, a council member uh, who has a hotel in their district that has become a nuisance to the community and does not want one more nuisance, this process would afford the community uh, the ability to obtain uh, um, good assurances from the developer uh, from the developer that the hotel will be built and operated responsibly. This is in stark contrast to this to the status quo, which often does not include any input from the community or from elected officials. Many developers, our concerns are mere suggestions, and, and as a New York City Council member, I can attest to this. Since 2006, there have been uh, there has been unprecedented boom in hotel construction. The New York City hotel market, as we heard from Justin, has grown from 65,000 to over 135,000 rooms, with another 25,000 in the current development pipeline. This is more than double the next largest pipeline, Las Vegas, which has an estimated 9,000 uh, rooms under development. This figure does not include the shadow supply of Airbnb units, uh, which is thought to be about 50,000. And contrary to what others may believe, a special permit requirement would not freeze hotel would not freeze hotel develop. New York City is a global hub for media, entertainment, finance, and tourism. There will always be a market for developing hotels in New York City as long as they are suitably located. A hotel special permit, uh, a hotel special permit amendment simply ensures that developers will be required to do so in a thoughtful, community-oriented manner. We are merely giving the community a stronger voice in this process. I hope that the borough boards, the borough presidents, uh, the uh, CPC, and the New York City Council vote in favor of this proposal to amend the ULERP text. Building bridges between um, building bridges between community residents and hotel developers is a very good thing. This hotel special permit, uh, you know, simply codifies this. Thank you for your time and good consideration. I appreciate it. Thank you, Council Member Gennaro. Questions. Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, Council Member. Thank you so much. And I, I just want to take the opportunity to sort of ask a question and of you and, and your colleagues. Unfortunately, I didn't ask Council Member Brennan this, but you know, we are um, in receipt of draft environmental impact statements that um, speak to the fiscal impact of this special permit on the city. Um, you know, different studies have uh, mentioned the loss of, you know, anywhere from $7 billion to $8.5 billion in annual economic activity. I mean, what, what are your, what's your perspective on that and how does that play into your position? Yeah, I, I, I uh, don't think I'm really on board with those projections. I think those are hyperbole. <clears throat> and uh, um, anytime someone has any kind of opposition to your meaningful community input, uh, we see the same, you know, straw men marched out there. Uh, I will take a deeper dive uh, into that, but uh, I'm not on board with those projections. I simply do not believe them. But I will uh, endeavor to have the, uh, to, the to, to have my district staff and have the council staff, uh, you know, look into that and uh, give all council members, uh, you know, the benefit uh, of those projections. Um, so, you know, duly noted, but um, I am skeptical um, of those, but we will certainly give it our you know, due diligence and um, factor that into our ultimate decision. Thank you. Other questions? You're welcome. Thank you, Council Member Gennaro. Our Thank next you. speaker is Council Member Helen Rosenthal. Terrific. This is Council Member Rosenthal. Um, I really want to uh, thank the City Planning Commission for the opportunity to testify today. Um, and I'm very pleased to offer my support for the citywide hotels text amendment 
that will require proposed new hotels with 150 units or more go through a special permit, which is ostensibly ULERT. By creating an opportunity for public review of large hotel projects, we're taking a proactive approach to ensure that proposed new hotels are thoroughly reviewed by its new neighbors. I speak from the experience I had as chair of Community Board 7 in the first years of the Riverside Center ULERP, now Waterline Square. The original project included a hotel and the community and community board was concerned about quality of life issues like noise, additional parking, congestion, increase in taxis and delivery trucks and so on. The ULERP gave us an opportunity to review and comment. And I believe the project got better because it gave the community an opportunity to weigh in I too know that there have been several concerns raised about this proposal, including from my local community board. So I'd like to address two central questions that have been raised. And I think someone can get to your point, Commissioner Ortiz, although I'd love to talk about your point more after my testimony. First, I do not share the concern that this fundamentally is a ban on hotel construction. We know that special permit requirement will only apply to hotels with 150 units or more. So smaller hotels can still be constructed as of right, um, unless some other zoning restriction applies. And the other and related concern that I do not share is that the special permit requirement will cripple the city's ability to recover from the pandemic by not having enough hotel rooms to accommodate tourist demand. The reality is, and the data show, that the current number of hotel rooms is sufficient to meet the current and expected demand. In the wake of the pandemic, there is an enormous surplus of hotel rooms across New York City. And as I noted before, construction of smaller hotels will continue as of right. I will be voting yes when this text amendment comes before the city council. The hospitality industry is a critical part of our local economy. And I do not see evidence that requiring additional public review of larger hotel projects will harm this industry or the economy in the long run. The public through its community board and elected representatives will have a voice to ensure that larger hotel developers listen to its new neighbors. I urge the commission to support the citywide hotels text amendment. Thank you very much. Thank you, council member. Questions from the commission. Thank you for testifying. Appreciate your taking the time. Oh, can I jump in on Commissioner Ortiz's point about the- Oh, economy? of course. Of course. Thank you. Um, I do think uh, the city has been, had dire financial, has had, the pandemic has had dire financial impact on the economy. Um, and obviously, we're all so grateful that President Biden got elected and is now, frankly, giving the city money to help in its recovery. I do think we're going to recover. I think that the money that the federal government has given the city will get us over the hump of uh, our um challenges right now, but I think the city is coming back. I think that uh, tourism will come back to where it is. I think the economy will recover and that by the time the federal money um, no longer exists, we won't need it. That revenues will have come back stronger than ever. So, um, 
I, I think that to your question, Commissioner, and um, as somebody who's watched the city's finances over the years, um, I have confidence in our city's recovery. I welcome your vote of confidence in our city and its economy. <laughs> and again, thank you for taking the time to testify. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Council Member Ben Kalos. Council Member Kalos is not in the room, but we'll alert you when he does arrive. Great, thank you. Then our next speaker is uh, Council Member Antonio Reynoso. Uh, Council Member Reynoso is not in the Zoom room yet either, so we'll. Okay. Um, our next speaker is Council Member Mark Levine. Council Member Levine is not in the room as well. We'll keep okay. an eye on that. Then we will move on to Borough President Gail Brewer. Borough President Brewer is not in the room. Okay. Um, we will then move on to Assembly Member Richard Gottfried. The Assembly Member is not in the room yet. We'll keep an eye on all of these elected okay. officials. Okay, and as they come into the room, sure. we'll just say, let, we'll us, say calm. let us know. Yep. Okay, then we will... Um, continue um, with our approach of having five speakers in opposition, five speakers in support, and toggling back and forth. Our first speaker will be Moses Gates. Thank you so much for allowing me to testify. Uh, my name is Moses Gates. I'm Vice President for Housing and Neighborhood Planning at Regional Plan Association. And I will also note I spent several years working in the hospitality industry as a New York City tour guide. Uh, we are testifying in opposition to this proposal, which does not even address its rationales for implementation. Uh, one stated premise is to create a more uniform zoning framework for new hotels citywide that could predict, support more predictable development. However, this proposal does the opposite. It institutes an ad hoc process where every action would be subject to uncertainty and unpredictability and almost certainly result in heavily discretionary and non-uniform development. This is made plain by the draft EIS itself, which states that obtaining a special permit can add significant time cost and uncertainty to a project. If the commission wants a framework for uniform and predictable hotel development, they should conduct a study of the city and determine the best framework for uniform and predictable hotel development, uh, preferably in the context of a comprehensive citywide plan, not regress to an ad hoc, ad hoc system. The other stated premise is to address conflicts with nearby commercial, industrial, and residential uses. This proposal would make hotels the only significant use that would need a special permit citywide. There are places in New York where one can build a roller coaster, an aircraft factory, a garbage dump, a fertilizer manufacturing, a cement plant, and a petting zoo as a bright. There are five zoning districts where you can locate a temporary carnival or circus. There are 16 where you can locate an active cemetery. Yet hotels, a common non-noxious use, are what in every case must be examined to see if they conflict with adjacent uses. Every other land use in the city has zones in which a use is considered appropriate and zones in which it is not. In fact, this is essentially the purpose of zoning altogether. The same is true of hotels as it is of all other land uses. Beyond this dubious land use rationale, According to the draft EIS, this would directly cost New Yorkers 19,000 jobs and over a billion dollars in wages and have an unavoidable negative impact on the hospitality industry. I would ask the commission, we as a city are being asked to contribute to the unemployment of 19,000 peoples and cost them over a billion dollars in exchange for what? What is the public good to be gained by this action which outweighs these negative impacts? There is no public benefit quantitatively enumerated anywhere in the draft EIS as to this action. Several residents and I'll note elected officials have complained about specific existing nuisance hotels as a way to justify this, but none of these would be abated with the adoption of this text amendment. In fact, these bad actors would likely be solidified in these neighborhoods. Despite being one of the most visited cities in the world, New York City already has a very hostile ecosystem for tourist accommodations. Thank you, Mr. Gates. All right. Thank you. Um, if you would like, if you'd like to submit your written testimony, we'll welcome receiving it. 
And now we toss it over to the commissioners. Commissioner Ortiz. Hi. Uh, thank you, Moses. Uh, thank you for your testimony. And I, I could only chuckle at the examples that you gave. <laughs> um, so um, I'm just going to take advantage of, of your knowledge of the, you know, you are uh, process and, and your understanding of um, environmental impact in particular. And earlier I asked uh, Council Member Generis about um, the EIS impact statements and the um, uh, studies that have projected um, significant fiscal impact on the city. Um, have you, or are you familiar with those? Um, is, there, is there any reason that we should give uh, credence to the the position that, you know, that's sort of fake news, so to speak, um, you know, should we trust that information? Are you familiar with those studies? I've, re I've read some of the studies. I'll note my testimony focuses on the draft environmental impact statement prepared by the Department of City Planning, uh, which projects, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 18,900 odd jobs that will be lost in the future. Um, about a quarter of, of hotel rooms going unoccupied and the resulting economic impact of that and then the knock-on economic impact of that. Um, you know, that, that's what my testimony is based on and I'll, I'll note the professionalism of DP, DCP staff is, is quite good um, as well as, as the uh, consultant who prepared the EIS and I don't see any reason to uh, you know, significantly question it. Economic impact statements, you know, can be a little bit on one side or a little bit on the other side. But, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that there will be a significant economic impact from this uh, proposal. And uh, quite frankly, I'm a little disappointed that the way folks to choose to address it is some some folks, I should say, not not all opponents, you know, choose to address this economic impact is not by justifying the good that will come out of it in balance to this economic impact, but it, in, instead, uh, you know, just choosing to ignore things that are not convenient to their argument. I think it's a disservice to, uh, you know, to this process. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Gates. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gene Kaufman. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Gene Kaufman. I'm an architect and I've been designing buildings uh, for New York City, including hotels, for the last 35 years. Um, this uh, proposed special permit will effectively stop all new hotel proposals. The M1 and local district special permits have proved that because in those areas, um, no new hotels have been proposed or built. The room shortage will exceed even the nearly 50,000 that the DEIS uh, concedes will be existing. And the financial loss will be in the billions and many more than has been uh, even indicated in the report if you believe some of the media. Hotel rates will go through the roof. Ordinary people, people like you and me and middle class around the world uh, will be barred from coming here because of the price. Only rich tourists will be able to afford a hotel room. Everyone else is going to be forced to use Airbnb or stay home. I don't think that's what the city wants. As noted at the review session by Commissioner Ortiz, um, this proposal seems to lack a land use rationale. And the staff indicated that the special permit is contrary to the as of right zoning that city planning always strives for. Media has repeatedly called this proposal political payback. This proposal is NYC's big F you to the rest of the world saying, don't come here. Right as we try to recover from the pandemic, this drives a knife through future economic growth. It will cripple Broadway, restaurants, stores, and other businesses that will be unable to return to their former levels. The massive loss of revenue and jobs will be greater than even the DEIS indicates as it did not study these other areas of the economy. Properties that would have become hotels will instead be developed as homeless shelters because that will be the only viable as of right use. Ironically, regulating hotels so as to not impair neighborhoods will lead to more significant neighborhood impact by bringing in a large homeless population. 
This proposal is much more than a hotel ban. It is a homeless shelter proposal. Neighborhoods like Chelsea, Long Island City, and downtown Brooklyn, where hotels were being built, will go shelters instead. The DEIS does not speak to this issue. I believe this proposal should be sent back to study the impacts on tourist related industries and on the proliferation of homeless shelters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kaufman. Questions? Thank you. Paul yeah. Silver. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, members of the commission, Paul Silver, Kramer Levin. I'm here to speak today as chair of the Rebney Zoning and Design Committee, uh, and I'll try to be brief. Um, the uh, text that we're talking about today is truly awesome in its breadth. It seeks to establish a new citywide regime, one that ignores the diversity of our neighborhoods and leaves hotel development at the mercy of a uniquely vague and subjective finding. What's most striking coming from an agency that consistently produces, an agency and a commission, in fact, that consistently produces thoughtful and forward-looking planning is the absence, the total absence, of a reasoned land use rationale for this proposal. But that's hardly surprising, given what can charitably, charitably be called the absence of evidence to support any, any, anything that would, be, uh, that would seem to be a problem with the development of the hotels. Uh, the absurdity of the land use approach here and of the proposed special permit findings is conclusively demonstrated by existing conditions in neighborhoods where there are already heavy concentrations of and a high demand for hotel rooms, Times Square, the theater subdistrict, lower Manhattan, Flushing, Jamaica, downtown Brooklyn, Long Island City. Hard to imagine a more appropriate place for a hotel. So why have a special permit? The DEIS for the, for the proposal also utilizes the precedent of the M1 Hotel Text Amendment to justify the creation of this citywide proposal. Yet the impact of the Hotel Text Amendment, as was noted in that, pro that project's EIS, was predicated on continuing as of right hotel development in commercial districts throughout the city, as well as mixed use districts. Indeed, what may be most troubling about treating the M1 Hotel Text Amendment as precedent is that, as Gene Kaufman just said, it hasn't produced the construction or even the permit approval of a single hotel room in the years since it was enacted. So if the M1 special permit is the relevant precedent here, the proposed text change has the potential to be exponentially more damaging to the city's economy and to its job market than we have been led to expect. The bottom line is that the proposed text does not serve a legitimate planning purpose and it should not be enacted. Um, I'm happy to uh, discuss any uh, aspects of this, and, and if the commission wishes, without prejudicing uh, the position of the, the board and its committee, uh, some uh, alternative approaches to this problem. Thank you, Mr. Selver. Uh, Commissioner Cerullo, you might have sure. questions. Paul, I, I just, I, again, but in, in a more uh, appropriate and relevant moment, I just want to acknowledge your, first of all, your comments today, but also your thoughtful presentation of the issue um, that you shared publicly um, in in an op-ed in Cranes. Um, uh, you, you framed the issue, at least for me, uh, in, in a per, in a perfect way. You know, I I myself, you know, since the. <clears throat> The certification of this, or even even earlier, when there was some public discussion about this coming down the pike, um, you know, I've looked at this in in a variety of ways. I mean, there are really two two primary ways, right? There's the sort of the merits of this proposal, which is, you know, whether or not this is good land use policy, and and it is my my belief that one, because there's no real land use rationale for this, and there's no data to support the idea that there's actually a problem to rectify, um, that it's not, it's certainly not good land use policy, but there's also the level of even if it were, whether or not in this time of, of 
what what will be a dramatic recovery for New York City and and the catastrophic impact that COVID had on this industry in particular, you know, what rational government would move to do something like this at this time? So it's it's really a concern to me. Um, and and I, I think, I guess Moses in Israel, he, he had data about the number of jobs. I mean, we know that. I, I don't know whether or not you know, OMB has weighed in on this, <laughs> you know, agencies that normally would, you know, panic when something costs $5 more or there's a $5 loss of revenue that these numbers are so far, I guess we're just going to rely on the federal government to keep giving us money. But this is really frightening to me. So I, I want to acknowledge your your testimony and your thoughts and um, and obviously just open the door for you to share um, whatever other information you have that could be helpful to us as a commission as we move through this process. Okay, well, well, thank you, thank you, Commissioner Sir. Well, let me just say that that in in commenting on the thoughtfulness of the, both the agency and the commission here, I I can cite back to your your questions and your comments on the last proposal, which while we may disagree, were the kind of thoughtful approach that this body takes towards zoning changes, and which. Frankly, you you uh, you took at the review session. You know, the the real estate board had an independent study done uh, by AKRF, uh, and Basha Gerhards uh, will be testifying on that. So I don't want to steal her thunder, and I don't know all the details anyway. Um, so I don't have too much to add on the facts and figures. I can tell you that as somebody who's been doing you work for for more years than he'll admit, like to admit. Uh, that uh, it is a it is a wonderful process, but it is not a process that belongs for, that should be used for hotel. It should be put into place for hotel development because it will, in fact, as it has in the M1 district, basically stop hotel development, uh, at least hotel development of anything larger than 149 rooms, and 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 some of those hotels. The, the larger hotels are exactly the kind of hotels New York City's tourist and convention industry needs to survive. So, so that's the kind of hotel you're putting the death knell to, I think. And, and that's the kind of hotel which gets developed in the Manhattan Central Business District. It doesn't appear somewhere in Queens or Brooklyn right. or the Bronx or Staten Island. It doesn't even appear on the Upper East Side or Upper West Side. It happens right here in lower Manhattan or right there in Midtown. So it just, it, look, it doesn't make any sense. But. Yeah, I, 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 I don't disagree, of course. Um, I, I also think there's, there's even what we we're hearing today, and I say this respectfully, um, that, you know, the, there's the argument that, well, we're in this moment and there's too many hotel rooms and, not enough people, but then so this is a good reason to control the 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 development of hotels. But but we don't need to worry about the economics of any of it because we're going to come out of the recovery. So it, it's like saying we're going to come out of the recovery, but we're going to pretend that we have too many hotel rooms now and we're never going to get back to 70 million visitors in the city and, and business travel and all the things that that fill our hotel rooms. So there's a lot of inconsistency here. The other thing that Again, we had this conversation earlier today when the term precedent came up. Um, uh, the the idea that you know, for the reasons that this sounds, that th there there are some who are supporting this uh, because of the use and, and and having more control over the use in in a neighborhood of uh, of the development of a property. You know, where does that potentially then end? And and we will end up having. You know what? What's the next industry or use that should go through this process? I mean, I can make examples like as Moses did with the types of things you can do, but I'm afraid to actually give some that I would find funny for fear that they actually might be next on the list. So I'll I'll refrain from doing that. But but at some point that becomes a real issue as well. And you know what what are we doing with zoning and and the as of right nature of zoning for 
for reliability and how far do we go? So anyway, I, I just, just more thoughts about things and less a question, but it's a concern. Commissioner Dweck. Paul, Paul, I don't know if you've uh, heard my comment at the, I think, th certification or the review session. Uh, what would be Rebney's thoughts if there was a built-in sunset into the amendment? You know, the, I, I don't know if Rebney has, has a position on that. I can tell you that as, a, as an individual and as somebody who would speak within the, within the, 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 uh, the organization, that it certainly helps. In fact, it was, I thought, one of the, 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 be the best, better or best comments that was given if you had to do something. Um, because that would, if you made it, it would give you a chance to revisit this. And if it didn't work, then it wouldn't be readopted. My concern would be that, I guess, uh, to the extent that what's driving this is politics, it, it, that a sunset wouldn't really help if the politics was still in favor of this kind of a uh, this kind of a a, a, a permit when the, the sunset came up. But but of all the different ways in which one can massage this, the the sunset provision is certainly uh, one that is we're thinking about if you're going to do it. The, the, the economic impacts aren't projected to be well into the 2030s, I believe. Uh, and 2035, correct. So a sunset would give the hotels that are currently struggling an opportunity to uh, make up some ground and uh, get and stabilize. And again, like you said, it would be, re it would be re revisited. But politics aside, I think that it's always good politics to have good economic policy in the city of New York. So I would imagine that anybody would look at it and see the dollars and cents impact on the economy. So uh, if you can follow up and, and perhaps put in writing what the thoughts would be on a sunset from, from, from the position, the official position, it would be helpful. I, I, will, 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 I, will, I will inquire. Uh, the one thing I would say, if it were a sunset, it should be pretty short. Most of the sunset provisions that I've seen in the zoning, for example, when they did West Mid... When they did the special midtown district, they had additional density in West Midtown. Uh, there, I think there have been one or two others since then, but that's the one that sticks in my mind was a five-year provision. Yeah, so I, I would. I'd like to see it between five and seven. So that, that would be my opinion. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Eady. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I I too had raised some concerns at certification regarding this proposed action, and and I thought I heard you indicate that you had some suggestions that might um, address some of the concerns raised by the um, proposers of this action that would be less um, onerous in terms of accomplishing some of the same goals. If, you, if I heard correctly, if you can provide those to us, I'd greatly appreciate it. Well, I, you know, I think uh, uh, at, at the risk of... of uh, uh, I, I, if you had, first of all, Commissioner, if you had specific thoughts at, at the uh, earlier review session, I confess that I, I watched it. I don't remember enough detail, but if there are things you specifically want to address, I'm happy to talk about them. Obviously, one other way to skin this cat is to limit its geographic impact. A hotel will, yes, it will have a different impact in Bay Ridge. Than it does in uh, uh, it does in NoHo, so uh, that's another way of thinking about it. So thank you. And my my concerns were more general, not specific, and related to being somewhat of a fan of as of right development and believing that this was, I'll call it overreaching. What well, it it is, but the, the the solution to to that is is really to say no. Thank you. I, I did see the op-ed as well. <laughs> Commissioner Ortiz. Hi. Thank Hi. you. Um, I want to get to the land use rationale and commercial districts, but first, just just a point. You have familiarity with the costs associated with um, the ULERP and special permit process. How much yes. would you say that adds to um, you know project in general? I'm sure there's a range. There, there, there is a range, and it, it, it will depend on 
whether uh, the level of opposition and the level of controversy about the project. Um, it'll depend on whether or not there's an environmental impact statement associated with it. Um, it will, uh, uh, it'll depend upon the size of the project. So, you know, I would say, I'm just thinking this through a little bit. Um, you're talking, you're talking in, in at least, and, and different, it would also depend upon the different, you know, there are different compositions of the group, the, the, the group of people who are involved in putting these things together. But uh, you can easily get into the seven figures to get through a ULERP. Um, and uh, uh, particularly one that's controversial. One that isn't controversial, somewhere in the sixes, six figures, but, but you're always, as far as I'm concerned, to get a ULERP done properly, you're always in the six figures with all of the different pieces that you have to put, put into place, the architects, the, the environmental consultants, the lawyers, the various other consultants. Okay, so is it fair to say this would be more impactful on smaller projects? Um, you know, and, and a, a larger project could absorb these costs. Maybe that's, that's too broad of an assumption. I think that I think yeah. that's I think that's too broad of an assumption. Yeah. I think that the issue the issue really is it's not and it's not just dollars. It's time. Yeah, yeah. And 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 not knowing you know when you're going to come to market uh, when you start out. So I, I think it's the uncertainty probably more than the, it, it's the uncertainty that's part of it as well. And yes, the dollars are going to be more. Uh, impactful on the smaller projects, but the uncertainty impact is greater with a larger project because yeah. you're putting your involved. The investment is that much greater, and the uncertainty about what the outcome is going to be uh, means much more. Okay, and then just uh, some some clarification. So, my concerns about this are related to the land use rationale, and I want to focus on commercial districts, which I, I, you made that point as well. Um, you know, hotel groups are a commercial use group. Um, uh, the use group five um, is what we're talking about here. And we're saying that the land use um, rationale is that we want to minimize conflicts with adjacent uses and protect the safety of hotel guests. Um, you know, how can we say that hotels in commercial districts of use described create conflicts with adjacent uses or create unsafe conditions for hotel guests. I think that's part of the problem. <laughs> that, that, that in fact there 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 are almost no cases that, that I can't think of any cases. In fact, where there have been those kinds of conflicts, where there have been problems with where the hotel guests have been put in a unsafe position. Um, you know the 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 thing about the thing most hotels are are places where people come and they spend the night and they go about their business during the day and maybe they have a meal or two there uh hard to say how that's uh, negatively impactful on any of the surrounding uses uh particularly where there are controls over the, the density of the hotels where you're in a, a zone where the permitted FAR of a hotel, um, uh, the impacts of the hotel, you're going to get smaller hotels, they're going to be much less than, than they will in, where the FAR is 15. Can I ask you, does this, does the sort of lack of rational land use rationale, um, does that open this up to potential um, legal, um, you know, a legal response? It's interesting. Yeah, you know, I actually, I, I can't say that I thought as much about that as I should have. Um, zoning, um, uh, zoning has to serve a valid public purpose. It has to be. It helps to advance the the health, public health, safety, and welfare. That's the traditional definition of a police power. Um, I think uh, it's it's something that's certainly worth thinking about in terms of uh, uh, in terms of how one might uh, uh, approach this if you're from the opposition side. Uh, it's. I, I wouldn't want to say without doing a little bit more research, frankly. But but. But it doesn't preclude but, but that at this time. It that, might. It's it it it's a, it would be a candidate. Let me put it that way. It, 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 sort of. There's a prima facie basis for looking at 
looking at this that way. Thank you. Other questions? You were probably up longer than you expected. So thank you very okay. much. Okay, thank you, <laughs> Commissioners. Our next speaker is Council Member Antonio Reynoso. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me and excuse me for being in uh, my child's bedroom. Um, you know, we've all uh, are experienced a little, a couple of changes in our lives uh, related to COVID and want to thank uh, CPC for allowing me an opportunity to speak here today, today DCP to speak here today. Um, good afternoon to Chair Lago um, and members of the commission. My name is Antonio Reynoso and I am the council member for the 34th district representing Williamsburg and Bushwick in Brooklyn and Richard in Queens. I'm here to testify today in support of the proposed hotel special permit. I don't believe the rationale for this proposal is complicated, so I'll keep my comments very brief. In recent years, there has been an explosion in hotel development across the city. And unlike previous surges in hotel development, these businesses have cropped up in many areas outside of Midtown, including the outer boroughs. Since 2006, we have more than doubled the number of hotel rooms in the city. And this does not take into account hotel units in the pipeline or private housing units that are utilized as hotel units through Airbnb. Furthermore, this massive supply of hotel rooms is operating in a market where the most pressing issues is inducing demand following the pandemic. Our focus must be on closely monitoring the supply of hotel rooms to ensure that our supply doesn't outpace demand. This is basic planning and something that I would expect the planning commission to be fully in favor of. Um, I wanna conclude by urging this commission to begin thinking more comprehensively about how to plan for holistic communities. Uh, my district and its surrounding neighborhoods have seen a massive increase in hotels over the past 10 years. Some of these areas have been have become districts that are devoted almost exclusively to tourism and entertainment, putting a significant strain on surrounding residential neighborhoods, balancing competing interests in the baseline task of DCP and ensuring our city works for both its full-time residents as well as the tourism industry and the crux of the proposal before us today. I strongly encourage the commission to approve the proposed special permit, which will allow communities to appropriately plan for hotel development and ensure that all of our neighborhoods retain a balance of uses. Thank you, and I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you, council member. Questions? Council, um, commissioner, to ask. Uh, council member, thank you. <laughs> um, would you support it if it, uh, uh, the text, uh, the special permit excluded Midtown Manhattan? The requirement for a special permit excluded Midtown Manhattan? I can't, I can't say for sure. It's a proposal that you just uh, presented to me that um, that I haven't re really considered. Um, but I think I, I, I think it's something that I, I would I would love to have a, a deeper conversation with you about. Um, but I think my biggest concern is the outer boroughs and the explosion of like unfettered uh, development of hotels with um, very you know naturally because of the the um, the as of right uses makes it so that we can't control what the, um, the future looks like. Uh, but I, I just don't see any harm in special permits at all. It's just another, another layer of, of oversight um, uh, that I think could be valuable. Um, I, never, I, I don't necessarily think it, it's a detriment to the development of new hotels. Um, I actually just think it's just another layer of uh, of oversight that I think could be meaningful. So, um, and it, you know, instinctively right now, I would say that uh, I would want that to be included, uh, but would love to have a, a deeper conversation related to, to that proposal. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Other questions? Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, um, Council Member. You know, I'm certainly sympathetic to the concerns raised about the impacts of neighborhoods, but on Along the lines of Commissioner Dweck, you know, we, we just heard some testimony on, um, you know, the, the, the fact that this is a very normal um, commercial use in our medium and higher density districts where it makes a tremendous amount of sense and where the impacts on residential communities are negligible or, or if, if they're there at all. So, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm curious as to whether, you know, if, if we continue this line of inquiry along the lines of where land use rationale is reasonable and where it isn't, you know, are there areas where carve outs might make sense? Yeah. yeah and look, I don't think that that's a, that that is, that's a, ba uh, a poor take necessarily. I, I just think, look, one, because 
the comprehensive planning doesn't happen in the city. Um, like we're having this conversation, I think outside of the context uh, of a larger conversation that should happen. Um, and where these uh, hotels are going up, and I'll give an example of my district right now. Um, the areas that have like large or strong commercial areas are close to industrial developments in my district, um, which we have been able to take care of through executive order. Um, but uh, the hotel development um, is a, in, in my district, um, uh, specifically uh, happens in areas that are, have high truck traffic, um, high industrial traffic. Um, they've also produced uh, a need to uh, develop, um, uh, and I'm so sorry, accommodations for hotel patrons or clients um, that didn't exist before that is, is imposing like a new demand on a more commercial uh, on commercial development in areas that are more residential or manufacturing and not necessarily commercial. But, but like I said, I think that um, because this should be a more comprehensive conversation um, and we can't have that because there is no comprehensive planning that happens in the city, then we need to go through a process that allows us to have an extra layer um, of oversight through this special permit that can allow us for account to, to account for things um, like where exactly these hotels are being placed. Um, and no one neighborhood is, 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 is the same as another. Um, so it, it's why I think the special permit across the board makes a lot of sense so that we can look into that, in, into those types of things. And I hope uh, that answered the question a bit. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, then thank you, council member. And you can now give the bedroom back to your darling child. Thank you so much, Chair. It's a pleasure to see you all. Take care. Thanks. Our next speaker will be Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer. Hi, it's Gail Brewer. I'm sorry, it's just slow. Do it needs to improve. Do it needs to improve. <laughs> Don't get me sorry. I have a messy desk, but I am in the office. So anyway, thank you very much, Chair Lago and Commissioners. I am Manhattan Borough President, and I'm here to testify in favor of this application. I think you've heard a lot about it. Um, I feel strongly because in the Borough of Manhattan, particularly in Community Board Number 4, you have some streets, because of the zoning, that are literally one entire hotel, particularly in the West 30s. Uh, we know it because we remember pre-pandemic and, of course, during the pandemic, when, to the credit, Department of Homeless Services, they moved individuals into hotels. It became more of an issue and clearer. So I believe very strongly that we do need uh, some kind of a text change if there is to be a hotel. We need a special permit. Now, you might say, oh, it's just the unions talking to elected officials. No, I would say this with or without the union. And I think actually the union has been quite responsive. For instance, as you know, in addition to supporting this um, special permit, I'm also supportive in some cases of hotels being for those who are low income, or uh, those who need, those who are formerly homeless, 30% of the homeless work, many of them work in Manhattan. I run into them all the time. I would love to see some of these hotels to be run by nonprofits, not for profits, where there isn't a need for that particular hotel. We've called every single hotel in the borough of Manhattan. There are 700 in the city, 435 in Manhattan. And we have called them all to see, is anybody interested in selling? And some are. To the credit of the union, they, are not, uh, they want affordable housing too. So they're not objecting to that. What we are concerned about is, as a community, is not planning. So we do need to have a text amendment. Second, there was a question about carve out. I know originally in the state bill, which is another whole topic, where there is funding to be able to pay for some of these conversions, thank you to the state legislature and the governor, um, there may be some carve-outs. I know there is a discussion going on now about Times Square. Uh, Tom Harris is head of the alliance. He may have testified, but the union is willing to discuss it. They haven't said no. They haven't said yes. We haven't decided. But yes, there could be some carve-outs. I think that, that's certainly possible. So for those who think development won't happen if in fact there is a special permit, I don't agree. I do think that hotels in particular um, are easier. Uh, in my book, they provide uh, employment. They obviously, if they're well done, they provide economic development for the tourists and for that industry. I don't think you're gonna have this hold up. It's too long, it's too expensive. And guess what developers? You don't have to hire so many lobbyists when you are 
producing this information. You can work with us directly, just a suggestion. So I'm here to say I support this text amendment. Madam Chair, I also wanna say I wasn't able to testify regarding 633, 641 West 142nd Street, but I too submitted, uh, you are, we do not support that project. And thank you very much. I know you're there for a long haul as commissioners and I'm very appreciative. Thank you. Thanks so much, Madam Borough President. Commissioner Ortiz. Hi. Um, thank you, Borough President. Always appreciate your testimony and, and insight. Um, you know, you mentioned the concerns about, you know, hotels to transient uses. And, you know, the one thing that was raised during the review session was that um, when um, hotels are for a public purpose, such as temporary housing for the homeless, they would not be subject to a special permit. So um, I, I guess the examples that you raised wouldn't be subject to this special permit, but legitimate commercial hotels would. So do you have any... Um, you know, response to that? Yeah, I mean, I think the answer is if you have a responsible nonprofit, they should work. That's why I don't want to be homeless hotels. That's not, I don't like that term, but a permanently supportive housing, that's what I would call it. That's different than the, that's what I'm looking for. I am not looking for more transitional. So if it's permanently supportive housing, in other words, a conversion from a hotel to permanently supportive housing, small, should not be more than 100 units, run by a nonprofit, that nonprofit, if they have any uh, backbone, they should be going to the community and working with them. The good nonprofits do that. The bad nonprofits don't. So I don't know that you have to have a permit for that, but because they absolutely have to go. For transitional, I would like to see a permit because I don't want transitional. I want permanent supportive housing. I do not think that these hotels should be turned into transitional housing, period. So my understanding of the proposal that's before us is that um, that precise kind of use would not be subject to a special permit. So transitional housing, I would love to see a permit for the Tem temporary housing for the homeless. I don't know if that's I, precisely I the same thing. That, I assume it is. That's yeah, transitional, yeah. Okay. temporary transitional, but for permanent. So that's not that that goes that's going to happen as a right under this proposal. OK, I would like to have it to be. You know, we I do think we need to have some kind of um, text amendments for the hotels. So if there is, in fact, if it's not able to be changed to include transitional, we can work on that on a different level if needed. But I hope to have almost no transitional. At least it was a real disaster because nobody was notified in advance. So that could happen. Maybe the city council could do that even separate from this particular discussion. There should be community input when you move people into a neighborhood. Other questions? Well, thank you for appearing before us twice today, Madam Borough President. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Council Member Kevin Riley. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm Council Member Kevin Riley, and I, I truly appreciate the opportunity to. Uh, give my testimony today for the special uh, permits. Um, I believe it's a, a amazing idea that we're actually giving communities a, a say so when hotels are being put into their neighborhoods. Um, if we're going to establish any transparency and trust within government, um, it's always imperative that we have our communities come to the table. Um, this is specifically uh, personal because we have, uh, I, I represent District 12 in the Bronx, um, which is really not a high tourist area, but we do have a hotel coming in the district um, and it's being built um, in, the, in the midst of uh, a community that is in dying need of other um, things that should be built in the location that this hotel is um, being built. So with that being stated, um, I just wanted to come in and share that I'm fully supporting uh, the special permits for the hotels. And I appreciate um, the hard work because I know you all have been here all day um, and listening to everyone's testimony. So truly appreciate it. And thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you for testifying before us for the first time. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you Questions? So Thanks very much. Our next speaker will be May Yu. 
Hello, good afternoon, um, Madam Chairperson and Commissioners. My name is Mayu, and I'm the Vice President of Real Estate and Economic Development at the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. And on behalf of the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership, I'd like to express our strong opposition to the proposed citywide hotel tax amendment, uh, particularly for central business districts like Downtown Brooklyn. Um, imposing a citywide special permit for hotel construction will drastically re restrict hotel development, impede tourism, and harm the many retail, food and beverage, and service businesses that rely on New York City tourism. This would hamper our post-pandemic recovery and much needed job growth, particularly again for job hubs like downtown Brooklyn. Um, downtown Brooklyn is the city's third largest central business district and the civic and economic center of the borough, serving a di diverse range of residents, uh, workers, shoppers, visitors, and students. This existing context, bolstered by our excellent transit connectivity, makes downtown Brooklyn the ideal location for new hotel development. The proposed action conflicts with city and state economic policies, which call for additional, uh, which call for supporting additional mixed use growth at this location. Furthermore, local hotels support corporate travel for growing number of businesses in our district. Firms like JP Morgan Chase, Blue State, 2U, and Slate require places for employees and clients to stay when visiting the city. Hotels within walking district of their downtown Brooklyn offices meet this demand. Hotel development also complements the needs of the of downtown Brooklyn's anchor academic as well as cultural institutions. Um, as many of you know, the district is home to nearly a dozen higher ed institutions that host scholars and industry partners from around the world. For example, NYU's 370J Street includes incubator space, lab facilities, and recording studio that tracks a global audience of entrepreneurs and innovators. The district is also home to about a dozen um, incubator and research facilities that have partners with um, international organizations like Microsoft, which helps to uh, develop new research for students as well as new products that are used um, uh, for startups, um, by startups district-wide and citywide. Venues in the Brooklyn Cultural District, such as the Brooklyn Academy of Music, Mark Morris Dance Group, Brick, and as well as the Barclays Center required nearby lodging for visiting artists as well as tourists who travel to view performances. Hotel uses are vital in our district to support tourism, innovation, commercial, and cultural activity, and are in alignment with the character of the area and its central location. We encourage you to oppose the citywide hotel tax amendment for central business districts like downtown Brooklyn, and thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ms. Zhu. Questions? Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, um, thank you for your testimony. Um, uh, you know, one of the land use rationales stated was um, an attempt to minimize conflict with adjacent uses and protect the safety of hotel guests. Has the mm -hmm. business community and your constituents, have they, in fact, raised any concerns about conflicts with hotels or, or guest safety that, that need to be addressed? Uh, not that we're aware of. Um, the hotels, you know, again, both from our um, the cultural members of our bid, uh, like Mark Morris, um, Brick, Bam, as well as for many of the businesses, the hotel uses are uh, have been noted um, as an asset for the for the neighborhood. And we have a variety of hotels, from um, some smaller hotels to uh, larger hotels that provide conference space and event space. Um, like particularly, the event space and conference centers are very important for downtown Brooklyn. Um, again, as a jobs hub, um, we've also heard a lot of uh, heard from a lot of um, small businesses, particularly restaurants and um, bars in the area that many of the business that they usually get are from uh, tourists who are patrons of the hotels, you know, whether they're uh, national or international tourists or um, often family members of uh, residents who live by who live in the surrounding more residential neighborhoods. Right. So downtown Brooklyn, again, has been able to offer um, more um, kind of valued hotel rooms or a, a diverse um, option of hotels uh, and uh, uh, cost for hotel stays for uh, residents throughout the borough. And that's been very Thank important you. for our district. And, and alternatively, um, uh, hotels developed for a public purpose, such as temporary housing for the homeless, are those, um, is, are those uses that uh, the business community has uh, concerns about with respect to conflicts at times? Uh, yes. So there have been two hotels uh, in downtown Brooklyn that are used as temporary shelters, and that happened, um, I believe, 
starting last spring um, as a result of the pandemic. Um, we've had uh, businesses express concerns about that, and we know that that um, current uh, policy is being uh, legislated uh, um, in court. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, Ms. Yu. And I, I want to apologize to Council Member Keith Powers. Um, we had had um, someone in his office sign up under her name, and so we didn't realize that the Council Member was, in fact, waiting to testify. And so this time, we will welcome Council Member Keith Powers. Do we have the Council Member? We received a note from a member of his team, Kate Theobald, that she was holding for the council member. No, hello. My name is Kate Theobald. I'm chief oh. of staff for the council member, um, not the council member, uh, but he asked me oh, to. I'm, a, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, Ms. Theobald, then you'll have to wait your turn. It is only the elected officials themselves. I'm sorry. I had been told that you were holding for the council member. We'll get you in the, in the correct order. Um, we will then turn to Cynthia Norris. Okay. If we can keep a running list of those who aren't so that at the end we can come back. And then we will then turn in order to Kate Theobald. Welcome back. Hi again. I'm, I'm not council member Keith Powers and uh, I'm not a cat either. Uh, my name is Kate Theobald. <laughs> I'm Chief of Staff to Council Member Keith Powers. Um, he wanted to be here today to deliver his testimony and ask that I read the following for him. I am City Council Member Keith Powers, representing Midtown and East Side of Manhattan. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Today, the City Planning Commission is considering a citywide hotel tax amendment for New York City. As the presentation from City Planning outlines, the city has utilized the special permit process for new hotel development in particular areas over the last few years, including in my district as part of the larger East Midtown rezoning. While this special permit was put in place prior to my time in the city council, this was included to incentivize commercial office redevelopment in the Midtown core and allow for greater public input into any attempt to undermine the larger goals of that rezoning. As I will note later, we are currently undergoing review of a significant application adjacent to Grand Central that includes a hotel and is subject to a special permit approval. And it's worth noting that Community Board 5, the board representing a large share of East Midtown, asked in their resolution for the existing special permit to remain in place even if this passes. In the aftermath of COVID-19 pandemic, we as a city have truly been give, giving thought to what the future of tourism looks like in New York City. Hotels are an industry that has been hard hit by the pandemic and many locations have been forced to close either temporarily or permanently. The future of hotels and tourism is still an issue that we are dealing with, even as other industries are reopening and returning back to a pre-pandemic level of normal. Still, we have seen in the last year several examples of projects with a hotel involved that have required public review. Projects that include the Court Theater, Arthur Avenue, Flushing Waterfront, and the forthcoming Grand Hyatt. These examples are helpful to provide context to the concerns that individuals and stakeholders have raised with regards to the potential for a special permit to zero out hotel development. In fact, in three of these instances, we have seen hotels be part of a larger economic development project. The Grand Hyatt, for instance, is expected to have 400 hotel rooms alongside offices, conference rooms, restaurants, and transit improvements. The project itself is within the Greater East Midtown District and as such already requires a special permit. While the Grand Hyatt is not completed as of today, it is shaping up to be a mixed-use project that is attempting to incorporate the changing needs of tourists and the community. In the three years since the adoption of the Greater East Midtown rezoning, we have seen a boom in new projects that have met the intended goal for this area to incentivize development in the commercial hub of Midtown. We also have seen proposals that incorporate hotels alongside commercial space. The special permit may serve as a tool that allows the city to balance- Ms. Theobald, Ms. Theobald I'm, I'm afraid that the time is up. If you would be able to submit the letter, we'd welcome it. Yeah, just one last sentence. He says that, um, <laughs> I believe that a special permit process can work to allow all interested stakeholders in the city council to make smart and strategic decisions about land use moving forward. Thank you for your time today. 
Thank you. Close to on time. <laughs> um, questions from the commission? Okay. Well, again, thank you. Thank you for hanging in there and for your testimony. Appreciate it. Of course. Our next speaker will be Zachary Lerner. Hi, my name is Zachary Lerner. I am the organizing director for New York Communities for Change. Thank you for letting me testify. Um, so we are a community organization representing more than 20,000 low to moderate income uh, New Yorkers across the five boroughs and Long Island. Our members have been fighting to create an equitable and truly affordable New York City where people don't have to, uh, where people don't have to constantly worry about being evicted or not being able to provide for their families. And while real estate developers continue to drive up rents and build pod projects that only help their bottom line, it is low and working class New Yorkers who continue to suffer. So as I assume all of you already know, we are currently in a grave housing crisis in New York City with record high homelessness numbers and the strong possibility of a huge eviction wave that will only exacerbate this problem. And what we've seen is more and more low quality hotels being built in the outer boroughs that only that continue to fail and then get converted to temporary shelters as a way to deal with this crisis. So there's clearly a problem that we're seeing right now. If we're seeing that about 40% of outer borough rooms are being converted to temporary shelters. And instead of building problematic hotels that have to be converted, this is an opportunity where we could actually be building permanent affordable housing for the homeless and other rent burden New Yorkers in those lots and truly address the crisis at hand. So many communities were not in favor of these hotels to begin with, but because current zoning laws permit these hotels to be built as of right, local communities don't have a voice in the process, only developers do. So with the hotel special permit proposal, developers will be forced to engage with the community about what is being built in their community through requiring the use of ULERP and public input. We believe the current proposal as presented is good for our communities and for the city. So we as New York Communities for Change urge the City Planning Commission to pass the hotel special permits proposal as is. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Lerner. Questions? Thank you. Our next speaker will be Adam Friedman. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Adam Friedman. I'm director of the Pratt Center, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of the hotel special permit requirement. A special permit will give host communities and their elected representatives an opportunity to address any potential land use conflicts such as noise, traffic, sanitation, and other quality of life impacts while increasing local employment opportunities, and it will help stabilize the hotel sector. In 2015, Pratt Center published Hotel Development in New York City, Room for Improvement, which called for a citywide special permit for hotel development, and we recently published Still Room for Improvement, an addendum to Room. Three conclusions that are clear and frame this issue. Hotels, particularly when they begin to cluster, can cause land use conflicts around noise, traffic, sanitation, and can lead to a change in neighborhood character. The resolutions of the community board provide ample evidence of this. In addition, Pratt's first study identified instances where hotel development conflicted with 197A plans and other articulated city policies and community visions. Second, the tourism industry is critical to the city's economic well being both as a direct generator of jobs and tax revenues and tourist spending is essential to the city's arts and entertainment sectors and therefore to the city's creative vitality. A particular characteristic of the industry is the high average annual wage and accommodations, which is over 67,000. But there are warning signs for the hotel industry. Even before the pandemic, the revenue per available room was declining and some well-established hotels were closing or downsizing. So the issue that I, I hear repeated again and again in this hearing is how to reconcile the imperative to address the land use challenges presented by hotel development and the imperative to provide support for this critical industry. The land use challenges should be available through the special permit implemented on a citywide basis. As Commissioner Ortiz and others mentioned, the DEIS suggests this will lead to a deficit in hotel rooms with tourists and dollars being turned away. I think this finding is off for at least two reasons. First, the projections of growth in tourism are overly optimistic, and so the projected gap is overstated. The nature of travel is changing, particularly business travel. This is not just because of the pandemic, 
but because of Zoom and the surge in remote work, which is barely mentioned in the DEIS. We've all gained a level of Zoom competence and acceptance of the remote experience. Consequently, the judgment calls about whether to travel at both the individual and the corporate policy levels are being recalculated. In addition, businesses committed to environmentally sustainable practices are increasingly limiting their allowance for travel. The prep I'm afraid, Mr. Friedman, I'm, I'm afraid yes. that your time is up. I would turn it over to commissioners for any questions. Commissioner Ortiz. Um, hi, um, Adam, nice to hear from you. I, I would say you raised an issue that I hadn't really thought of and I want to note this. Um, you know, generally I think we should be in a position to trust the information and um, the environmental impact analysis that is done by you know, our own agency. Um, so I'm always concerned when people say that they don't believe that. Um, but um, you do mention that um, there's limited uh, mention of the impacts of COVID and the changing hospitality industry and that perhaps some of the trends assumed there are too um, robust or aggressive. So I, I think that that is helpful. And I, I think that's something that I buy actually. <laughs> um, in terms of what this might do to business travel. So it's, it's a good point. Thank you for that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? The, the other- Thank you. Sister. And Mr. Friedman, if you would be able to submit the balance of your letter, we'd welcome receiving it. Our next speaker is Maxwell Cabello. Great. Um, so my name is Maxwell Cabello and I am the Land Use and Policy Analyst at Churches United for Housing. Um, I'm here to speak in favor of this text amendment. Um, so just for a little background, our organization serves a diverse group of people, um, though a large share are immigrants, working class, and oftentimes struggle to find quality housing affordable at their income levels. Um, even though this amendment doesn't directly relate to housing, um, we feel that it, it applies to conditions that often participate in the domino effect of housing precarity for our members. Um, our organization has never been shy to challenge um, DCP when we feel like they're not acting in the interest of our constituency, but um, we find ourselves fully aligned when it comes to this text amendment. Um, recently, we worked on the Bushwick Community Plan, and one of the things that our community demanded in that was um, to ensure that manufacturing uses weren't converted to residential. Um, and similarly, DCP implemented the M1 hotel and self-storage amendments, um, you know, trying to stave off commercial and hotel gentrification in those areas. Um, this is critically important for our constituencies because those areas have historically had high wage working class jobs that has been attainable to them. And I think that's just a very important thing that I haven't heard talked enough about today. We've talked about the loss of jobs um, and revenue to the city, but we're not talking about the quality of those jobs and the quality of the jobs that are being pushed out by unfettered development like this. And it, to me, it seems like those previous text amendments were meant to address that. And this is a continuation that, that's, that's critical. So um, we feel that the special permit will, will simply hold hotel development accountable to the local community and residents to ensure they receive investments and jobs in their communities that they deserve. And we hope that the commission, DCP, and eventually the council will not consider just the financial impact at a high level, but also the impacts on historically marginalized communities who are already struggling. Um, we're happy to support this text amendment and look forward to ensuring that future hotel proposals are considerate of local conditions and needs where this text amendment is applicable, um, but particularly looking out for the needs of historically marginalized families and communities. And one last thing I just wanted to mention was we talked about uh, the state passing Honda, the Housing on Neighbors with Dignity Act. They're looking at converting distressed hotels already for housing. Um, and so kind of aligned with uh, what New York Communities for Change were saying, we have to coordinate with the state level on stuff like this. And since New York City avoids comprehensive planning under the guise of its zoning tax, it seems like this is actually a good <laughs> version of coordinated planning with the state. And so I think that's another consideration that should be uh, made by uh, the commission and the council eventually. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for testifying, Mr. Cabello. Questions? Again, thank you. And our next speaker will be Marie Pierre. Good afternoon, Commissioner and your panel. My name is Marie Pierre, and I'm giving you a perspective as a resident of Brownsville. 
Many of my other speakers have reiterated some of my concerns, but I'm giving you it from a personal perspective. I'm also a member of my community board. And many times we, because of the, as of right, we don't even know when a hotel is in our community. We see a sign and when we begin to ask, we hear it's going to be a hotel. Many times it turns into, as we say, as many speakers have said, into a temporary homeless shelter. And what does it do to us? Of course, our property values go down. We have to deal with loitering and in most cases crime. And I'm here to say that in many of the instances, we as community members, because we don't have a voice because of this policy, the, the, pre the previous policy, we don't have a voice. And so we are stuck with trying to fight to prevent more of these type of transitional hotels which begin as hotels and then we realize it is transitional housing. So I'm here to say that I'm supporting this special permit. Thank you, that's my voice. Thank you for testifying, Ms. Pierre, and for your service on the community board. Questions for Ms. Pierre. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Nelly Hidalgo. Edwin, do you have access to check to see if she remains in the room? I do not, but I can run out and check right away. Take a stretch. While waiting for that, if we could move on to Richard Dunkley. Hi, my name is, somebody hear me? Hello? Oh yes, is this, is this Nelly Hidalgo? Yes, hi, my name is Nelly Hidalgo. I have lived in Queens for 24 years with my family. There have been a lot of new hotel opening throughout the city in, and especially in the outer boroughs like Queens. Some of these hotels have been great or good for tourists, but many of them have not been good for neighborhoods. New York City has plenty of hotels. I am not against new hotel being built, but I do think that this hotel being, being, being built in, my, in Queens should have had the opportunity to get input from community members to make sure the hotel fits the character of the area in the best way possible. This is why I support the hotel test amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hidalgo. Questions? Thank you. Our next speaker will be Richard Dunkley. Is Richard Dunkley in the room? No, he's not in the room. Okay, then we will move on to uh, Rachel Riviera. I know, Rachel's not. Hey. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Is this Ms. Riviera? No, this is Cynthia Norris. Um, I was trying to get Rachel. She's my neighbor, but she just told me if they call her name, ask if I can read her testimony. Yes. Okay, great. Hello, my name is Rachel Rivera. I am a mother of six. I've been living in Brownsville for about four years now. And over the years I've seen, incre I've seen so many hotels pop up without new jobs increasing in our neighborhood for families like mine. We've seen hotels come into our neighborhoods over the years. And when they come, it's not, been, it's, it's not bringing any affordable housing here. We've seen as it's been turned into a shelter which means these shelters is like, you bring in shelters instead of creating real affordable housing for people to get a decent living. Um, they should be a way to allow, so this is why we're here today to tell folks like, this should be a way to allow local residents 
to, you know, not get stuck with unwanted hotels in their communities, you know, that could be more, and it could bring more harm than good to our communities. You know, I will propose that we bring social permits, you know, so that we can have a voice in our community so we can say whether we want hotels in our community, because we already have a lot of hotels here. But with a lot of hotels just popping up being unnoticed, that being later on turned into shelters is no help, you know. Folks are, we would rather affordable housing in our community. So I was just say this to say that we would love to have a voice in our community so that we could speak and say what exactly we want without things are coming up to unnoticed. That was for Rachel River. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Norris, um, you had signed up separately to speak, but weren't available when we called on you. Do you have your own testimony? Yes. I'm sorry. I was trying to go off mute. <laughs> um, sure. Hey, my name is Cynthia Norris, and I'm a mother of a five-year-old boy, Nisha Adams. And I've been living in Brownsville for about 17 years now. And over the years, in my neighborhood, there's not many jobs that's being placed out there, but we see so many hotels. When you see hotels popping up, you see maybe we can get jobs in our community. It's not, that's not actually happening in our community. And let's just be real. There's no real jobs in Brownsville anyway. Um, so, or well, real jobs that you could make a living from and take care of family. Over the years, you see hotels just popping up out of nowhere and being turned into shelters other than and when it should have been turned into affordable housing. They should be a way to allow residents to have a voice in this and say, have a say so into what's bringing into our community. I just want to urge your uh, city planning commissioner to propose the special permits so that we can have a voice. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Norris, for doing double duty for the back-to-back -back testimony and appreciate you filling in for Ms. Rivietta. Questions for Ms. Norris? Okay, you're now off the hook. Thank you. And um, our next speaker is Basha Gerhardt. Good afternoon, Chair Lago, Commissioners. My name is Basha Gerhard, Senior Vice President of Planning for the Real Estate Board of New York. Rebney strongly opposes the proposed text amendment, which will apply to hotels of all sizes citywide due to the devastating billions of dollars adverse impact it will have on the city's economy and its complete lack of a land use rationale. The Commission's own EIS predicts that adoption of the text amendment will result in a failure to meet a projected demand for new hotel space resulting in thousands of foregone job opportunities and over 2 billion foregone earnings from hotel operators. This is a frank and sobering assessment and the EIS correctly determines that this would be a significant adverse impact to the hotel industry. At the scoping hearing, Rebney asked city planning to study potential impacts to the construction and tourism sectors, but it has not. So for the total impact of the text amendment, Rebney commissioned AKRF to do a study using standard economic modeling techniques and building upon the EIS assumptions. AKRF estimates that the text amendment will cost New York City over 75,000 permanent job opportunities and forgo approximately 9.9 .9 billion in economic activity that would have resulted from non-hotel spending by 2035. The equivalent loss of 23,800 jobs due to the reduction in hotel construction activity and about 37.8 billion from the loss of construction in the city from direct, indirect, and induced related ec economic activity, including labor income. The EIS also does not consider the impact of the text amendment on city tax revenues. While it can be argued that fiscal impacts are not part of a CEQA analysis, they are surely relevant for the commission to consider in deciding whether this text amendment reflects sound planning that will promote the health, growth, and vitality of the city. 
If the text amendment is approved, AKRF estimates that the city would forgo over $8 billion in tax revenues between 2026 and 2035. By 2035, the annual recurring cost to the city would be over $1.2 billion. The text amendment would stifle multiple industries that have brought jobs, revenue, and growth opportunities to all five boroughs. During a pivotal time in New York City's economic history, the socioeconomic impacts found both in the DEIS and AKRS further analysis are devastating and do not support the need for the text amendment nor the goals of this commission. The City Planning Commission should disapprove of this action or, if it intends to move forward, significantly scale back the scope of this dangerous action so that it applies only to the extent that facts, supported by careful analysis, so warrant. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments and for consideration of these points. Thank you, Ms. Gerhardt's questions. Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, um, one question. Um, Adam Freeman from Pratt previously mentioned that, um, you know, the DEIS um, projections didn't necessarily take into account what we experience now in terms of changes in how um, business travel likely will be impacted. I note that you're presenting remotely here, um, you know, and that, um, you know, I, I was very sympathetic to that, that insight. Um, does the AKRF study take that into account at all? I mean, do we, are we more comfortable with that analysis or do we in fact think both the DEIS and the AKRF study need to be um, mindful of that? Oh, I, I appreciate the concerns that, um, you know, Professor Friedman raised, and I would caveat that we are still in a transition period. Um, you know, we ourselves are in a transition period um, for revenue staff coming back to the office, senior staff has been asked to come back since May, a couple of days a week. We are easing into all of this based on, you know, comfort level. And we imagine this transition and those types of conversations are happening globally in companies, large and small, in city government, state government, federal government, and, you know, I would hesitate to base an analysis based on something we don't have the data for yet. So what we were very careful about with the AKRF analysis was to use the city assumptions for what was going to happen and to fill in the gaps of fiscal analysis that had not yet been done. I guess so the answer to that question is that AKRF did not change their assumptions based on anything that we know about the trends that have occurred as a result of COVID. I would not base it on those trends because those are not set in stone. There's not a long track record and it's still very much in flux. We have decades of tourist growth. We have property tax growth. We have revenue from that. Um, we know how to look at economic trends. And again, I, I think it's very, it's much more nuanced and not necessarily a stable metric to start incorporating at this time. I mean, that also speaks to what is the appropriate, um, and I believe some of the commissioners have started asking our zoning and design committee chair about this, right? What is the appropriate length of time for this text amendment? What other things should be considered? You know, I, I didn't want to base an analysis on conjecture and we gave a pretty conservative scope of uh, work to AKRF based on that. Well, given what you just said, I mean, we recognize the impact of COVID has been tremendous, you know, on this industry. And that's part of what you mentioned, you know, the, the need for recovery. Um, you know, we, we know that a lot of the ways in which we do things have changed dramatically and that there will likely be changes. Um, you know, would the, the sunset provision that my fellow commissioner mentioned be um, a way to perhaps mitigate against the unknowns that we acknowledge are, are there? It is certainly a way that the City Planning Commission has in the past chosen to mitigate against the unknown. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, Ms. Gerhardt. Our next speaker is Patrick Houston or Patrick Houston. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, members of the City Planning Commission, for this opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Patrick Houston. Um, I live in Brooklyn, and I'm testifying to express my support for the hotel special permits. Uh, and I want to be upfront. Despite only being, you know, relatively new to New York, I've lived here for four years. I've witnessed how so many New Yorkers have just been struggling to have their voices heard in how our neighborhoods and their neighborhoods transform. 
and how their neighborhoods will be affected, um, both in, in the South Bronx and here in Brooklyn, where I currently live. Um, and then, of course, housing access and affordability remains one of the main hardships for working New Yorkers. And while I recognize that tourism is an important revenue stream for the city, we shouldn't and don't need to continually turn our backs on the people that live here. A strong tourist market and, um, and opportunities for city dollars, um, they don't have to be mutually exclusive, which is what seems to be suggested um, if this hotel special permits is not passed through. Um, so hotel special permits could give community members much more input and in say and in how their communities are transforming. Um, I saw an article in the Daily News, um, I believe it was from the president of the Hotel Association of New York City. And while I'm not an expert, I think he's, he's right that the expressions of concern about the undersupply of hotels seems to be wildly overstated. Um, and as others who've testified before me have, have spoken of, of how there's um, been an oversupply um, and part of that due to COVID. We'll acknowledge that. Um, but regardless, it seems like the, the, the concerns are, are overblown and the cost is that more city dwellers who've been here for a while will continue to see their neighborhoods transform outside of their control. Um, so um, I think that hotel special permits is an initiative that could go a long way to overall making the city more affordable, to making the city more fair through the process of getting people engaged directly in the hotels but more generally with the benefits of people participating more in, in democratic platforms, which we know we increasingly need in this city and across this country. So I would urge the city planning commission to vote in favor of these special hotels, uh, hotel special permits. Thank you. Thank you for testifying. Questions for Mr. Houston. Thanks again. And our next speaker will be Asim Dean. Okay, we will then move on to Betel Serra. Good afternoon. Hello, my name is Betel Serra. I've lived in Harlem my entire life. Uh, all of my family lives in Harlem as well. I have three children, also born and raised here and go to school in the city. Uh, we love living here, but we've also seen how drastically this area has changed over the years. Harlem is a historic and beautiful neighborhood. I support this uh, hotel text amendment because we've seen hotels get built around here that don't match what the area looks like, uh, like the Aloft Hotel. Uh, it's completely eyesoring. Uh, if we had a chance to say uh, in how the hotels get built, then maybe we could have had hotels that look more like they belong in this neighborhood. Communities should be able to have inputs uh, in hotels that get built in the neighborhood. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for testifying. Questions for Ms. Serra? Again, thank you. And our next speaker is Emily Saul. Is Emily Saul in the room? She was, and it looks like we might reach out. Okay. Then we will pass, move on to Cecilia Lewis. Okay, then Mary Chen. Hi, can you hear me? It's Emily. Hello? Welcome. Yes. Oh, Emily Salt, thank please, you. please go ahead. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Emily Solar, and I've been living in Midtown Manhattan for 10 years. And I support the Hotel Tex Amendment because I do think it's important that the community be able to have a say and what gets built around here. We've seen a lot of development with not enough input from residents and community members. My understanding is that special permits won't necessarily mean less hotels, but more hotels that will align with what the people from here really want. It's critical that we have a say in what gets built, and we all seen how hotels can drastically change the makeup of a neighborhood. Hotels, especially during the pandemic, have been used for different reasons. And with no community input, we've seen how this can negatively impact our neighborhoods and, of course, our quality of life. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon. Thank you for testifying. Questions? Okay, then we will 
check once again if um, Cecilia Lewis is in the room. No. Mary Chen. Oh, okay. Then we will go back to Asim Dean. Good afternoon to everyone, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Asim Dean, and I, I'm a resident of Queens for over 30 years. I think it is important that City Planning Commission support the hotel special proposal. We, can let the, we can't let these developers have free reign in deciding what is to be done in our communities. We have seen them build more and more hotels, but have any of us in Queens or on, our, or on the community board boards been a part of, of, of this discussion? Special permits, special permits have been successful in many parts of the city, and in this is our this is our opportunity in in community boards to engage and educate our neighbor, neighbors so that the developers knows we are watching once again i support this proposal thank you for your time thank you mr dean questions our next speaker will be james henderson Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Jamel Henderson. I am a resident of Brooklyn and I am here to speak on behalf of my community, the community of Crown Heights and Bedford-Stuyvesant uh, in support of these special permits for hotels, but making it explicitly clear that it must have our voices at the table not just at the table where we're talking to a middle person, but to the lead developer or developers themselves. It is super important that these hotels are a direct and true reflection of the community, which includes its cultural competency, its cultural identity, and the historical respect of what that community is all about prior to those who have zero inclination nor understanding of what our communities are about. But let us make no mistake, as I'm standing as a resident, that the bigger picture is to have true, affordable housing in our communities. And these hotels, while it is a temporary mandate, it does not heal the permanent wound. It is important that our people in our communities have a say in what these hotels look like because while tourism will always come and go in our city and that won't stop it is the everyday hard-working residents that look like me a black man in my community that are constantly fighting the ongoing issues of what we're trying to have in our communities which is just safety affordability and equality so I stand in full support of the permits and I'm urging this commission to consider the importance of having us, the everyday people at the table. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Questions? Okay, our next speaker will be Jose Luna. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Jose. I have lived in New York, Queens for uh, over 20 years. And I support the hotel tax amendment because over the years I've been seeing this area develop very fast and not always with the interest of the residents in mind. We we be all seen hotels come and go, and when a hotel gets built without community inputs, we be seeing how this hurts our community. So I support this because we deserve. I say in how our neighborhood changes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Luna. Questions? Our next speaker will be Gregory Pugh. Our next speaker will be Viviana Pereira. Hello, my name is Viviana, and I've been living in the Bronx 
for four years. And I support the hot set test amendment because we have seen that when hotel gets built, they don't pit in the rest of the area and they don't get input from our neighborhoods. This hotel can become party hotels and there is more noise, traffic, hotel guests that they don't respect families that have been living here for four years. And they are loud and sometimes even dangerous because all of this excessive drinking and party that happens when these hotels get built in areas they, they are no right, there are no fits in some of this area. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you, Ms. Pereira. Questions? Our next speaker is Christopher Rizzo, who will be followed by Luis Galero. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Christopher Rizzo. My law firm, Carter Ledger to Milburn, represents the Hotel Trades Council. Our client strongly supports the citywide text amendment, as do I. Please note that I registered for online comments, but I decided to come here because our office is next door and this is the most personal hearing I've ever had. <laughs> the, the council retained my law firm about two years ago to advise on the land use rationale that might exist for a citywide special permit text amendment. We easily concluded that there was a proper land use rationale. And I'd like to summarize our recommendation to the council in four points. Nothing has changed since the pandemic either. Number one, an unbelievable proliferation of hotels. New York City neighborhoods and local elected officials have been concerned about the proliferation of hotels for two decades since the city adopted a policy of dramatically increasing tourism in the city. The number of visitors and number of hotel rooms has nearly doubled during that two decade period. In 2021, it is sound land use planning to institute a special permit so that the commission can assess community impacts, the quality of hotel design, and the availability of visitor amenities before approving new hotels. Number two, residential uses in commercial zones. Hotels are prohibited in residential zones for a reason. During the past two decades, commercial districts have changed as well. By design, there are now far more residential uses in commercial districts. A special permit is a perfectly appropriate tool for the commission to consider the impacts of new hotels and commercial zones that contained a large number of residential buildings. I happen to live in an R zone, but I can assure you that if I lived in a C zone and a new hotel was proposed next to me, I would be concerned if there was no city review of quality and design. Most New Yorkers seem to agree based on the comments you've heard today. Number three, a patchwork approach to approving new hotels. The city has responded to these neighborhood level concerns with a variety of special permit and certification requirements that have different findings. With a ban on hotels in residential zones, a special permit in all manufacturing zones, and a mix of review and no review in commercial zones, it is time for a unified approach. And while discretionary reviews are not the norm for hotels in big cities in the United States, they are the norm in municipalities and small cities. And our neighbor to the north, the city of Yonkers, has just last month adopted a licensing requirement for all new hotels. Number four, DEIS and impacts. I'd like to refer back to my March 8, 2021 letter to this department's executive director regarding reasonable worst case scenario and the DEIS. The DEIS is well done and correct, but it is built in a reasonable worst case scenario, not the likely outcome between now and 2035. It meets a legal purpose, but there are other considerations. You've heard from the Hotel Association, which completely supports this special permit. I want to thank the commission as I'm out of time for taking on this difficult text amendment at such a challenging time for the hospitality industry. And thank I you. will follow up with a letter. Thank you. And questions for Mr. Rizzo. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Ortiz. Um, thank you so much for your testimony. I have a few questions. Um, one, you know, you raised the issue that, um, well, there are a few things, you know, that we need a unified approach to a pretty normal commercial use across, you know, uh, that this unified approach should apply in the same way across the entire city. Um, and then you made some suggestion that we're like, that Yonkers is perhaps a precedent. I, I mean, I would say that, you know, the city of New York is comprised of many cities. 
um, in, in some ways, you know, and, and that they're very distinct and different. And I think that's one of the challenges of doing, you know, a citywide approach to this, um, you know, and, and the, the point you raised about commercial zones that now contain a growing number of residential units, um, I, and that those residents should have some way to weigh in on the commercial uses that are now perhaps infringing. I don't even know if that, that would really be the case, but, you know, that's the argument you were making that residents should, in who are now living in predominantly commercial zones, should have a right to weigh in on commercial uses that had been as of right before this. I mean, I think that that's a real concern um, when we take uh, an entire use group, uh, use group five, which has historically been considered an acceptable commercial use in a commercial district, and we create a carve out that um, applies hundreds of thousands of dollars of additional fees to a use that um, doesn't, I mean, we've heard doesn't necessarily have a negative impact in those commercial areas. In fact, we've heard from, you know, the downtown Brooklyn partnership that business owners are thrilled when there are hotels because hotels bring, resi or bring visitors who then spend money in businesses. So the land use conflict is not there in those areas, in commercial areas. Um, so, you know, I understand that you're here to present on behalf of your client, but, you know, I'm interested in your perspective on, <coughs> on this, you know, this challenge I think I'm, I'm personally facing. Um, there's a lot baked into that question, so I'll try to answer it expeditiously. Um, I am here on behalf of my client. I, often, I also happen to live near two hot sheet motels, so I have a personal interest in seeing this special permit passed, I have to be honest with you. I've been practicing law and environmental law and land use law for 20 years, almost 20 years now. And there's a reason that hotels are not permitted in residential districts because it, the city has had a policy that hotels have a negative impact, it could have a negative impact on nearby residential uses. So as we see undoubtedly, especially in lower Manhattan, more residential uses coming into commercial zones, which is city policy and is, is fine. Not in every commercial district. Though. No, but in many, in very many districts. Number two, I think you're correct. I think New York City is many different cities. And the special permit process is precisely designed to allow you, the commission, to judge that. There may be locations where you have very few concerns about a hotel special permit and don't want any design changes. There may be others where you do want design changes or controls on hours of operations or restaurants, et cetera. That's the entire purpose of the special permit is for you to judge that, to put the power in the commission's hands. But it's a commercial use that is a non-noxious use in most cases in commercial districts. And I want to focus on commercial districts, not residential districts. Sure. Um, because that's where I think the land use rationale in particular falls apart. Well, I, I don't agree with the RPA speaker that there are many other uses that are permitted as of right in various districts. I can assure you if cemeteries and roller coasters and all the other things he mentioned were to start proliferating the way hotels would, you'd have calls for a special permit for those uses as well. I do think hotels have very different impacts from your average commercial building. You're getting transient visitors. You may have a restaurant. You may have taxis coming and going. You may have loading and unloading zones that are nearby a residential building. I mean, there are just different impacts from your average hotel from your average commercial building. So then- Late night uses. In fact, I mean, hotels are designed to operate around the I mean, the clock. but we have restaurants that have very similar impacts and, you know, there's no special permit for a restaurant. So, and that's a commercial use. And we recognize those uses are appropriate in commercial areas where there are fewer residents for a reason. And we don't want to necessarily prevent them from, you know, proliferating. But, you know, to your point, I mean, you mentioned sort of hot sheet hotels and, <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that came up in our review session was that, um, uh, that hotels developed for a solely public purpose, including temporary housing for the homeless, will not be subject to this special permit. And I would presume that, um, you know, the concern of residents um, about that use in particular would be, they would want to weigh in on it, um, but this special permit actually doesn't give them the right to do so. I think most community boards would want the 
ability to weigh in on those uses. Of course they would. The city is making a balancing call in writing this tax amendment that we're weighing community impacts versus traditional transient hotels, and we're saying we're going to give a little bit more weight to community impacts and community voice. Great. That's sound land use planning. When it comes to homeless hotels, um, I'm sorry to use that word, but, you know, that's what a lot of people call it. The city is making a judgment that it wants to protect its ability to get those passed without, you know, an undue process because of the homeless crisis. And it's weighing that against community impacts and community voice. That's also sound land use planning. I, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, we have to overcomplicate that decision. Thank you. Commissioner Cerullo. Okay. So just a, <clears throat> an immediate thought, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, <clears throat> on this particular conversation, just to, to weigh in because, and you referenced the hot sheet motels. There are very few hot sheet motels that would be built at 150 rooms or more. So like the, the hotels that would be developed for purposes of homeless services, hot sheet motels, I would assume 90, you would know better on the data than I would, but they are generally not 150 room hotels. Those are generally- (laughs) Commissioner, if I could weigh in, a couple of speakers have referenced the fact that there is a size limit. This would apply to hotels of any size. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Then correction that yeah. we have to thank make you. sure. Yeah, because that's come up more than once. <laughs> to reference I, that, but okay. thank you. So, so thank then you. I'll just the eliminate that question. That was just sort of the comment on the immediate one because I was confused by by that, but I was going with it. Um, let me ask you this question, and and this is obviously not an, a completely unprecedented situation, but it is certainly rare for an industry to ask for regulation that not only delays a process of opening a business, it creates an incredible cost to the process and an uncertainty of knowing how it will end. And I would assume that Many of the people who who testified in support today that we've heard like this proposal because they don't want hotels and this enables them to control, and that's what it does, the process through the, you know, sort of politics and policy of hotels being developed in their neighborhoods. Because everyone used as an example a hotel they really didn't want that got built in their neighborhood. So the intent for, for them is we could stop hotels from being built. So I wonder, and the data that we do have, whether we find it uh, believable or not, or because it all could be debated regardless, whether it's the, the work that was done by this department in environmental review, which is actually very telling and, and frightening for the industry and the city and its economy. And, and that's coming from the department that is moving this forward and help design its, its proposal. And some of the other data we're hearing from from, I guess, the real estate industry and and others who have looked at this, it's all very negative with respect to whether hotels would ever be built, how few of them might be built, if at all, the number of employees who I assume would be union employees who would not be employed, um, and, and and how many rooms would be developed, and all of the, and never mind the overall fiscal impact on tax uh, tax revenue and economic activity. If we are not a welcoming city and an available city, so I I'm confused by the support, or I would be interested in knowing how the balance of all of those things was still outweighed by having a special permit for hotel development 
for the industry <laughs> that basically represents this industry? Um, and how do you get there? Sure. I mean, the first thing is that the, the department and the commission have built in very robust protections for existing hotels. Existing hotels can go offline for quite a long period of time under this because of the pandemic and come back without having to need a special permit. So in terms of hotels that are existing today and open or that closed right at the pandemic, sure. they will come back. They can come back. And most of them will. It's very hard to repurpose a hotel for something else. So for existing hotels and existing jobs, this special permit should not have an impact. No. No. <clears throat> That's number one. And I think it's really important to consider that. Um, I think it's telling that the Hotel Association of New York City is, is supporting this. This is the largest trade organization of existing hotel owners and operators. They're supporting this for a reason, because New York City for the past decade has had the lowest rev par revenue per available room among major cities in the United States. There's a reason for that. It's because the hotel market has largely been considered saturated. It's, it's been very lucrative to build hotels, but it's being it's not so profitable to operate them. That's a real conundrum that this special permit can help fix for the hotel industry. It might not be convenient for new hotel builders and developers who Rebney seems to be speaking for, but it's very good for the existing hotel industry. And I think it's very appropriate for you, the commission, to weigh protect, protecting an existing industry versus speculative future growth of that industry. I, I appreciate that response and, and I understand the response. What I, what, what taking that point of view, what I would say is that the, the market would also play into whether or not financing was available for an oversaturated industry, what a business plan is. And you're leaving out the fact though, but you raise an interesting point that's in there, which is that this doesn't impact at all existing hotels that what this does or potentially could and god bless raises the value of the existing hotels for the people who already have them because we would be curtailing because we're not eliminating but we are creating an obstacle for anyone new to enter the industry without great expense and time and the difficulty to get financing, because we haven't really spent a lot of time on that, but it's not going to be easy for anyone, including existing hotel owners who want to expand or grow. But that I get, I'm, I understand that. <clears throat> I, I mean, I understand there has to be an answer to why would the industry support this? But clearly it is, and it makes sense, that it is a proposal that enforces the existing industry, um, but will also not necessarily be helpful to tourists and consumers because the typical supply and demand will have an impact on how much it costs to be in the hotel's that exist and those that are not necessarily built. Um, whether there's an oversaturation or there's too many, you know, that, that could be, there always could be a situation where that happens. But I would think that the market and smart business people, as you, as, as we all know, who are in this industry, they're not going to spend the money if they can't make the money. So, I mean, sometimes there's a problem that arises, but generally speaking, no one's going to throw their money and their name on a project that will never be successful. Um, so anyway, I, I, I appreciate your response to it. It does, that raises a lot of other thoughts about the process too, but uh, I still find it um, interesting because in the long run, growing the membership is always going to be important. And this is a proposal that everyone, whether they support it or not, who have looked at the potential for where this goes and what impact it has on the industry is to potentially reduce the opportunities to grow the membership and the industry. So it's, it seems counter to 
you know, to what I would expect would be the point of view of the council. But I completely respect the position of the council, yep. whether I agree with it or not. But yep. thank you. Is there a question? Can I respond to that? Well, if there's a question, if there's not a question in it. Yes. No, I mean, the qu I started with the question and you gave me an answer that opened a, a, a door <laughs> to have a discussion about your answer. Yeah. I, I see part of what you said. I just don't, I still didn't see that it, it actually made sense or how it outweighed the, the potential burden it puts on the industry. I, I still don't see how that outweighs it because it, and you started with this, this doesn't affect the existing hotels as if that, that, that's a relief. And then we could, we're only really, fo you know, we're focused on the new and it's not, it's not important to the council about new hotels that grow in the city. That just was, it, that was confusing to me. So I, I commented on that back, but yeah. so my second point was just a comment to yours. It wasn't a question at all. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. No, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I have a question for you. You had made reference to um, live residents in commercial districts, and that there's more residential buildings, and the impact of hotels in those districts, and how um, the conflicts that exist. And you mentioned taxis, loading docks, transient nature, and so forth. Why is it not the same for office buildings in those districts? And why not have a special permit for office buildings? And, and if I may, just sure. thinking a little further about this, you know, you talk about conflicts in residential neighborhoods and residents. You know, a lot of people have complained about restaurants in neighborhoods. Noisy, people coming and going. If the restaurant industry came to you tomorrow and asked, for land use rationale to make a special permit required for restaurants. Do you think you could create one? No, I don't think I could. I, I don't think it's fair to compare, a, you know, a, a, the average, what, 10,000 square foot restaurant to the average 100,000 square foot or 200,000 square foot hotel. Um, you know, just so to go I'm back to your first point. I'm sorry, just, yeah. just to clarify. So you're saying the conflicts only exist with 200,000 square foot hotels. <clears throat> that smaller hotels don't provide the same conflicts. Well, no, I think this, the scale is just is just totally different. Sure, I mean, a restaurant but, and bar but, can have a, a negative impact on a neighborhood. Special There's permit, no question. as the chair indicated, the special permit deals with all hotels, mm -hmm. not just large hotels. Correct. So I think this proposal, and I don't mean not to have you answer the question, but I think this proposal has a lot of problems because the conflicts you may be describing do not occur with all hotels and in all areas. And this, I think I referred to previously as overreaching, just seems to be, you know, being a citywide blanket proposal seems to be far overreaching. But I, I apologize. I, I did ask a question. I, I do want you to respond. No, I appreciate the, 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 the challenge of differentiating hotels from other commercial office buildings. But I think commercial office buildings are, by and large, generally totally different from hotels. Commercial office buildings are not designed to operate 24-7. They typically don't have ballrooms and wedding halls and restaurants and bars in them, typically. Uh, they, they typically don't have a, a constantly changing transient nature. They don't have all these service providers coming in, linen services and workers. It's, a hotel is designed to be super active, super busy, super impactful. I mean, a good hotel is. It's vibrant. It's completely different from an office which operates from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m., et cetera. So I do, think, I do think there's a land use difference between the two things that's appropriate for you to consider. Second, you're talking about how some hotels in some neighborhoods are just fine, and that's absolutely true. What the special permit does is it puts that decision-making power in your hands. If I, if I may, you know, I, I think some of the same conflicts you reference with hotels may exist with offices all, as well. And I would say as a New Yorker and born and raised here, that's okay. I mean, New York is about the hustle and bustle of the city. Um, 
what what I, I will ask though is um that I I also find it interesting that you see this as a way of the industry protecting itself and I and I probably take issue with using land use as a means to protect an industry. Um I don't think that's the intention and I'm and I and I as I said earlier I, I do take issue with that. So thank you. Thank you for your testimony. You know, I, I would say, because you, you picked up on that, and, and Fred, you, you started with that, which is, um, you know, land use as a tool to um, address market forces. You know, we, as, as you stated, you know, we've, the low rev par, the, um, you know, the challenges the industry faces, the oversaturation, um, you know, it's not our, we're not the body to make decisions on um, whether development should go forward or not. Presumably, those uh, conditions will um, help developers decide against hotels. We don't need a special permit for it. Um, you know, and, and I'm concerned that you know, if we go down this path of using a special permit to address our concerns about, you know, I, I don't think we want to use land use as a protectionist tool. Um, and that's what you began to suggest. Um, I think that's a really dangerous precedent to set. If, if I could respond to that, or if Would you want me to. That was a statement. Okay. Thank you. I'll go back to, I'll go back to my earlier comments um, about having a sunset provision built in. Do you have any thoughts on that? <clears throat> I know my client does not support that. I think that the commission and the city always have the ability to change or reflect upon something at any point in time and not having a sunset will not cut off your ability to do that. And so I think that's the preferable approach to the, to, to the question of whether um, in 12 years when the EIS predicts a shortfall of hotel rooms based on a very narrow set of criteria, you know, whether this should sunset or not. The time is to go back and say, well, maybe we should scrap it at that time. I think at that time we're already uh, too late. I mean, you need to plan it out to build a hotel in a few years and planning and financing and you know, the, the, assemblage. There are other tools the city has to address, if it finds, a shortfall of hotel rooms 10 years from now. Uh, the reason the hotel industry supports this is because their rev par is so low. Their rev par is so low because there is this undue competition from Airbnb units because property taxes on hotels have gone up 100% over the past 10 years. So if the city finds itself with a shortfall of hotel rooms, it has numerous economic and enforcement and legal tools to help spur the creation of hotel rooms, economic incentives, et cetera. Um, I don't think the special permit is going to get in the way of that one bit. The developers go through the ULERP process all the time. A million dollars is a lot for a ULERP process. So, yep. Sure. So, I'll just follow one 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 sentence answer. A hypothetical question: If if this special permit hinged on a sunset clause, would would your client be for it or against it? I'm sure if it's between no special permit or a special permit with a sunset clause. Clearly, I would recommend they support a special permit with a sunset clause. I, I have a question, too. Admittedly, perhaps somewhat unfair, but, but it's relevant. In your discussion with Commissioner Eady, you mentioned a lot of things about hotels and neighborhoods that could be a problem, right? What they have, the uses inside, the impacts it has. And I'm not debating that those things aren't true at all. We're challenging that. If this proposal actually required all hotels to come back to get special permits, including hypothetical question, not talking about the legality of it, what would the position of the council be if they were required, the existing hotels, were required to come back to us under this proposal to get a special permit to continue to operate. I have never been asked about that, and so I actually can't answer it. As a lawyer, I could give you an answer, which is 
it would deeply, deeply trouble me. But Tr- a, it would trouble. I'm a lawyer too. A, it would trouble me. That's why I'm calling but, it a hypothetical. Because you raised all the issues as to why hotels are problems in neighborhoods and should have this added level of review. But you represent that industry who may be impacting the neighborhoods there and now the same way, but haven't gone through that review and did it as of right. So, again, I was asking the question to see if... Again, I, I, I said admittedly an unfair question and not necessarily based in law in its retroactivity and all of those things that I wouldn't support either. But I was asking the question just to get a sense of how the industry, the council and its, and, and its membership would feel about it if it wasn't just being put on potentially new hotel developers and it actually also applied to those existing ones. With the caveat that I've never spoken to them about that prospect because sure. it's so understood and fair. So I'm, I'm, I, would, I would say they would oppose it. They would not support that, and I would recommend they oppose it. I, I, and there are many policy, jobs, economic impacts that um, would just be you know, untenable. Yes, per- certainly personal ones, but the, the also ones that would affect the city, which is part of the reason that there's concern about moving into the part of the industry that may not exist today. But uh, fair enough. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll note that, like, at the review session, you're taking me back to law school issues. Again. <laughs> you know, that's part of <laughs> Other questions? I, I'm sorry, I just have to comment on that because I thought that was brilliant. I mean, you just mentioned that this argument that was made before us was about the noxious impacts of hotels as a use, regardless of whether they're new or existing. If I were the hotel trades industry, I would be very concerned about making that argument. Thank you. And again, I'll note that... Um, Commissioner Serlo was in the realm of issue spotters not considering the notion of retroactive laws. No, of course. I, I was not. <laughs> Which it, it, already it was in. more conversational and yeah. theoretical, but of course, but I wouldn't support that if that was on the table. So, <laughs> And it's not being proposed. And it's not being proposed. No, of course. Um, I will. Thank you, Mr. Rizzo. I think you. you may have set a record for the longest a, pers- a single individual has testified before us. So thank you, thank you for your perseverance. Thank you very much for your time. I know it's been a long day. Thank, thank, thank you. you so much. Oh, okay. I stand corrected. Thank you, Commissioner Dwight. Um, I will now also thank Council Member Mark Levine for his patience. Um, he is now available to testify. Unless we lost him during that exchange. I am back. Can you hear me? Welcome. Yes, Wonderful. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to speak and thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me this time. The impact a hotel has on a community is truly unique, distinct from almost any other type of facility, whether for better or for worse, and it can be either, hotels change the character of a neighborhood. Hotels can be good neighbors, and many, but not all, indeed are. Hotels can be a source of great jobs and good pay, benefit, worker protections. Though again, not all hotels are meeting this standard. I support the proposal to create a citywide special permit requirement for hotels in New York City because it will give communities and elected leaders the power to ensure that new hotels are indeed a win-win for neighborhoods, workers, tourists, and everybody. We're considering this proposal, as some of my colleagues have mentioned, in the midst of an unprecedented hotel building boom. In the past 15 years, the hotel sector in New York City has grown from 65,000 rooms to over 135,000 rooms, with another 25,000 rooms in the current development pipeline. As we're coming out of of this pandemic, with projections that tourism in New York City will not return to full strength for several years, and an enormous amount of unused hotel capacity in the near and possibly medium term, this is actually the perfect time to improve our process for approving new hotels. Now, let me be clear that I support a citywide special permit requirement, not because I want to help 
I'm so sorry for the background noise. <laughs> Never fail working from home. Register my dog is supportive of the proposal. <laughs> and let me tell you, after almost seven hours of testimony, we needed the comic relief. Yeah, we did. Well, I'm, 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 I'm happy that little Hermione has uh, produced <laughs> thank you. And there she goes again. I'm so, so sorry. Um, so now let me be clear that I support a citywide special permit requirement, not because I want to halt all hotel development. In fact, the ULA process, which has been in place in New York City for decades, of course, does lead to approval of a steady stream of projects year after year. What ULERP does is ensure that development proceeds in a thoughtful, community-oriented manner, giving a chance for community boards, city council members, and other elected leaders to shape projects. Whether the issue is noise or congestion or good jobs, many hotels have in fact been approved through ULERP over the years, and many more will be approved even under a special permit system. So for all these reasons, I believe creation of a citywide special permit requirement for hotels is the right policy for New York City. And I and my little dog urge you to support it. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you both. And I will note that the um, little pooch was every bit as articulate in getting her point. <laughs> thank <of> you. <laughs> Questions, Commissioner Dweck. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Earlier, we had uh, Manhattan Borough President uh, Gail Brewer testify that she would support, or this is what I understood it to say, that she would support the inclusion of the um, hotels for homeless in the special permit process. Would you be supportive of that, too? I'm not sure. I, um, I need to review that. I need to look at uh, the legal questions uh, and probably policy questions as well. So... Uh, not prepared to answer on that one just now. Thank you so much. Other questions? Well, thank you again, Council Member. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll note that we have about a dozen remaining speakers, um, with the next one being Luis Calero. Hello, how are you? Welcome. Hi, thank you. My name is Luis Calero. Um, I've been living in Queens for over 20 years. I've been seeing new hotels get built in neighborhoods like my own, where they dramatically change the character of these areas. I moved to this neighborhood because it was quiet, uh, most, mostly re residential. And over the past few years, we have seen more and more commercial developing. Hotels bring in a lot of outside visitors to the area. And with, with that, more traffic from, tra from taxis, and noise on weekends, nights. Um, I worry that if this trend continue, my neighborhoods will lose its appeal as a nice place to live away from all the commotion from Manhattan. At the same time, this neighborhood has gotten more expensive to live in. Housing affordability is a major concern for me and so for many of my neighbors. And yet we continue to see empty lots and old buildings being converted in more hotels. This is why I support the hotel tax amendment. Uh, this is in my voice and also people that I, I talk to and some of my neighbors. Thank you so much for the, for the time and the opportunity. Thank you. Questions from Mr. Calero. Thank you again. Our next thank speaker you. is Alice Nascimento. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alicia Nascimento. I come here, I'm testifying as a resident of New York City who is concerned with unfettered hotel development and not enough affordable housing being built in this city. The people of New York deserve to have a say on what gets built around their homes, around their parks, and around their neighborhood. This is about who our city is made for. And it's only fair that the people of impacted communities have a voice in that process. A special permit requirement for hotels would ensure that hotel development is done with basic input from the community so that any hotel development is sustainable and that it's supported by the residents of the community. Residents who are being displaced right now by high rents because real estate developers have a disproportionate say on what gets built and who it serves. 
This proposal balances the scale of a process that too often neglects those who are most impacted by hotel developments and those are mar marginalized communities. That is why this community board should support the hotel special permit proposal. Thank you so much. Thank you for testifying. Questions? Again, thank you. And our next speaker is Lystra Martin. Okay, then we will go on to Ileana Marinescu. Okay. Um, Ricardo Dunkley. Anna Beltran. Okay, Richard Chu. Hello, my name is Richard Chu and I'm a lifelong Chinatown resident. I'm here to speak in support of the zoning tax amendment to require special permit for hotel construction. Over the years, Chinatown has seen the negative effects of unchecked hotel development. A number of new hotels have been built here over the past few years and there are even more under construction. New hotels have helped turn this neighborhood which used to be quiet and residential into nightlife destination, bringing more noise, visitors, and higher prices. More public review is badly needed to ensure that development meets the needs of long-term residents of these communities. And by requiring a special permit for hotel development, it will give us residents, especially the Chinese residents who are often unheard and invisible, uh, it would give us a say, uh, which they currently ha haven't. And I just also want to add that uh, I want to add the Zoom and hotel, under, Zoom referring to hotel underuse. As an actor, all of our auditions are Zoom calls and casting directors are booking us through Zoom or Skype. So I see in the future that production company would always look to cut costs by reducing the need for hotel conference room as an audition space or other production needs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chu. Questions? Thank you. I'm going to note that we're getting close to the end of the public hearing. And if anyone hasn't registered to speak but has decided during the course of the hearing that they'd like to, now would be the time to register. And you can find the instructions on how to register, whether online or via phone, at www.nyc.gov slash NYC Engage. And with that, we'll turn to our next speaker, Marilyn Del Rosario. Okay, our next speaker is Namgyal Lama. Mindy Singer. Carlos Encarnacion. Hi, um, good afternoon, uh, members of uh, the commission. Um, I am a longtime resident of uh, Brooklyn, specifically uh, Bushwick. I've been living in Bushwick uh, for over 30 years. And in that time, I have seen a lot of changes happening, um, some positive, some uh, negatives for the community. And some of the people that I uh, grew up with they no longer live in the city. They um, living in North Carolina or Atlanta or somewhere else. Um, which means that for me, you know, my community has been, uh, has been changed. It's no longer my community because the people that used to be part of my community, a lot of them are no longer there. So that's why I'm supporting the Tets Amendment for hotel permit, special hotel permit, because a community have to have a say in the process that actually change the character of a community. You know, it's, I think it's really undemocratic when developers come to a community, they change the character of that community and that community don't even have the opportunity to say anything about it. Um, it's, it's, it's unfair and it's undemocratic. And even though that this uh, commission is, a, uh, the city planning commission is a technical uh, 
agency, it could play a role in giving, you know, um, a back demo, the, you know, this democratic value to our city. You know, the communities have a say so in um, the process, they actually change the characters of the community. That's why I'm urging the um, commissioner to vote yes to the special permit uh, uh, proposal. Thank you. Questions? Thank you, Mr. Encarnacion. Our next speaker is Veronica Wilson. And our next speaker is Jacqueline Phillips. Jacqueline is not in the room. Okay. Are you, I have a, a long list here of others who we have skipped over. Are there others in the room waiting to testify? No, no one has returned. Okay. Okay. Um, so before closing this hearing, I'll note that the record is going to remain open through Monday, July 26, 2021 to receive written comments on the draft environmental impact statement. And with that, this public the public hearing on this matter is adjourned. And Mr. Secretary, after all of this, is there more business before the commission? Uh, Lady uh, Tierra Lago, there is no other business before the commission, but I do have some public information. For those of you who were unable to or did not wish to testify, you can submit written testimony online by selecting this hearing on the upcoming meetings page of the NYC Engage portal through DCP webpage or by mailing your comment to City Planning Commission, Calendar Information Office, 120 Broadway, 31st floor, New York, New York, 10271. And with that, with minutes to go before it's 5 p.m., this public meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for your Good questioning and your tenacity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.